燃え上がれガンダム<音楽>
I've seen the movie trilogy from that, three yeah. movies. I have seen Gundam The Origin, the six OVA series. I've seen the 8th MS Team, 12 episode OVA series. Uh, 0080 War in the Pocket, six episode OVA. 0083 Stardust Memory, 13 episode OVA. Uh, Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt, I watched the movie versions of those, so I'm counting those as two movies. I've seen Zeta Gundam, 50 episodes. Gundam Double Zeta, 47 episodes. Shars Counterattack, one movie. Unicorn Gundam, seven OVAs. Uh, Twilight Axis, which we never, I think, talked about, but that's no. a unicorn-adjacent half-hour OVA. I'm just counting that as an episode of television because that's the length it is. Narrative Gundam, one movie. Yep. Gundam F91, one movie. Victory Gundam, 51 episodes. Mobile Fighter G Gundam, 49 episodes. Gundam Wing, 49 episodes. Endless Waltz, I'm counting that as one movie. Because uh, that's the version I watched. After War Gundam X, 39 episodes. And Turn A Gundam, 50 episodes. Doing the math, that is 410 episodes of TV, half-hour anime episodes. Uh, 410 times 24 minutes is 9,840 minutes, uh, or 164 hours of television. 13 hour plus OVAs. I actually did the actual run times of Origin and Unicorn. They come out to 863 minutes or 14.4 hours. And I have seen nine movies which total 992 minutes or 16.5 hours. But I did watch the movie trilogy F91 and Shars Counterattack all twice. So that's an extra 11 hours. Add that all together, Sean. And in the last year, I have watched 205.9 hours of Gundam, which is also known as 8.6 straight days. Mm hmm. Over one full week out of the past year, or 2%, 2% of my lifetime on this earth yeah. in the past year, Sean, has been spent watching Gundam. And I didn't add in all the time spent talking about Gundam. Yeah. Or, or building Gundam. Or the manga you read. Manga, I have read six volumes of Crossbone Gundam, one of Skullheart, three of Crossbone, seven, uh, the, the seventh samurai one, yeah. seven volumes of Thunderbolt, the Gundam novelization, that's three novels, and one volume of the origin manga. It's probably more than 2%. Uh-huh. How do you like them numbers? It's very impressive. I have to say I'm I'm really proud of you, Jonathan. Because <laughs> um, it is, again, we, we will be able to do more of the looking back on this podcast uh, on the next episode. But it is, it, it is just so funny to think back to these humble beginnings of where I'm like, we should start with like, we'll do like two episodes and I'll talk about what Gundam is so I can give Jonathan a primer um, and then, and then after we did Mobile Suit Gundam, it became very clear that like, oh, this is going to move at a pace where we can't break these episodes down into chunks. We'll just do the whole show because um, that's how we like to do the podcast, anyways. We like to do big holistic yeah. discussions. But it is funny, Jonathan. Do you want to know what's scarier than those numbers? What the fact that when I first watched these shows, I did it at a faster pace than you are now. Shit. Yeah, well, you I weren't got doing through, a podcast. Yeah, I wasn't doing a podcast about it, but I did get through almost all of Gundam in one year. Nice. So, yeah, I think I, at this, you would have to be at, like, Build Fighters about now to be at the same pace I was Jesus. using it. I think if I want, weren't doing the podcast, I could do it. But obviously, I watch a little slower because we're thinking more analytically. I, I pause so I don't, like, jump ahead to the next yeah. show before we do the last one. So, yeah. Uh, we also did Evangelion in there. We've we done did. Some that's stuff, true, yeah. yeah. So... Anyway, it's been quite an adventure, Sean. It has. And that adventure has brought us to this point, Jonathan. Turn A Gundam. Which I will say, if there were any other Gundam show we were ever going to give the treatment of doing like we did the original Gundam and doing like five or six episodes on it, this would be the show. Yeah, I, I thought about it. Um, and then it became clear that that was not going to work. Yeah. Um, because it was, that was something I thought about around the time we did the Zeta Gundam podcast. I remember having this realization of turning Gundam is going to be hard to do. And I think that's going to be right. I'm so excited to do this podcast. I think it's going to be fucking hard because a lot of shit happens to turning Gundam. It is a dense show. It is incredibly dense. It has so much on its mind. It throws out giant, massive ideas and themes and chunks of world building left and right just all over the place, especially in the early episodes. The early episodes are practically delirious with creativity and ideas. Um, and it settles into more of a rhythm of a show at a certain point. Yeah. Because it has to, to, to like be a show. Um, but even then, there is so, so much you could talk about with this show. And I guess, you know, we usually start with initial reactions. Yeah. And that's it. I, I think this show is a masterpiece. I think it is the only other show that I love all the Gundam shows we've talked about, minus Gundam Wing. I love them all. 
this is the only other one that I think fully lives up to the original. It lives up to is the wrong word, but fully matches that level. And part of it is that it is the most brazenly original one. Yeah. It is the one that is, while it is very much in conversation with Gundam's history, it is the one least indebted to that history, I feel like, because it is the one that is, obviously it's 100% new characters, but it's setting, it's aesthetic, it's, it's musical style, like everything is so original. It feels like it stands on its own feet the most. Like, I can't recommend Zeta without you having seen some form of the original. Yeah. I can't really... I would never tell someone to start with Victory Gundam. Um, yeah, or After War Gundam X would right. be a weird one to be your first Gundam. Yeah. yeah. G Gundam is on its own island, and that one stands very much on its own. But in a weird, like, kid shown in anime kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Turn A feels like a masterwork on par with the original in terms of how much it stands and it's as its own towering achievement. You know, yeah. um, and that is not to take anything away from shows like Zeta or Unicorn Gundam or the other shows we talked about that we love that I think are also A plus series. But but you know, I think the original and this achieve the the S rank. Yes, it is definitely if you're making your Gundam tier list, the original Mobile Suit Gundam and Turn A Gundam are are S tier for sure. Yes. Yeah, yes. everything else is. I, there are lots of other A, A plus, however you want to break that down. Maybe the A plus plus if you want to get very precise. Yeah. But Turn A Gundam and Molozy Gundam, in my opinion, are the two that stand at, at the pinnacle. Yeah, especially if we're talking about full TV series. Because I think yeah. you and I might also argue to put War in the Pocket up there. Sure, yeah. But War in the Pocket is a little six-episode thing that's a, quite different. Yeah, that, get, that, get, that gets to be its own little own pocket series, one might say, for War in the Pocket. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of your traditional 50-ish episode, I mean, this is exactly 50 episodes, but generally they're around 50 episode long one year long anime shows it's you know it doesn't get much better than turn a gundam for anything um not only yeah. is it like the one of if not the best gundam show it is one of my favorite shows bar none of anything oh yeah easily it's also the most stunningly animated tv show i've ever seen yeah i, I agree yeah i and you've seen way more anime than i have in in other genres and stuff so i i would be interested to hear your thoughts but at least the only things I would point to for an ongoing anime series that's not an OVA that would be to this level is something that's like only 12 episodes, like One Punch Man or something. And even then I wouldn't quite put it on this caliber. Um, and they did this for 50 episodes. This looks like a 50 episode OVA. Yeah. Like you could hold this right up to 8th MS Team or Stardust Memory or something like that. Yeah. And it's 50 episodes with only one recap in yes. episode 17, which yeah. is... I. Don't know why episode 17 is such a weird one. Usually the recap's in the, in the middle, um, yeah. but they decide episode 17, ah, let's throw it out there, um, and did a little recap episode. So it's it's re really 49 episodes of full original content, but that's way more than even a four core or like year-long running show normally does. Normally, if you're going for 50 episodes, you'd have like two of those be recaps. Yeah, and it's it's just stunning. And, and yeah. luckily, this one has gotten a beautiful master on Blu-ray. Um, mm -hmm. If you have the Blu-ray masters... Um, this show was done, the last Gundam show done on film at all, yeah. and it was captured fully on 35mm. Some anime are captured on 16, some, obviously once we get into the 2000s, we're going to have the dark age of video, uh, which we're going to have to suffer through with Gundam Seed, yeah. but this was on full 35mm, so it looks like a movie when you're watching it on Blu-ray because you have the grain structure and color depth of 35mm film. There are some effects shots that are clearly upscaled because the original film material probably doesn't exist exist um but other than that i mean it also just it survives in incredible quality quite like the original which i think is also a 35 millimeter yeah. show mm -hmm. um and it's it's fucking stunning yeah and so in so turning gundam definitely has this feel of it being a it, it is a gundam that exists outside of time like the the design of the show of the characters everything about it and like the look with it being the last sort of hand painted on actual like animation cells um, Mobile Suit Gundam show. Obviously, it's not the last anime done, done that way, but for TV Gundam, the last one done in that kind of traditional way with some digital effects in the specific shots means that it really kind of just exists on an island of its own in many ways, um, which makes it, I think, very easy to go back to. It doesn't feel dated. It feels like it does not exist to a specific era of anime to me. It feels like it, it is totally on its own thing. Yeah, if you took the eye catches out, yeah. And ignored a couple of the CGI augmented shots scattered through the show. There's nothing in here that would signify this was made in 1999. Yeah. Not a goddamn thing. It looks so 60s, 70s anime. 
Like it, it clearly is drawing on like the and I Victory Gundam did this a little bit too, but Turn A goes like full bore. This is like Isao Takahata, um, World Masterpiece Theater, yes. you know, um, um, uh, Heidi Girl of the Alps yes. kind of stuff, and of Green Gables, Gables. ass. Yeah, it's yeah. very much like that. And it is, and it has that kind of lush hand drawn quality with those lush like rolling backgrounds and color work that recalls like early Studio Ghibli or something like that. Yeah. Um, it is, I mean, God, Soshie, the, that character is just a Miyazaki heroine. Yeah, she's just, yeah, out of, yeah, yeah, straight up with, with hair, like, yep. spiking up when she gets mad. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. Um, and, and, it, and I also think just in everything it does, it is so, as you say, kind of out of time. Yeah. And it's, a, especially coming off of the 90s are such an interesting period for Gundam, in part because after F91, they're pretty budget challenged, mm -hmm. <laughs> at least yeah. on TV. You go to the OVAs and there's incredible work being done. This feels much more like it's coming out of the 90s Gundam OVA tradition than the TV tradition, yeah. where the TV series are all kind of up and down with budget concerns. After War kind of steadies, but... Then it got canceled, yeah. so not too steady. Um, and this one just there's there's no episode where it's like oh, they had to cut corners here. It's it's very consistent, and part of that is just Tomino is a director of incredible consistency. Yeah, but because um, even Victory, I think, hides its budget problems better than most shows that have budget problems. Oh yeah, yeah, um, for sure. But yeah, it's oh my god, it's out of this world. Yeah. So let's transition into the history lesson yes. segment of the podcast. So I always way, love these. Yeah, we can we can really dig in. Um, and to do the history lesson for this one, we can't start at the last Gundam we did after War Gundam X. We have to back up to Victory Gundam because, as we've said multiple times, Turn A Gundam is the return of Yoshiki Tomino, the the father of Gundam, uh, to to the series after uh, Victory. So, Victory Gundam was 1993. To, to briefly recap with that one, if people remember from our episode that we did, uh, there were lots of weird production issues on that one because of conflicts between Tomino and Sunrise, the production studio. Like, the most obvious one of those being that the order of the first four episodes is completely mixed up. Um, and, like, it's like episode four is episode one, and it's... It maintains to be one of the weirdest things ever at a TV show is you just start with episode four and then episodes one, two, and three become flashbacks and it's, it's very bizarre. Um, and Victory Gundam is, you know, not met with like huge acclaim um, necessarily. And then Tomino is like very, you know, frank on record as not liking Victory Gundam. Clearly, it's like the experience of working on that show was difficult for him. So after that, Gundam gets handed off to other people and that's where we get. You know our the the guns we've talked about in the last few months of uh, G Gundam, Gundam Wing, and then afterward Gundam X. While all those shows were being made, Tomino kind of took a break because um, you know he had been making like one movie or or fifty episode TV show a year um, since the late seventies, and so after nineteen ninety three, he doesn't put anything out until um, Garzi's Wing, which is a much maligned three episode OVA series in nineteen ninety six. I have not seen Garzi's Wing. I know it has, both in the West and in Japan, just an awful reputation. I, it's some kind of fantasy thing. I don't know that much about it. Um, Garzi's Wing is one thing that's interesting about it. It is, is one of the only productions that Tomino has ever worked on that was not produced by Sunrise. Because um, he's, a, you know, the, the, the anime production studios, particularly back in the day, very much had that, like, old Hollywood feel of... You had your like directors and animators and producers worked for those companies and you produced stuff for those companies and you didn't like, oh, I'm going to do stuff with, with uh, Sunrise and no, actually now I'm going to go make something with Madhouse or A1. That's not how that worked. Um, so with Garza's Wing, he went off, did his own thing um, in 1996. In 1998, he comes back to Sunrise and makes a series called Brain Powered. Um, he, he's the writer and the director for Brain Powered and I... One thing I have done, Jonathan, I have also watched all of Brain Powered in the last two weeks. It is a 26 episode show, so it's not, if it was 50 episodes, there's actually no way I would have, um, because I finished watching it two days ago. Um, and, and that was interesting because Brain Powered also doesn't have a particularly good repu uh, repu uh, repu reputation. For some reason, I wanted to say representation. Reputation in the anime community. Um, you know, Eva comes out in 96. So Brain Powered is a post-Evangelion show, although Tomino has said that the basic sort of concept and work he did for Brain Powered was done before he had ever seen Eva. But Brain Powered is usually kind of dismissed as being a Neon Genesis Evangelion ripoff, 
which is hilarious because it is nothing like fucking Beyond Justice Evangelion at all. Um, it has none of the Ultraman stuff is not in brain powered at all, which to me is like, that's one of the defining things that you need to have if you want to have a show that feels like Evangelion. It needs to have a lot of Ultraman in there. But brain powered is um, like bio-organic type mech stuff. Um, it's a very interesting show. Maybe one day we'll cover it for this podcast because because I've enjoyed it quite a bit. It's not. It's kind of like Space Runaway Edeon in that I don't think it's as good as his Gundam work. Um, but it is like a really interesting complementary work to what he does with Gundam. It's very concerned with environmentalism. Um, in fact, it's like the most blatantly environmental show. It is a show that exists in an apocalypse where there's a giant alien ship called Orphan that had landed on Earth in prehistoric times that's like by giant, I mean, it's like the size of a continent and it is slowly rising from the ocean. Um, and as it is rising from the ocean, the ocean levels is, go crazy and so cities are being flooded. Lots of scenes of like people running away as the whole city is taken over by a giant tidal wave kind of stuff. Um, and then you have your main characters piloting brain powers, which are organic living mech suits and they're fighting against Orphan that have their own bioorganic mech thingies called Grand Chairs and it's very good. Um, I like it quite a bit. And Brain Powered, one thing that's interesting about it is a lot of um, people who work on Turn A Gundam came from Brain Powered. So Brain Powered is the first major role um, that Romy Park ever plays is as a supporting character in Brain Powered. Um, the actress who plays Sociate in Turn A Gundam plays one of the main characters in Brain Powered. The guy who plays Gwyn uh, in Turn A all plays the main villain in Brain Powered. Um, so lots of people that Ted Tomio worked with, and lots of people behind the scenes as well, um, including producer Hideoki Tomioka, who before Brain Powered had worked on Gundam Wing and then After War Gundam X. Um, after After War Gundam X, he works with Tomino on Brain Powered. So Tomino does the, does the show again. It's a 26 episode show, um, and and while it doesn't currently have like a really great reputation, I think. Um, brain powered was reasonably successful at the time and so they decide well let's work on something new what do you want to do Tomino and Tomino decided I want to come back and I want to work on Gundam again and do a new Gundam show so in 1999 three years after after War Gundam X um, finished Turn A Gundam called Turn A Gundam comes out um, and so to make Turn A Gundam again, he, he sort of gathers a bunch of people that he had worked on um, with, with Brain Powered, including a lot of the voice actors. Um, he also hires Akita Yasuda to do the character design. Um, the main reason I mentioned that is that he doesn't do a lot of stuff on anime, other than he did do some mech design on a couple shows like Code Geass, and then he came back for Reco and G to do some mech design on that. But he's most well known as being one of the major character designers working at Capcom. And so he worked on games like, you might have heard of games like Street Fighter 2, um, Final Fight, uh, Darkstalkers, Marvel Super Heroes, which eventually becomes Marvel vs. Capcom, X-Men vs. Street Fighter. So um, that kind of 90s era Capcom, uh, almost any of those major fighting games that Capcom put out in the 90s, Aku Yasuda did um, a lot of the major character design work um, in terms of the art for that. And, and one other thing I did in preparation for this episode is some very kind pioneering person on the internet uh, put out um, the commentaries, the episode commentaries for the Japanese Blu-ray release of Turn A Gundam. They're not translated, but it's just like the raw audio files. And so I, and there's like eight episodes worth of those. And I listened to those. And one of those, Akita Yasuda talks about how Capcom and Sunrise had buildings that, I think it was either buildings right next to each other or offices in the same building. So he and Tomino would sometimes just be in like the cafeteria at that building together and they would talk and that's kind of just how he ended up working on it. Um, also to do the mech designs for a lot of the major mechs, he hires Sid Mead, who is best known as a major industrial designer for Hollywood movies. Um, most notably, I think for us, Blade Runner also worked on like the Alien franchise. Um, and so he hires Sid Mead to do work on the Gundams. He, the original design for the Turn A Gundam was too exotic uh, for what they were looking for. And they're like, this is maybe a little bit extreme, but they still wanted to use it. So the sumo design in Turn A Gundam is what the original Gundam was going to be. Um, and then working on other stuff, Sid Mead designs, or it's like the main designer, obviously with touch-ups by Kunio Okawada and some of the other people working at Sunrise. He designs Turn A Gundam, Turn X, The Wadam, The Wads, um, and The Sumo, which 
is the first and only time a Westerner has designed um, Gundam or like mobile suits for a Japanese Gundam series. Um, and then he also hires Yoko Kano, who had also done the music on Brain Powered, um, to do the music for Turn A Gundam. Yoko Kano um, would later, I think, become most famous for shortly after this doing the music on Cowboy Bebop. And then she also did the music on Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex, and then obviously a lot of other uh, stuff. I mean, if you look at her, it's huge. Macross Plus, she yes. had already done at this point. She's, it's like she's, she's one of those anime composers who has a Wikipedia page with a picture, which is yeah. rare, um, and a gigantic list of credits. Yeah, so she's um, like one of my favorite composers of anime. Um, yeah. she, and, and games. She's done some good um, soundtracks for games as well. Um, and yeah, her, her soundtrack for Brain Powered is also very good. Her soundtrack for Turning Gundam is next level fucking... I think... I don't think I had fully appreciated how good it was the first time I watched the show, but I listened... I got the soundtracks and listened to the soundtracks um, while I was doing the second watch through. And I think it's probably my favorite soundtrack she's worked on, and it is fucking amazing. Oh, it's fucking amazing. Yeah. It's. I think the my conclusion from everything you're saying, Sean, is Tomino put together... An all-star fucking team for yes, this one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he, he he put together like an all-star team and came back with this idea of wanting to unify Gundam together. Um, and and considering the fact that he didn't work on Gundam again, really, he did like um some movie stuff. Like he did the movie versions of Zeta. He did a like short thing called Ring of Gundam, but didn't do a full. Gundam TV production again until Reckon Gisa and G, which isn't until 2014. This is 14 years later. So there's this real feel of he wants to take all the stuff that he worked on, but then also the, the shows that had been done in his absence um, with the Gundam name and combine them all together and kind of provide his like definitive. And, if, and there's an interesting um, interview on an anime news network where he uses this phrase of like a positive direction. Like he wanted this like definitive positive culminating experience of Gundam um, and put together this sort of like dream team in many ways to get it to happen um, and then he so he names it Turn A Gundam uh, and which is named after a mathematical symbol which is called Universal Quantification um, which is normally would be called the Turned A but he calls it Turn A Gundam. Um, one of the reasons why he calls it Turn A um, is because he wants the viewer to think about the, the A turning. It's not that it has turned, it's that it is turning. It is a turn A um, because it is about cycles and it is about the sort of cyclical nature of history and cycles within um, history and within people. Um, and then obviously universal quantification is it is defining everything of what Gundam is and that is why it is the turn A. But because if you just put out um, a Gundam show that has an upside down A next to the word Gundam, everyone's going to look at that and be like, didn't you already make something that was V Gundam? Victory Gundam is yes. usually called V Gundam. So he's decided, well, so it's pronounced Turn A Gundam. And to make sure that everyone knows that it's called Turn A Gundam, he did, I think, the only time in history where a show has a pronunciation guide for the title of the show in the title treatment of the show, which is if you look at the logo for Turn A Gundam in very small font under Turn A Gundam, it says, called, tur quote, Turn A Gundam, yes. uh, which is the best thing ever. And in the theme song, they have a narrator. This is not on the song track. This is no. separate. Who says, Turn A Gundam. Yes, Turn and A Gundam. It's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, the culminating thing is that over 1999 to 2000, they create Turn A Gundam, which, as we also said, is the last um, Gundam TV production to be hand-painted on cells. So it is traditional film-style animation. The next um, TV show would be Gundam Seed, and that is, like, the first, like, full digital animation, like, modern digital color. It's the dark kind of days. Stuff. Yeah, it, and it is that transition. So Turn A Gundam, and it just feels like... And, you know, this is not entirely a coincidence because I have been softly... I have been looking at this date, Jonathan, for, like, months, softly pushing the, like, I think we can hit it. I think if we get it there, we can get Turn It Gundam on our anniversary because it is both the show that I wanted to get to um, one year ago um, when we started rewatching Gundam stuff. And it also is a defining moment of Gundam starting from the original Mobile Suit Gundam in 1979 and leading to here in 1999. And it is... In many ways, it feels like the last old Gundam show to me. Like, everything after this feels like that's part of the new era of Gundam. Turn It Gundam quantifies, defines everything that came before it and sort of nicely caps off this era 
of this wonderful, strange TV show, Mobile Suit Gundam. I have one other question, yeah. and I wonder if you can answer this at all. Okay. We talked so much about the 90s Gundam shows having a lot of interference or kind of demands, like G Gundam was one that the sponsors like came up with the idea of, and yeah. then the director had to figure out, how do I make a good show out of this? Gundam Wing was a fucking mess. After War Gundam X gets canceled. Like, uh, Victory Gundam, Tomino's working on it. It's, it's Tomino, and he wasn't happy with how the, that went. Turn A Gundam feels like he has no leash whatsoever. It yeah. feels like we are watching Tomino's fucking id pouring onto the screen. More, I think, than any other Gundam show. Yeah. Um, and it feels like there is no constraint on the budget level. It feels like there's just... It's it's so such a different experience. Do we know anything about how that came about? Was it just that Gundam had been off the air for a couple of years, so fuck it, let's go wild? Um, it's, so there's... I had... Because I, I looked around for some of that kind of stuff, and there's not a lot of good information about it in interviews or anything like that. Um, like, the most I can say is that in the episode commentary for the Dark History episode, which is the only one that had staff on it most of the commentaries were voice actors which is pretty standard in japan um they one of the people they had on there was hideyuki tomioka and the way that he talked about it was very much this like we're just going to like make the show you want to make um and he worked with tomino to do that um and that commentary was very fun to listen to because it was a lot of because it was him it was um i can't remember her full name her her, her given name was setsuko one of the the animators who worked on that episode um and yasuda the the character designer and they also just talked about how how hard it was because um, the animator basically said Tomino works at I think this is like a light Gundam reference, but he works three times the amount of anybody else, like three times Shars Zaki yes. three times as fast. But in the sense of like, and not in a like, oh, he's redrawing and he's writing new lines. She said like most of what he's doing is he's in the office, he's sitting at his desk with like a coffee or something, and he's sitting there and he's thinking. He's thinking of how do these mobile suits move? How what like what would interesting lines be? What are our characters thinking about? And and like what is going on in the world? Um, and he's reading references to different things. He's reading books and stuff like that. Um, and that when he's doing that, it's you know it's a lot of like the labor stuff we talk about with video games. That is like if the person who's in charge of everything is there working, everybody else is going to be working there too because that's what work culture is. Um, but there is this, this real sense of Tomino just threw everything into this thing. Um, it, I couldn't find any indications of interference, like explicit interference from Sunrise. Obviously it's a, you know, a work that he worked with Tomioka and other people at Sunrise to help make. It's not that like they just gave him infinite money. He just did whatever the fuck he wanted. It's a collaborative thing that is working with other people, but there's absolutely no indication anywhere that it was something that had that kind of inf interference. Obviously, you can't see evidence of that in the show. And Tomino only ever has positive things to say about Turn A and his experience working on Turn A. Like every is that the only Gundam show that's true for? <laughs> it seems to be like every time I, I've seen like a couple of video interviews and then read a couple of like small things in in text interviews. And there's not because Turn A, you know, it, talking about like the popularity, it's one of those that's like it's not unpopular, but it's also not like popular like super popular like a Gundam Seed or the original because um, it's fucking weird like, like it's fucking weird because it's not it's not a populist Gundam but it is it is the like it is the Gundam for Gundam people right yes. it is like if you are a fan of Gundam Turn A is going to be your favorite or one of your favorite Gundam shows and and like the merchandising and stuff like that for Turn A does do well Turn A is well represented in games and stuff like that because Diehard Gundam fans do really like Turn A and they respond to it well, both over here and and in Japan. It just doesn't. It's not a populist kind of work um, in that way. But but yeah. But, but, and so, anyways, that's one of the reasons why there's not as much information about it as there is for say like Gundam Wing, where there's lots of interviews at from like American anime yeah. conventions with people. Well, like this is one that never got dubbed too. It's, yes, it's, yeah. there's no English version. Um, and there shouldn't be because good God, this is a well performed show. Yeah, and it would be a Nightmare. I, I don't know how you do. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you like translate a lot of the dialogue into English. Um, like that's not sub, like that's like performable English. I don't know how you would do. The There's names a, would be a yeah. nightmare. Like there is a part at the end where Harry Orrid just shouts "Universe," um, which has no explanation, and I don't. And that only works in Japanese because he's saying the English word "universe." I you, I don't. Do you just have to say "Uchu" in yes Jap in English? I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyways, every time I see have seen Tomino talk about Turn A Gundam, 
he just looks happy about it and yeah. it is it is like oh man he's just like very satisfied well he just seems satisfied with it and that's where i want to go to open up our discussion yeah. sean because my initial reaction because i watched so the first night, I, I, knowing that just from like looking at pictures, yeah. I knew this was a more out there Gundam. Uh huh. Yeah. And so I, I never, I didn't, don't think I ever told you anything about what no. Turning Gundam is, other than that I liked it. The only thing I knew is that it had this aesthetic that looked kind of seventies and and like eighteen hundreds pre industrial West yeah. to me. That's the only thing I knew. But like as is often common with the Tomy Ocean stuff, I wanted to clear out time to like start this thing. Yes, and I was just like, I'm going to watch episodes until I feel like I have a handle on it. There was no way to do that in one night. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> so I think I did five the first night or something. Um, but anyway, what fascinated me and immediately gripped me about this show is it is above all else to me a celebration of storytelling. Like it mm-hmm. is so drunk on the power of imagination and world building and it is so infectiously enthusiastic with telling you a story yeah. and creating characters and showing scenarios and and building landscapes and showing the relations between people it is it is drunk on that to a degree that i have seen very very few works of visual media ever be just that overwhelmingly you know punch drunk on yeah. what they are doing and boy, when you compare it to Victory Gundam, it is night and day. Yeah. We both like Victory Gundam a lot mm-hmm. and think it is an unfairly maligned show, even by Mr. Tomino himself. Yes. But there is, it is undeniable that Victory Gundam is a kind of bitter show. It oh, is absolutely. A, yeah. It is a pessimistic, bitter series where I think all of Tomino's penchants for world building and detail and theme and design, all of that is there, but it feels like it's curdled a little bit. Yeah. And it, you can tell that he is not 100% happy working on this thing anymore. Um, maybe because he kills multiple characters in like every episode. Yes, he, he like, murders a lot of... That's, that is the peak kill them all Tomino. Yes. Um, is he, he just creates people to kill them. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think Victory Gun... And I think one of the weaknesses of Victory Gun in my mind is I don't think it comes to any like sort of grand conclusion about the state of things the way his other works do. Yeah. Um, and, and I think all of that is there. And then you compare that, okay, he's six years off. As you said, most of that time was not spent working on anime. So he actually got to recharge a little bit. Because Victory Gundam wasn't just the end of his Gundam cycle, as you said, but a TV show or movie for like 14 years in a row. Yeah. More than that. I mean, God, going 70s to 94. Yeah. So he had been doing this so long. And it feels like Turn A is someone who has the, the raw talent of Yoshiyuki Tomino, but is recharged. And that's part of why it feels the most kind of like the original Gundam, oh, yeah. is that same sense of like, I'm making something new, and how exciting is that? And I think you just, you know, you start the show with these kids landing on Earth, and the first episode is wild. I don't, it's amazing to me that the same company that wouldn't let him do episode one of victory as episode one of victory let him do this for episode one of turn a yeah yeah because for reference the reason why they did that that mix-up is that they the sunrise wanted the first episode of their gundam show to end or at some point of the course of that episode have the gundam boy get into the gundam which makes sense yes which you know <laughs> is understandable because that's basically how it always worked i mean zeta kind of puts that off to episode two but it still has a lot of gundam shit in the first episode yes. um and so in even though the first the actual original first episode of Victor Gundam still has a lot of cool mobile suit shit in it. It just doesn't have him get into the fucking Gundam yet. Um, they were like, we have to flip that around. The Gundam boy has to get into the Gundam. By the end of the first episode of Turn A Gundam, the only machine you've seen is the inside of the cockpit of the flat that Lauren and his friends are coming down on. And then the, the top of it breaching out of the sand at the end of the first episode while he's standing on it, staring at the moon, saying, everybody come down here. Earth such is, is such a great place. And again, not only does he not get in the fucking Gundam, you don't see a Gundam. You don't see a mobile suit. You don't see shit. There is nothing to identify this as yeah. Gundam. Not if a you, single thing in that episode. Yeah, if you cut out the first, like, 15 seconds in the last 15 seconds, it basically is just an episode of some sort of, like, 19th century Victorian pastoral story about a young boy working as a stable hand for a reasonably well-to-do family and the politics of the town that they live in. Like, that's yes. basically what the first episode is. And it is hilarious that in those six years, 
could be that much of a difference in in the perspective on what you are allowed to do in this kind of show that's like no fuck it like if this is what you want to do this is what you want to do like he's not getting to the gundam fine you know yeah we've seen what the gundam looks like we know it's going to have a polarizing reaction to the fan base so maybe it's better if we put it off for a little bit because you fucking put a fucking mustache on that thing which is the best thing in the world yeah. but um yeah no i mean and, and so that first episode it's got that quality i'm talking about of being like punch drunk on storytelling yeah but it's also like you go into a show called Gundam and it doesn't look or sound or feel like Gundam at all but that's part of the like you I just felt chemically jazzed coming off of that episode even though I had no idea what this show was going to be about yeah none other than he's from the moon apparently and now he's on earth and really in the scope of things that first episode is a prologue yeah and then episode two is the traditional like Gundam episode one where shit goes down and then in the end he gets in a big robot but like Man, the, the way it's framed, and it feels like such a different world we are in than anything Gundam has prepared us for so far, or will in the future, yeah. knowing that I've seen some of the future stuff as well, um, it's it's wild. And you go through those first couple episodes, and this is a show about... Let me just try to list off a couple of the themes I noticed in the first couple episodes, Sean. Okay, yeah. This is a show that is deeply about class. We will get to that. It's the most fascinating theme of the show to me because it is never explicitly commented on. But mm -hmm. this is 100% a show about class. This is a show about duality and doppelgangers. Yep. Um, and even before, you know, Kihel and Diana get together, that that is all over this show. Yeah. There is a gender fluidity aspect to this show. Um, it is about history and the embedded nature of history literally on, like, the scars of our world and bodies. Yep. Um, God, it is, it is obviously about uh, agriculture and landscape. It is about, like, farming and, and like tilling the land. Yep, yep. naturalism. Um, it is about technology, and it is about widening the scope of technology from what sci-fi usually looks at, which is future technology. But, like, no, anything we build with our hands to mechanize something we could do ourselves is technology. Yep. And this is a show about that. Um, it's a show about politics very much. There's, there's so many things we could list. Yeah. And those are all there in the early episodes. And they get emphasized at different points later. Because I do think the show slows down after the first, like, six or seven. Because it is a fucking barrage of ideas that yeah. moves, like, deliriously fast. Mm -hmm. In a way that, like, original Gundam is like, I thought the thing on the asteroid was, like, five episodes. But that's half an episode. Because yeah. Tomino's crazy. Um, and he can do this. Turnay has a real feeling of that later, but I feel like it is just so excited to get all these ideas out on the table and then start playing with them. Yeah, absolutely, because it does have, I mean, it has the most unique setting of any Gundam, for sure, and, and of, like, kind of any of these sorts of mech shows, I've, I mean, certainly that I've seen, um, that I can speak to, because it does, I mean, it is... It, you know, it's it's rewatching it. It's hard to try to recapture. Like, what did it feel like the first time I watched this? Um, because especially after, because with the after we're gonna max episode, you had already seen the first two or something, something like three or four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd already seen that kind of first batch of episodes. And I remember you telling me about it. It's like, man, turning gun was fucking crazy. And there was something like, you're right, it is. Because I've been obviously living with it as just a fact of nature for like five years that this is what Turn A Gundam is. And I yeah, think about Turn A Gundam a lot. There's a Gundam about farming where he carries a cow around. What's weird yeah, about that? And then I'm like, oh, right. I, you're totally right. The Gundam doesn't appear in the first episode. And it is bizarre. And like, it is like, if you didn't put Gundam on it, because, you know, the first episode doesn't even have the um, opening titles in it. It just right. starts with them coming down and Lauren singing Mary Had a Little Lamb, um, which is, is very good. Um, but like if you didn't know that it was a Gundam thing you just wouldn't think that it is like it literally just does have this purely um, Victorian sort of feel to it it's just one of those stories like it literally just feels like a masterpiece theater thing that first episode is a short story about a boy um, an immigrant you know dark-skinned yeah. boy coming into an upper-class society and, I mean, it's almost got, like, a fucking Charles Dickens sense to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and then there's, like, the two sisters, and one of them has a crush on Lauren, and then Lauren seems to have a crush on the older sister. Like, and it has just, like, this, this, that family dynamic to it um, that it, it, it just feels, like, purely... Like, the, the, I almost wish there was, like, a world where they just made a 12-episode show that was just that. That's, like, an alternative turning on them that didn't have any of the mech shit and it was just like Lauren was from some weird backwater town um him and Keith and Fran were all from there and they decide to move to the big city and he ends up getting washed away in a river and hits, meets these two women and then goes off and becomes a part of their their like weird household 
and that would be that could be a show on its own um and i think it is important for turning gundam to establish that foundation because it, it is a show um i think more so than any other gundam i'm mean, easy more than, than any other gundam is a show that is concerned about the earth and what it means to live on the earth and having that naturalist pastoral foundation that is pulling from this very like literary tradition from english literature that is pulling from um that that first episode is entirely committed to gives it this sort of legitimacy when it's concerned about those themes that other gundam shows are still concerned about a lot of those ideas but they're way further down on the totem pole of themes and ideas that that it's interrogating here it is front and center at all times they are on the earth for like two-thirds of this show and they're only in space for a little period and they come back to the earth for the last three or four episodes and it's just really concerned about people living on the earth and from the earth and off of the earth yes and i would add to that also when they are in space i think one of the great subversions of this show is what the moon looks like yes absolutely when you yeah. get to the moon and you realize oh they just made it look like earth yeah that's a huge moment for me and this show is smart but anyway, um, but yes, I mean, and this is something I was thinking about a lot, Sean, is that 90s Gundam is very Earth-centric. Uh -huh. Vic Victory Gundam is the first, because it's kind of funny, 90s Gundam technically starts with F-91, which has no Earth at all. Yeah. It's all space. But then you do Victory Gundam, which is the first Gundam to start on Earth, and every other Gundam in the 90s does that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, G Gundam starts on Earth, um, Gundam Wing starts on Earth, and, and After War. All of those start on Earth and are primarily set there. Gundam Wing the least so. But because Gundam Wing does wind up having a lot of space stuff, but it still feels like that's our kind of totem. Whereas, like I would say, the the original like cycle of Gundam to Shars Counterattack is a little bit more about space. If you kind of even it oh, out. Oh yeah, like um, especially I think like Zeta and Double Zeta. I yes. think of space as more the default of those shows for yes. sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, and even if you read like Tomio's original Gundam novelization, they never go to Earth. Yes, yeah, it's all space in the moon. Yeah. yeah, he's very fascinated with space in that period. And so Earth is a very constant setting in these shows. I think Victory comes the closest to making Earth a real presence, but even then it is, as you say, it's lower down the totem poles of ideas. Turn A is the first and only Gundam that is about yeah. Earth. It is about the Earth, like the literal land and the soil and the creatures who live there. It is the first Gundam to like really heavily pay attention to how mobile suits move on the Earth and that their footsteps leave fucking craters as they move. Like, and I, I hadn't realized that other Gundams didn't do that until I saw this one paying. So, and again, it's partially just this show would have to have the budget and time put in to animate, like, Earth crumbling beneath Gundam feet as they move. Yeah. And stuff like that. It is so invested in that. You know, this is a show where the, the main title mobile suit pops out of a statue of rock. Yes. You know, in, in the, in a put against a cliff side. Um, it is so about Earth consistently throughout the entire thing. And that gives it this, it, it makes it fit into the Gundam canon more naturally than I think it otherwise would because Earth is something that it feels like the 90s Gundam always kind of wanted to go here but never yeah. did. And now it fully does that and it feels like actually a much more natural fit than maybe it sounds like just from when you first see the show and you're like, what the hell is this? But it, you know, it feels very much like an evolution of Gundam themes by doing that. Yeah, and it feels like a healthy counterpoint to like Char's counterattack in, in Char in that movie in this like, you know, Char's whole thing is that very like, I need to, to save the earth, I kind of have to destroy the earth in order to protect the earth we have to get rid of the earth federation which is ruining it then to be fair they totally are but at the same time he would be sacrificing basically the lives of everybody living on earth and be and all the animals yeah and like dooming the earth's biosphere to who god knows how long of uh, having to repair from this and for like new forms of life to prop up um and it, it feels good to have this show be so concerned with like let's just center the viewpoint there um, and having that first episode end with um, Lauren calling everybody to Earth. That's his, he, you know, he is there. He went there two years before Deanna Counter to sort of see what it would be like um, as like a sort of like early immigrant, basically. And, and he loves it so much. He loves living there. He loves the people there. He loves just seeing the, 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 the world and, and standing on it. And he calls everybody back home, you know, naively not understanding like the reality of what that situation would actually have to become um but centering that perspective to this is what people are fighting over it is this planet and the right to live here and what it means to live here and why and like the responsibilities we have 
living here to not just live on the earth, but to take care of it and to cherish the home that we all share, which to me is like the ultimate message of what Turning Gundam is trying to get across. And it, it, it is such a pure, hopeful, optimistic thing, um, which is so, it's one of the things I love about Turning Gundam. Like I love that it is not a kill em all Tomino kind of thing, that it is a very hopeful show that has lots of like darker complexities and nuances and certainly understands the darker themes and the dark realities of what actually happens, but has this like plea to, we need to take care of this thing that we all share together, that we are all connected by and that we are all, you know, horribly ravaging and destroying for ourselves and creating a habitat that we can no longer live in. Um, and in the show having this kind of more hopeful outlook, it, 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 it certainly coming from Victory Gundam, it feels like this really huge thing. And, and also brain powered, also has a similar, very optimistic, hopeful feeling ending that feels like Tobino had a sort of perspective switch in some ways of moving away from killing off bunches of characters and stuff like that. There were apparently early drafts of Turn A Gundam that would have had lots of other characters having died, like Kiel apparently at some point in an early draft or like idea, like plan would have died at some point. Harry Met would have died at some point. And then slowly, basically all of those deaths, Tomino decided to reverse and say, nah, we don't need to kill that character and then just kind of kept the story going that way. Well, this is interesting because we're actually maybe going to have to have a little bit of a debate of how hopeful the ending is because okay. I don't know if I feel that way. But I would, so I would say hopeful in the sense of that like people can survive. Yes. Um, who knows if we will like ultimately learn the ultimate lesson, but like we, we, can, we can have I, the earth at least for this time. Yeah, and I agree that the general outlook of the show is that yeah. but i do think like it it, it has turn a gundam has a really interesting kind of arc towards an evolving complex darkness because it it's setting what it allows it to do is we're not coming into a fallen humanity um like we are in every other gundam show yeah you know and all the other gundam shows we're coming in in you know in the original one we're coming into the middle of the one year war yeah, where, where half, half of the human population has been killed in the colony drop yes yeah. zeta gundam and double zeta are following on that you know to um all the other Gundams have some kind of... I guess G-Gundam is, is a different thing. But G-Gundam's always... We do, We can't have these conversations and always be, say, but G-Gundam's a different thing. Let's it's just, just take it as thing, granted yes. that G-Gundam's a different thing. Yeah, but, but all of these have sort of a fallen humanity aspect, whereas there is this sort of pastoric idol that kicks off turn A, where we are far enough in the future, which looks like the past, where humanity has kind of... Like, Earth has healed and humanity alongside it from all of the past atrocities we've seen in other Gundam shows. And this whole show is about the people on Earth uncovering the sins of their ancestors and the sins of this planet's past. And finding within themselves some of those impulses to violence and destruction that they could not have imagined. And and I think that's really interesting. And I think I think the finale. We'll we'll talk about it. I think it strikes the exact perfect balance on how to thread that needle because there's no way to do the story they're telling and have it end unambiguously positively. Um, but it, it definitely the the finale especially left me feeling very complicated and conflicted in oh, the yeah. ways I think the show wants you to feel. Absolutely, because I think part of what I think part of what the show is doing that's really interesting is that there's this conflict between. I think the way that Lauren sees the world and sees Earth, he has this very positive outlook and he's only, I think, seeing the positive things. But as the show goes on, I think it becomes more and more apparent that those like that the traumas buried within the Earth, which is the history of Gundam, um, it, like humanity hasn't changed, right? That's like all those things that caused that cycle to happen like humanity hasn't fixed any of those things they just haven't had the tools available to them to wreak the destruction they would have had but like Gwyn Reinford was always the dude who would be like the guy who would lead the Earth Federation right and create that kind of corrupt um you know aristocracy like like those instincts in people and those like the those desires they have are there and are working all the time in the show it's just not apparent to you I think immediately that that's what's happening that it's like it is not i think that humanity like in that period has gotten better 
is that they have lost access to the technology to wreak the, their desires and their ambitions on the world to the scale that they once did in other Gundam shows. And I guess I would only tweak that to say, because of that lack of destructive technology, the goodness in people comes through more. And Lauren sure. gets to see it more than Amaro gets to see it, you know, yeah. um, on Earth with people. And that's that's also, I think, part of the show's message about like technology and progress and innovation and these sorts of things that... Um, are not an unalloyed good because of what they bring out in people and what they reflect, right? Yeah. Um, but yes, we will have a lot to say about Mr. Gwyn Reinford. Yeah. So All right. we, I think we need to decide how we want to break this show down because I have, and I don't know if this is how we want to do it because this was very hard to do, but I did break down it into chunks of episodes um, that we could talk about that way if we wanted to. Like it does certainly does not chunk up nicely the way that After Organic no. does because it, there is... A lot of stuff, but it does have like broad arcs that's like okay, and then this part they go to space and stuff like that. Or we could take another another tack. What do you feel like, Donovan? I kind of want to start by diving into some of the characters and ideas, okay. yeah. you know, because there's there's so many, and I feel like this is going to have to be more associative than just breaking down episodes. If All that right. makes sense, yeah. Absolutely. Although I would like to hear your chunks later. Um, okay, we can do that. Yeah, later. I didn't name any of the chunks because. They're not unified enough for yes. me to be like, oh, this is a funny name. Like, I don't know. I, I guess the first four episodes go together. I mean, this is a show with many, many characters we could talk about. I do want to just start with Lauren slash Laura. Yes. Lauren Sahak slash Laura Rora. Dora Rora. Which is maybe the best name other than Jim Burrell because of how it is pronounced in Japanese. Yes. Um, and so, yeah. So, I think since we're just saying it, um, this is, we're just calling him Lauren um, as the pronunciation, not Rolin or Loran or whatever, you know, it's one of those names that you look at as like, there's two R sounds in Japanese, but it's supposed to be a Western name. How the fuck do you, what, how are you supposed to say it? I don't know. It sounds like Lauren. It, Gwen likes to call him Laura, so it's clearly supposed to sound like Lauren. So we're going with Lauren. It is an intentional, like, bit of, of uh, funny making on Tomino's part, I yeah. think. Funny making is the wrong word, but, like, it's mischievous. It's a mischievous, yes. like, naming scheme that he's given this poor kid. Um, played by the great Romy Park yes. in, as you say, so if, if, what was the show, Brain? So Brain Powered was her first supporting, major supporting role. I think she had kind of had, like, a couple of very minor yeah. background things. This is her first time as a lead and the first time she ever played a boy. Yes, yeah. and Romy Park, if you don't know, is one of like the the great voices of twenty first century anime. Oh yeah, yeah, she's in everything. She's um, the main dude in Full Metal Alchemist. Yeah, she's which is she's famous. Edward Elric, which you which is really funny. I mean, if you want to know her range, listen to Ed and then listen to Lauren. They do not sound the same. Uh -huh, yeah. Ed has such a harder edge. He is voiced to sound kind of older and more cynical and. It's, uh, she's an incredible actress, and I think this is one of her like towering achievements. It's an incredible performance. Yes, she's also known to me, of course, as the player of Parkson from Yakuza 5, which I always thought was fucking hilarious because she just kind of looks like Roby Park, and the character is named Mirei Park, and so everyone calls her Parkson, and they're like, it's Parkson. Yeah. But yeah, Roby Park, great voice actor in video games and in anime, and this is where she got her start, um, really. I mean, in the, in the audio commentaries, because she was on almost all of them, um... She said like multiple times that if she hadn't gotten this role, who knows what her career might have been. Like like this was the thing that got her the most attention. She while she does play lots of female characters, she's most known as playing boys. Um, mm -hmm. and this was the first time she did that. But like you say, like Lauren is doesn't sound like a lot of her other like shonen type characters that she plays because she also plays one of the main characters in um, Bleach. That is a lot more like her Edward kind of voice. Yeah. And here it is like, Lauren is the sweetest person in the world. He yes. is the nicest Gundam boy you could ever, but not just nice, he's the kindest, most compassionate, empathetic Gundam boy of all the Gundam boys. Like if you want a Gundam boy to give you a hug, you want it to be Lauren because that's the kind of person Lauren is. And that's... What I like is that that's how he starts, and that's basically how he ends. And there's like, you know, he he complicates and, and gets more sophisticated and, and changes in different ways. But he always has this like deep, unmoving compassion for people that is always what primarily motivates him. And I love that about him so much. There is something of a coming of age arc to this one. There inevitably is when you yes. start with a boy and have him age over the course of the show. But it's not 
a coming of age arc as you get for Amuro or Camille or Judo or Uso or any of those characters who yeah. their arc is towards darkness and towards realizing how bitter and brutal the world is. Lauren does realize those things, but what he doesn't do is change his behavior to them all that much. Yeah. I think it is fascinating. This show has exactly one fight to like where where both pilots are trying to fight to the death with the Gundam, and it is in the finale. Yeah, and that is the only time. And you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I really think that's the only time Lauren goes into battle intending to do lethal harm to the opponent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and he it tears him up as he's very clear about that. He does not want to kill Jim Ginjin him. Gim Gingenhammer. Gim Gingenhammer. That is a name that is so much easier to read in Katakana yeah. than it is in Roman. Which is why I'm just going to refuse to try to say it in English, and yes. he's just Gingenham to me. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. It also makes me think of Jin Jenneheim from another Gundam show. Yes, yeah, from which, Victory. Yeah, 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 it's too similar. Anyway, but, you know, that's the only character he really is trying to kill. The Gundam in this show is for the vast majority piloted for either completely peaceful purposes like transporting cows and agriculture. Yep. Or to defuse situations with the force it has. It is not ever intended by Lauren to be used as a machine of death. Yeah. Which is one of the main big ideas of the show. Is what technology can be and what we use it for and the gap between those things. Yeah, and that Lauren refuses to recognize it as a... The turn a Gundam as a weapon. Yes. Um, regardless of what its like legacy may be as he starts to learn about the history of what it is. Um, not just Gundams in general, but specifically also the Turn A Gundam, that the, him and then Deanna comes to that at this point of view as well, that, that, that these things are just tools. Yes. Um, and if he, he wants to, he, he can choose to use it non-lethally. Um, he can make it into a laundry machine in one of my favorite Gundam set pieces yes. ever, yeah. where he just helps... Deanna do the laundry with the Gundam. Yeah. I think we'll talk about that episode because uh, I think there are a couple of episodes that I want to like talk about yes. as episodes. Um, that's one of them. But yeah, he he, he you're absolutely right that he he. I think he maybe never kills anybody. There's a couple of like, mm, did somebody get killed when he shot that ship? Maybe, maybe not. But he's never trying to kill anybody. He's always trying to avoid it. He's always trying to defuse situations. Um, and he has, and I think his like. Defining motivation, and this is like a speech he gives at the end of the Lord's Cow episode, um, where he announces at the end of that episode that I'm a moon race, I'm a member of the moon race, and I, by fighting against them, by I'll fight against earthlings as well, I will fight against anybody who does not cherish life. And that's his standpoint. This is like, it, he's not fighting on, any, on either of these sides really at, at any point in the conflict. He's only ever trying to fight to make sure that people can live peacefully and happily. And he's kind of on his own in that objective. Like, he, he gets resources from Gwyn, but he's not really with Gwyn Reinford, right? He's, they, if there's any one person that he's dedicated to, it's Deanna. And that's because he recognizes that she carries the same values that he does. Yes. And it is... It's it's a very unique Gundam character. He's I think by far the most out of the like Amaro mold of any oh, of yeah. the Gundam boys so far. Um, I don't know where they kind of go with that in the future, but you've told me it's you know Amaro is the mold for most of them. Oh, Amaro is absolutely the mold for most of them. Yeah. yeah, and and Lauren is not in that mode at all. Like he's he's just completely different. Romy Park gives such a unique performance. The visual design. I mean, this character is dark skinned. And yeah, that's, he's black. Yeah, he's the only well Orga in Iron Blood Orphans. I think you could read that like his character design is black, like, yeah. but other than that, like until 2016, he's the only black Gundam protagonist for sure. Yes, and there is also obviously a lot of um, class implications here because yes. he is someone who who a is is black and then falls to earth and is sort of taken in as a lower rung of society and works for the most part as a servant. He is honestly this is like if Lord of the Rings was done from Sam's perspective. He oh, is yes. the Sam yeah. Gamgee of this series. He is, you know, fiercely loyal to the people he's working for, mostly because they've earned it. It's, it's not just that, but there is also this class thing at play that comes between him and a lot of other characters that he also, and I think this is part of why I read the ultimate ending of the show, The Denouement, as, as somewhat sad and, and disturbing is the wrong word, but melancholy to me, yeah. is that he never really breaks out of it. Mm -hmm. um, he is sort of always in that rung, and it's, it's something that... Um, is a really interesting thread throughout this whole show. Because again, and I think it's an intentional thing by Tomino, but class is a thing that is everywhere in this show and is never commented upon. Yeah. Yeah. That, like, yeah, because Lauren, 
he because when he comes to Earth, he becomes the the because he starts out as just basically like a stable boy. Yeah. Um. Then eventually he gets upgraded to chauffeur, which is a nice uh, foreshadowing of being the Gundam pilot. Basically, yes. that he's the guy who drives the car. Um. But yeah. But when you go to the moon, you realize that oh, he just lived in like a poor fishing village on the outskirts of the moon on a village who because of the the structure of moon society is basically even though they have access to much better technology isn't really more wealthy in any like recognizable way than where he was living on earth yeah um it's just like people living in huts fishing on artificial rivers um with really cool moon whales um and that's where he grew up uh and having this like incredible love and loyalty to queen diana um who sends him down to earth and you're right that he never he there, never breaks from that sort of class mentality that, and a, that that he is a person who serves, right? That he is both literally a servant, but that also that is like the mentality he has to the world around him is that he exists to help other people do what they want to do and do the things they need to do. And that's his role in society, which is both tragic because it means that he doesn't ever fulfill... If he has his own ambitions that are for his own benefit he never fulfills them and we don't even know what they are because he never verbalizes or expresses that at any point we get a little hint of what it might be at the end and we don't like yeah. there's, there's a lot there i think i think there's a couple ways to read that too because there's a very dickens-esque nobility of the lower class thing going on with uh -huh. Warren, where yes. i think there's something about like someone who does not have everything being the moral compass of this world and that he is a servant not just in the sense of serving rich people but serve he wants to serve everyone he wants everyone to be on equal footing yeah. he wants everyone to live as he's seen the beauty of life because he hasn't had things given to him right yes and there's a certain nobility of the lower class to that too but there's also that idea of like the prism of class is a prison in and of itself yes um in that he can never quite see outside of it and i think when you go to the moon and you see where he grew up and that it is this little facsimile of earth and very little it's like this this two bays and an artificial river and there's some very cool moon whales yeah but then the city like the, the big world is beneath him underneath these like windows this glass under the water and and he's removed from it and so when he goes to earth of course he fucking falls in love with earth because it's earth it's yeah. open and it's everything and it's everywhere and and but he is still in that kind of class worldview because think about where he was raised. He can't quite expand his POV beyond that. And I think it's one of the most interesting things that happens in this show, especially considering so much of, of Domino's earlier work is about the, the expansion of perception. Yeah. And that happens to Lauren, absolutely. But, um, I mean, one, the word new type is never said in this show. No, there are, other than maybe... At the very end, there's no new type flash. Like, yeah. Coronander has something that looks like a new type flash, but there are not new types in the show. Yeah, this is not a new type show, and it is the kinds of perception that are altered are much more human scale. Yeah. Um, but yeah, should we also talk about his dual identities as male and female, as Lauren and Laura? Yes. Which could be its own podcast. Uh huh. Yeah. Because so yeah, the other one of the other major themes um, in Turn A Gundam is identity and duality of identity whether that's expressed in like doppelgangers in the roles that people play in society um which you know we're gonna i we're gonna talk like two hours just about kiel and deanna at this rate but um but yeah also gender and a little bit of sexuality in that when we get to gwen gwen is um again up until iron-blooded orphans the only gay character in gundam um but yeah that that lauren has to perform this role as laura rolla um and it's like that episode where they all attend the bar uh, the ball together and kiel does the classic like victorian you put your books on your head and you train to be a nice proper lady which that must be very easy because he does it all in like one day um he does it like the morning they find out that he has to go do that at the party in the, at night and he spends the afternoon working with kiel and it's like lauren is a hard worker he figures shit out yeah he's a he's a smart boy um and yeah he shows up and Laura Roller, Rolla also fucking hot. Like Lauren, Lauren fucking nails it, dude. Yes. Right? Like no, he's you're got totally this right. like green just, silk had, dress, yeah. this necklace, like his hairdo. It's like I had not thought it, about it boy. in those terms. Oh but yeah. He has yes because it's he he sells it when when he is she and it's 
Yeah, I mean, they. I think the payoff to this with Gwyn in the last episode and the conversation he has with Lily Borgiano oh is one of the most perfect pieces of writing in all of Tomino's Gundam. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the Laura Lauren identity and the boy-girl shift and how he wears these two gender identities throughout the show and kind of has to go back and forth between them and how they also carry obviously different perceptual qualities to the people he is talking to and conversing with you know who expects different things out of different people and how laura is this laura is still though very much a part of him like why is it so easy for him to walk with the books and I was like, well it's because he's a servant and he yeah. is this quiet kind of boy who is feminized in a lot of ways yeah like if he's that's got like longer hair and stuff like yeah. that already yes that's part of why Romy Park's performance is so uniquely great is because Tomino isn't asking her to do an Edward Elric, you know, Bart Simpson, any kind of like young boy voice where it is supposed to sound masculine. Yeah. He, it's supposed to sound feminine. There is supposed to be a feminine element of Lauren um, that is, I think, tied in some ways to, to childhood and naivete and tied in other ways to, um, you know, different class roles and things like this. Um, but it's there in him from the beginning to the end. Yeah. It, yeah, and it's really fascinating in the way that, like, those identities just kind of become mixed up as he's supposed to be Laura because Laura's supposed to be the pilot of the Turday Gundam. Yes. But obviously, Lauren's just running around in his very cool blue, like, bomber outfit um, that is a matching outfit with Sochier's pink bomber outfit, which is great. Um, and he's, especially in that first half of the show, he's constantly encountering people that think it's supposed to be Laura and they see it's Lauren and they're like disappointed that, oh, this isn't the famous Laura Roller Gundam pilot of the Gundam. This is just some boy. Because Laura is also where he most plays outside of his class identity. Yes. Because Laura seems like more of a peer of Deanna and Kehel. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's in the guise of Laura that Lauren challenges Deanna when she yes. it's the first time he's met her since she came down to Earth. Um, and that's where he just confronts her boldly in the middle of the party. And it's like, why aren't you doing something? Like, did you come here to start war? Because people are dying. Um, and like, what are you, like, you're not supposed to do this. Like, this is not the, the role that Queen Deanna is supposed to play. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. And, um, you know, we, we could do, again, do a whole podcast series about Japanese anime's relationship with cross-dressing because it's fascinating mm -hmm. and it's sometimes problematic and I think it's sometimes really interesting and in either ways it's engaged with much more in Japanese media than it is in American media. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the better examples of that I've seen in anime, I, I'll say. It's, it's really a fascinating use of it, um, yeah. especially because it is about gender fluidity a lot. It is not about sexuality and I find that separation kind of interesting. Because Lauren is not a sexual being in this show, really. Yeah. Um, he's... I don't know if he's supposed to be prepubescent or not, but, like, he, he doesn't... No, because he's he's actually one of the oldest Gundam protagonists. Okay. He's 17 years old. Yeah. He lands on Earth when he's 15, and then two years passes. Yeah. And so, Sochier is 13 when he lands on Earth and is 15 by the time the show, like, proper okay. starts. So, because he is sort of, as he presents to the world, a bit of an asexual character. Yeah. He's... Um, at least it's something that he is not actively interested in i think it's also part of the, the class thing too of like all the women in his life are of a higher station and he's not really positioned to to grasp onto that in yeah. that way he's he knows how to serve which is what deanna and kihel are fine with and want but so she doesn't want a servant she wants a boyfriend yeah and he can't give her that and it's yeah there's so many again we could do the whole episode just on lauren yeah and that stuff is like like you said it's very sort of classic victorian dixon dickensian yeah. kind of yeah, servant like the tragic, yeah, love um, between a servant and a because that that master closing, closing montage, which we'll talk a lot about when we get to that. Yes. Um, it does show that that while he has a sort of asexual presence throughout the show, he is not that, and he does have yeah, he some clearly level has romantic feelings for Associate. Yes. Like he he clearly has that for most of the shows. He just doesn't actively express it. Yeah, because well, he, he feels it's not appropriate. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk about that when we get there. Anyway, Lauren, awesome, great. Uh, do we want to tackle Kehel and Deanna next, or do a couple smaller characters? Let's first? do some of the smaller characters first. Um, let's, let's yeah, go to Sochie, uh, voiced by Akino Murata, who again was one of the main characters in Brain Powered. Um, and I guess this is where since this is the second instance of um, an actress that this was like basically the second role she had. She has not been in a lot of anime. She like mostly I think does voice work in other areas, um, but. It, because this specifically, I think, is where you feel it strongest with her performance as Sochier is Tomino clearly very intentionally with this show 
went to cast people who were mostly unknowns yeah. um, that had barely any experience um, in voice acting, uh, which is also true of the original Mobile Suit Gundam. And with the original Mobile Suit Gundam, I don't think that was a case of them doing that because that was an intentional thing and more because the anime industry was much younger then. And so the supply of here's 500 hugely experienced veteran voice actors that could play this one specific role that played roles like it in 50 other shows like that didn't that structure didn't exist in 1979 by 1999 slash 98 which is when they would have been casting all this stuff um you know we're in the modern era of the seiyu industry at this point we are in like these are in fact we have a couple of actors like fukuyama june in this show in remy park that this is their first role and they end up being one of the major voice acting talents of the whole 21st century and so like the seiyu industry and radio shows and all that is like well in full swing at this point um so there would have been lots of very experienced actors to play a lauren or to play associate or kiel or any of those characters um but instead there's this intentional choice that's similar to what brainpower did um considering a bunch of these actors also came from brainpower that was like with their first role to cast relatively unknown people that didn't have a lot of experience in voice acting. And based on the um, episode commentaries I listened to, almost every single voice actor said one thing to the question of, like, what can you remember any specific feedback or, like, commentary that Tomino made on your voice acting? And basically everybody said, like, he told me, just don't really think about it too much. Um, that, that, that he specifically told Promi Park, I thought this was, like, interesting, that she was struggling with a line, and he said... Look, you play Lauren Sayak. Anything that you say is something that Lauren says. Don't think about it too much. Just do it. And that's the approach, I think, for the whole voice acting cast is just like, just don't think about it. Just do it. Um, and it lends all the voice acting, I think, associates is the most apparent, this very raw, um, feed, like fairly naturalistic feel to the acting that is also something that reminds me a lot of Ghibli movies because Ghibli does a lot of the same stuff. Yes. They mostly cast outside of traditional um, say you or voice acting circles, get a lot of, like if they have a child character, they'll cast a child actor to play the character. Um, and then the main characters are usually people who have not played a lot of roles in voice acting. Yeah. And once in a while, they'll scoop up someone who later became bigger, like a yeah. Mayumi Tanaka in Lakuta. But it's the same as like having Shuichi Ikeda in the original Gundam. He wasn't Shuichi Ikeda yet. Yes, yeah. Or Todo Furia had only yeah. been a couple of things at that point. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, boy, Tomino knows how to pick them, though. Because it's, because he, he made, uh, there's just that whole original Gundam cast went on to be bedrocks of the industry yeah they like defined like three or four of them defined voice acting in the 80s yeah, yeah. and then a couple of the turn a ones would do it again in the 2000s so yeah. yeah and i had not specifically thought about that as much but i think that's because often when i'm watching one of these shows i very frequently look up like who's that voice and i didn't ever i think there was only one and it's it's um gavan guni because yes. he's an actor who is kind of a journeyman gundam guy in the 90s he did someone he was um he's yazan yeah hochi otsuka who's yazan yeah. in zeta and um, then he is a um he's cricket, a cricket, cricket. Cricket. Yeah, yeah. yeah and so i was like god i know that voice and yeah but but otherwise like but that's a pretty small side character for the main ones i was never like Honestly, I would not have recognized that as Romy Park. You know, I, I think oh, yeah. I knew yeah. that going in because her, you see that name on the list and you're like, what? Because um, it's also a weird name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. She's Korean. Or she's right. Korean Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not saying Korean names are weird. I'm saying they're a little you, weird. Yeah. To you see don't it. expect to see the surname Park because in, it's not a Japanese yeah. name. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, but I didn't have that reaction. But now you're explaining this. That makes sense. And I agree completely with you that that kind of raw quality helps a lot and you're totally right Sochi Sochi doesn't just look like a Ghibli character she sounds like one yeah. because there is this like kind of untrained she sounds like an actual adolescent girl who is struggling with her emotions yes you know um, because that's her arc and she's very fast in some ways she's more of like a traditional Gundam protagonist mm -hmm. than Lauren is because of yes. the destruction she sees it's her hometown it's her parents who's killed it's her dealing with revenge versus um, justice you yeah, know she's like actively piloting the Kapool to like go out and fight um, in the way that's like way more similar to like an Amro or a Camille yeah. and she's also 15 which is the normal age of a Gundam protagonist that's what Amro was in the original Wobbles of Gundam like Lauren is weirdly old you, again it's like a couple year difference but yeah. you know usually a Gundam protagonist is like a sophomore in high school not a senior in high school right and so Sochi absolutely has that feeling and I, I love 
her evolution over the course of the show. I think it's amazing how much of it is done in the background. Mm -hmm. But whenever you move her into the foreground, it feels like we've seen every step along the way. Um, and she always feels that even though she's very rarely the center of an episode in the way Lauren or Deanna or Kihel are, she always feels like a presence. And and they balance that pretty good with a couple characters. I think they do that with her. I think they do that with Harry Ord, mm -hmm. um, where where you have these characters who are very rarely the center of an episode, but really feel important all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and I just find her relationship with Lauren and like the military so interesting because she's like she I think is Lauren's like actual link to the militia I think if Sochier wasn't with the militia I think Lauren would have at some point taken the turn at Gundam and fucked off yeah and we've gone with Deanna and gone and done something else but he has both this like loyalty from as we talked with like the servant class thing to Sochier um because he always calls her Ojo-san like that's you know he's always very respectful he speaks in Keigo all that kind of stuff um Keigo being like polite language in Japanese um, but also he has these like unexpressed romantic feelings that are always kind of bubbling under the surface that Sochier obviously also has um, for Lauren that she's had since she saw him. You know, Lauren is probably the first boy she ever saw naked because the first episode he gets washed away in the river with his little goldfish thingy, um, which we'll have to talk about in nudity in the first four episodes of the show as well. Um, but yeah, so it's like she has all these like kinds of feelings towards Lauren, can't really express them. Um, but then is always also motivated by this revenge and this hatred for the moon race um, when she doesn't know that Lauren is one of them and is constantly pushing uh, and is one of those things of the, the dynamic of turning Gundam the thing is fascinating compared to most Gundam shows where most Gundam shows exist either during a war like they start sometime in the middle of a war or in the immediate aftermath of a war and dealing with the fallout from it whereas turn a Gundam is at the very beginning of a war and like them trying to prevent it and it's this constant tension between at the beginning it's just deanna counter and um the the earth militia and these emotions and feelings pushing against each other driving towards this conflict that lauren's trying to stop um instead of it being this conflict that is in feels inevitable or that is already underway and that there's nothing you can do to stop it in that tension of turning again them of trying to wrangle all these people including Sochier, and sort of pacify them in some way and get them to understand that it's like we need to live peacefully or everything we love will be destroyed um and associate plays a key role in that arc absolutely and i think it also is something a strength of the entire show is there is no single character on this show whose perspective i don't think you understand on a pretty profound human level oh yeah absolutely and that is not true of every gundam show and sometimes by design like you are not really meant to get inside gear and zabi's head uh -huh. There's a reason they use the Hitler metaphor. He is one of those monstrous dictators who absolutely exist, who it is really not worth trying to empathize with, right? Yes, you just need to blow them up in their whole dumb space base with them and fucking get out of there. And there's no one like that in Turn 8. The closest is Jim Gingenhamu. Gim Gingenham. Gim Gingenham. But even then, I don't. I, I think he's much more human than a yeah. Zabi. And, and consistently, you see all these perspectives in motion around each other. And Sochi is one of the best examples of that because she has this kind of, this thing that we know is, is wrong. And especially because we're pers our main POV is Lauren. We know we don't want to, we don't want her to go kill Deanna and a bunch of other people. Yeah. But we know why. They fucking killed her dad. And her dad seemed like a pretty good dude in the yeah. first couple episodes. He was a nice guy. He was a good dad. And he dies a brutal death. And then her mother goes crazy. Like there's a reason Sochi is really upset. And, and I think it's one of just, again, the great strengths of this show is you can do that for every character. Their perspective is very clear and the path they got to get there is apparent to us. Yes. Like, you know, for instance, a good example of this for me is um, Lieutenant Phil. Mm -hmm. the guy yeah, who, Phil Ackman. Phil yeah. Ackman. And we also have his subordinate Poe, who we could talk about. There's so much good stuff with them. But Phil Ackman is this guy who becomes, in the first half of the show, he's the, like, warmongering villain in a lot of ways. Because he's the guy who kind of does this little coup d'etat on Deanna. He winds up getting frustrated. He is pushing for more militarism. And that's bad. But at the same time, I 100% understand where Phil is coming from throughout the first half of the show. Yeah. Because he's a soldier who has been asked by Deanna to come to Earth and help them settle Earth. And then she keeps telling him not to do the things necessary to settle Earth. And, and you know, a hammer sees a nail, a soldier sees a war. He's like, I can win this thing in five minutes. Yes, it's it's. I think it's the fact that it's like they have such overwhelming military power that it's yeah. like, 
if Deanna Counter in in episode two just decided to violently subjugate the Earth people, <laughs> we wouldn't be watching Turn a Gundam. We'd be watching War of the Worlds. Yes, and and there's no and there's no germ ending because they're all also humans. So it's like yes. it's just War of the Worlds, but it ends halfway through. Yeah, and it would be very short. And and Lieutenant Phil could do that, and it's not because he's a bad guy. I don't think he is, but he has been like raised in such a way and trained in such a way that this is how he sees things, and he is naturally frustrated with what Deanna is trying to do. And we can feel that about Phil, while also feeling like Deanna is one hundred percent in the right in trying to do this the right way and navigating that and that's very dynamic and that's a level of nuance that very little fiction gets to and frankly the real world doesn't get to a lot yeah right yes and it's <laughs> one of like the i feel like it's one of the hallmarks of tomino's style with yes. characters and it's like really heavily on display here in turn a gundam is this ability to very concisely give you this like window into who that character is um without the character ever telling you that right that it's mm -hmm. it, it's that thing of, we feel like we talked about a lot with mobile suit and zeta gundam because you see it a lot in that and then char in char's counterattacks maybe the best example of it's it's fascinating to just sort of like you get all this sort of evidence of who these people are and you're actively putting it together as a viewer um but what turn a gundam does i think is like more spectacular than any other previous tomino show i've seen is the scale of the huge ensemble that it has and the ability they're able to do that with like you said, virtually every single character that like is a recurring character in multiple episodes, you get that feel for, but you never get the moment where it cuts to Harry and Harry's just sitting there and he's like thinking about it and you get an internal monologue or he's just telling someone, as you know, I feel this way, this way, blah, 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 right? Like you never get that. It's just naturally through really quick snippets of dialogue um, and... You, you cut to those characters, you get those quick snippets of dialogue, it's like 30 second scene, and then you cut back to whatever the main sequence of the episode is in continuing the main plot of the episode. Oh, I mean, I don't think Turn A has a single instance of formal exposition. No. In 50 yeah. episodes. It's amazing. It's, it's, it, even like the original, all of Tomino's Gundams are very good at showing, not telling, an in-universe sort of exposition that is not told directly to you. But even the original Gundam has a narrator at the beginning who tells you some things. It's Uchu Seiki, 0079. Exactly, yeah. right? And and in Zeta and Double Zeta, you have different elements of, like, like Bright is sometimes an expository character, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But this has exactly zero formal exposition. He throws yeah. you straight There's the only the one, end. but it's fully contextualized in the show, and that's the Dark History episode. Yes. That's the only time they do it, but that's also all those characters literally discovering yes. this, like, secret tomb, basically. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know if I would even count that. And, yeah. and it's... It's fascinating how well it works because this also has, I think, the heaviest lifting of any Gundam show in terms of creating a world. Like, the original obviously has a pretty heavy lift, but it's not. It's it looks more like normal sci-fi to us, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not as out there. This one you're really thrown in the deep end. So, okay, so we talked about Associate and some of these characters. Um, who else on the Earth? Um, since we were just talking about Phil, because do you have anything else? Because I feel like no. we ended up without. Yeah officially saying that we were doing the Phil talk. Yes. That was the Phil talk. That was the Phil talk. And, 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 you know, when he comes back to the fold under Deanna at the end, you also understand it. It, it doesn't feel like a heel turn back, you know? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so, but since we did Phil, I feel like we have to do Poe because it's... Cry Baby Poe, yes, as yes. the name of one of the episodes tells us. Um, yeah, who is... And, uh, just to say, sort of Phil is voiced by Tsuyoshi Koyama. This is also... He's not in a huge amount of stuff, but he, he does roles here and there. This is one of his first roles. Uh, Poe Aji is voiced by Yumiko Nakanishi. Also, this is one of her first roles in the anime. So again, it is just like kind of down the line. I think the only character off the top of my head that you have uh, Gavin Gooney and then um, Gim Gingenham is voiced by Dio from JoJo's, um, whose name I can never remember. But we, we'll, we'll talk about those voice actors when we get there. But other than that, basically all these voice actors are, are either new or like fairly new voice actors. Um, but yeah, so Poe, uh, Poe is, I think Poe is a really good example of that. You understand where the character is coming from, even when they're clearly doing the wrong thing. Cause Poe's whole role in, in the show is kind of to do the wrong thing because she has really no other choice. Yes. Um, and she is just flustered and scared because, because one, th I think an important detail about the world building is that Deanna Counter, the force that Deanna brings to earth to settle on the earth is not the traditional moon military because that's led by Ginganam. They are a civilian military force that has been put together by Deanna for that purpose. Because clearly Deanna's idea is that she doesn't want to violently subjugate the earth. She just needs 
bodyguards. She like I think her idea is I we just need to make sure we have we're we're safe in case something happens. Um, because you know, fair enough, something's gonna fucking happen when you try to settle on the earth. Of course it is. Um, and so you know, Poe is not when we first meet her. She's not a trained soldier. This is not a thing that she's been doing. You know, sorties around the moon for five thousand years, or whatever the fuck Gingenham has been doing. You know, she obviously has experience piloting these things, but she's never been in combat before. So I love that whole sequence at the beginning of the series in episode two, where she lands on Earth in the Wadham, um, and the the Turney Gundam wakes up and she sees that there's a mobile suit there, and she just kind of freaks out and ends up firing that first shot, which is like the smoking gun of the whole show. Is that it's supposed to be this peaceful landing. She ends up firing the shot that like burns off the roof of a building and like rubble falls all over the place and just everything falls apart from there. Um, but it's just this one person who has no experience doing this shit freaking out because it's like, am I going to get shot? Because there's a mo there's not supposed to be mobile suits down here. We're supposed to be, it's, you know, it would be like if we took the, the U.S. military and went back 500 years and tr like tried to go settle Europe. We would be like, why is there a tank here? What the fuck's going on? They're not supposed to have tanks. We're supposed to fly in here with airplanes and tanks and take over these fucking barbarians. And that was all it was supposed to be. Um, and she just freaks out and fires that shot and the whole series rolls out from that point. Yeah. No, she's great um, in that specific role she is given. And I also... But the thing that sticks in my mind most is the episode with her and Harry. Um, <sighs> where Harry Ord just completely owns her it's yeah. the pursuit crybaby poe episode which is like episode 28 or something. yeah that's the one where 31. she's like sick yes. um and because because another dynamic here like think about class stuff is that you know there's both socioeconomic class and then royal rolled up into that is also like military ranking stuff yes and you see that a lot in poe's relationship with phil because phil is her commanding officer um and i feel like and there's this like weird sort of inappropriate romantic relationship between the two that it seems to me that Phil is using that specifically as a way to get Poe to do things that are not reasonable to have her do like go out try to take care of this shit even while you're sick um, yes. you're no no condition to do this but if you do this I'll make you queen of the Sun Belt Republic like we, we've staged a coup we are building our own country on earth and if you want to be queen and sit there beside me you have to go do this which is um you know like abusive boyfriend tactic number one basically yes blown up to like making country Maybe not that point, but like, if you love me, you will do this, is basically what he says. And the way Harry comes in in that episode, Harry being, we'll talk about him soon, one of just the best characters on the show. Yeah. And like, gives her the medicine. He does the Princess Mononoke thing of, of chewing it up and then feeding it to her with a kiss. Yeah, like a baby bird. Yeah, like yeah. a baby bird. But also like, getting her, like, weirdly like, showing her a leadership that doesn't look like Phil. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really dynamic, interesting episode. But yeah. Um, yeah, and I just, I have also just very, like, sympathize and empathize with Poe's reactions of, like, how come nothing ever goes my way? There's this very relatable, like, all we were supposed to, we were supposed to land on Earth, show off our big, cool mobile suits to these stupid Earth people, um, and they were supposed to all move aside and we would build, you know, our glorious, like, Garden of Eden, Eden on Earth, and, and I was supposed to be, like, you know, this noble soldier on the front lines delivering this like truth unto the barbarians basically and it never goes the way that she expects because of course it doesn't but she's and that's where like her like cry baby she's just like you know whenever she has like a strong emotional reaction tears come out of her like start streaming down her face it's just this like what the fuck like the turn it gun like this stupid mustache mobile suit is here again and i can't do anything to it it's just some stupid earth person piloting this thing and i'm in this state-of-the-art moon uh, moon race mobile suit that is designed specifically to go to earth and take it over and i can't do it every single time she loses to the gundam and it, and it's why i'm really glad that they never killed off poe who i think was another character that was going to die at some point because it in a weird way it makes her like more of a tragic feeling character the fact that she never dies but she like can't succeed because that's yeah. the person she is exactly um should we talk about the other people lauren comes to earth with Keith um, and yeah, Fran. yeah, Keith and Frandall. Um, yes. Frandall, known to this podcast because she is voiced by, I think her name is Kumiko Watanabe, the voice of Katejina-san from Victory Gundam. 
That yep. makes sense. Yep. Yep. It's so a very play. different role. Yes. Um, if you want to hear her play a character that is a lot more like Katejan Hassan than Frandall, uh, Brain, she plays one of the main villains in Brain Powered, and it's very good. Nice. Um, but, but yes. But I like Fran. I like that she goes to Earth and becomes a journalist and a photographer. Yeah. And she's using that cool old school. We're going to talk about this when we think we talk about the, the world building of this show. Uh -huh. But all the mix of like pre industrial technology with future sci fi stuff is so cool. And I got such a kick, especially when they go back to the moon, of her using that old time like long exposure camera yeah. on like the moon and in space and out in like the vacuum of space, which I'm not 100% sure the chemicals would like hold up in that state. Yeah, I'm pretty but, sure the camera would break. But yeah, you know, yeah, she still. probably used some moon race something to make it a better camera. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I love Frandall. Um, I love like there's that whole kind of middle arc because there's that great scene where um, it's after like stuff has just gone to shit. I think it's after uh, Phil has done his whole coup. Um, it's at the beginning of an episode where she's in some like random Earth town and just this kind of like random band of. Uh, Deanna counter people in wads attack the town and just kind of like loot it uh, because it has just become totally lawless. The peace fire has basically broken down at that point. And so, you know, you're just going to have random groups of hungry soldiers ride into town and steal everything. Um, and she's there like taking pictures and and then someone bumps into her and, and they're like, what the fuck are you doing? She's like, I'm sorry, I'm trying to take pictures. I'm going to document this war for the newspapers. And he just says, don't you know the newspapers are never going to print this? Um, and she realizes that, oh, you know, like the Lu Luciana mil like militia, like government propaganda machine is not going to show these images. They're going to want to show like that we are, the, you know, the strong earth people that are standing up against the moon race and not that they're, you know, can't do anything to protect the random towns along their border. Um, and it is that very one of those great like handful of lines that just completely build for you the entire political situation of what is happening here yes. and that her whole job as a journalist she's still getting paid for selling these pictures but they're never going to print them um so she decides she wants to go like eventually she says she's going to make like a book that records the the story of this war but that is one of those just like settles everything in this one like three minute scene and this one like kind of like dialogue exchange between fran and this random character that tells you everything about the state of where the world is at this point what is going on with the world with the war and, and some of those things of like, you know, I think one of the things I love about Gundam is that Gundam as a series, I think, is just always skeptical of power. And that is another instance of the Luzian government. You never see much of it, but you know that they're not using their power to benefit the most amount of people, that they're going to suppress the pet press to make themselves look good. Exactly. I also think it's interesting, Fran and Fran shows up more than Keith in the series, but both of them are recurring, not main characters. Yes. Even though they are two of the first three characters we see, right? Mm -hmm. And and Keith also, and and it's because both of them create lives sort of for themselves on their own two legs more than Lauren does. Yeah. Um, so Fran has his job as a journalist. He eventually gets in the relationship with Joseph, one of the other militia guys. Yeah. Has a baby. We see at the end of the show. Keith um, starts working at this bakery, um, the Donkey Bakery. Yes. He eventually buys it. He he marries the the owner's daughter or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you do have recurring stories about Keith making and selling bread, which I fucking everything about agriculture in the show I love. It's yes, so good. the recurring bread arc of yes. Keith and like who he's selling bread to and the consequences for that is very good. Yeah, I mean, there's they, the three of them are only together in a couple of episodes through the show, but there's yeah. one around the middle where they have this big debate about whether he should be selling bread to both sides of the army that is fascinating and great yeah but i love all of that and i think it's a really interesting statement about those where those two characters kind of end up on the class rungs versus lauren they are also both white um yeah it's it's a really interesting arc with those three where they they start on earth together and then they split and how the show leverages the three of them over the course of the show i really love yeah with keith um i just have to shout out he's voiced by fukuyama jun who is um this was one of his first roles ever and i think when i first watched the show i had not seen much else with him um he voices the main character in working which was one of my top 100 shows of the 2010s um that it's a really really funny workplace comedy and he's great in it and yeah so i don't i didn't realize that he was in the show and so when i rewatched it and keith starts talking like wait that's the guy that's fukuyama jr that's the guy from working at like these 15 other shows this is one of the first things he ever worked on 
and it is so hilarious how like young and inexperienced he sounds like in a good way like again in a way that feels raw and it fits this whole overall voice acting style but that was one where you it's not like Romy Park where it's hard to tell it's the same person it is 100% clear that it is that dude and this is like the second thing he ever did as an actor um and I just found that it's a fun to ever like see that kind of stuff um but yeah Keith's whole arc um what thing I like about it is he is basically uh, it, he is living the Amerian dream, right? Yes. So, so you've, we're clearly in Tornet Gundam. Most of the action takes place somewhere in what used to be the United States of America. Um, maybe, I think the fake France, uh, Louisiana, or whatever it's called, I think this may be supposed to be Canada because uh, it's got all that kind of like French naming convention to it um, in like the French fashion. But, you know, Gwyn is this classic American style entrepreneur. And then Keith is this like, I'm, you know, an immigrant that came from nothing i mean you know he's a fishing boy from the moon who came to the earth um and started out as like a just a simple baker working for this bakery and all this bullshit happens and the guy who runs the bakery ends up getting injured and so keith is the only one left to kind of keep it running and then he slowly sort of pulls himself up by his own bootstraps and sells bread like i don't care who it is i'll sell bread to everybody um and uh like that's such a great arc but then also early on there's that moment where he sells the flat that he and Fran and Lauren came down to the moon or came down from the moon on to the militia in order to get some extra money. And the next episode is the one where Coronander comes and destroys the whole town of Knox. Um, and that's where Gwyn gets knocked over by a dude and gets told like, what the fuck are you doing? Like this country has fallen. Your, like your dollar means nothing anymore. And then the camera pans over to Keith, who's also there. And Keith overhears that. And he like has all the money that he just got from selling that flat. And he's like, what do you mean that this is just paper? What do you mean it's not worth anything? Um, and that's a great, again, moment that just in that one scene totally defines for you. Right. This is like what war is. This is what economy is. This is what money is. Um, and Keith was like naive in thinking that he can profit off of the war in this very sort of like simple kind of cheap way um, rather than what he kind of comes to learn is that he has to really like build this infrastructure. He becomes a strong enough kind of political force with the money that he has to create a small neutral area where he sells bread to both sides. And I love that kind of every time you check in on Keith, the amount he's grown each time, both in terms of like the strength of his business, but also like his politics and his policies in dealing with this war and trying to remain neutral. Uh, it's very good. Yes. So there are a million characters we could do this with. Yes. Are there some other heavy hitters we should hit before we maybe dive into some other things? Um, Obviously, we need to get to Diana and Kehel. Yes. We have to do Gwyn. We have to do Lady Lily Borgiano. Anyone else? Um, no, because I think the other ones are like moon people that we'll get to when we get yes. to the, like the moon half. Should we stuff. quickly just say Corin Nander is the fucking best and I love him? Oh, Corin Nander's great. Yeah, yeah. He only appears in a couple episodes, but you just mentioned him. So I wanted to say Corin Nander is one when he first appears... And it's the, it's the episode, Corrin called it Gundam. Yes. And he comes down, and he's destroying shit, and he is weird and wacky and off the walls, and very, like, out of tonal keeping with the rest of the show so uh -huh. far, as are his his buddies... Um, oh, Bruno are, and Yakop. Who I love. Yes, They're Yakop so um, being voiced by Hidenari Ugaki, who played the Russian dude in G Gundam. But, of course, to me, he is always Majima Goto, so I, which is another thing I did not know... The first time, because I had not played the Yakuza games, so rewatching it, it's like, fucking Majima's just with them for, like, two-thirds of the show. This is the best shit in the world. <laughs> anyway, but yes, um, so Corin and his two very cool henchmen who become great figures on the show. I yeah. love Jakob and Bruno. They're great. Um, they're some of the best comic relief characters in Gundam, because you can also take them seriously as, like, doing the work. Yes. You know? Yeah, they, they're they, just good old working class boys. They yeah. feel like characters from Z uh, Double Zeta. I really <laughs> like them. But anyway. I want I want a show that is just Bruno, Yakup, and Asanaji hanging out. Um, and just, like, shooting the shit <laughs> while everybody else is dying and fighting their wars. And they're just like, man, we're just in the ship doing the work day to day. Um, like you know, sleeves rolled up, covered in grease. Like they're they're just like doing doing the real work that caused, that allows us to win the war. Yep, they're great. But but Corin, man, I love the arc he goes on. You know, those first couple appearances, as I said, seems a little out of tonal keeping, yeah. but I found him very compelling. And and I think the turning point is the fight in the cave over the lava, where Deanna comes out and like calls to him, mm -hmm. and you see 
what like fucked up is in his head, you know, yeah. and that he pro- seemed like a good dude deep down, as we find out later. But he is unhinged. And then we get this arc where he becomes a monk. One of my absolute favorite episodes is the one where they have to, it's called the Battle of Enlightenment, where they have to use the fake Tourne to yeah. fight him and let him destroy it. And then, of course, he gets to be the big death in the finale, and it's awesome. Yes, yeah. I think we'll probably readdress Corin when we get to some of the finale stuff, because I think he's very key to how that works out. But yeah, yeah. I think it is a very intentional arc for that character that I think he's supposed to be a little bit off-putting at first and be like, because he is a full-on comedic character. Like, he animates a little bit differently than most of the other characters in, like, a classic kind of, like, comedy way where he's, like, yeah. you know, when he's doing, like, push-ups and shit in the cockpit of his wad, he is shifting from one pose to the other without any in-between frames. Um, so he's just, like, popping between these different, like, poses and stuff. So he's, like, clearly supposed to be this, like, off-putting strange character that as you peel back the layers, you realize he is one of the central characters because he is from the dark history like he is it's like cube living relic basically which is yes. cool awesome idea all right um should we do uh, let's let's do gwyn reinford okay yeah gwyn sard reinford the if if this show has a contention to son it is gwyn he is the character that like i'm both fascinated by also fuck that dude <laughs> fucking gwyn. oh yeah and you and he you know from his first appearance <laughs> Oh yes, that he has the potential. You don't know if they're gonna go there with him, but they could. Yeah, I mean, he because he is um, briefly in episode one where Lauren is like, is before he gets swept away in the river, and, and or no, it's at, yeah, because he's, he's like getting chased by some wild animals or whatever, and Gwyn is up in a fucking blimp hunting animals from the blimp using a rifle, and it's like this motherfucker. It's a it's a real you know like rich Republican. Um, like getting their picture of them having like shot a rhino on, in Africa or whatever um, and they have like are standing over its body like is that kind of bullshit you see it's very much that kind of energy fuck Gwyn yes well but that's the thing is that he is a very natural politician yes more so than just about any character in the history of Gundam I feel like he is just born to be a politician he's the kind of guy you know he feels like he would have been in the fucking debate club in high school he's just that <laughs> kind of dude and I think some, I know the exact person you're talking about. As someone who is in the was in the big club yeah, with you in yeah, high school. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. and um, and some of that is admirable, especially in the early going, where like he has a good kind of handle on the situation, and and to be able to like do some good stuff, like sometimes protecting people, using the technology for good. But at the same time, there's always this sense of those ambitions are much bigger than what is actually necessary here. You know, like yeah. what is necessary here is someone negotiating in good faith. So that everyone will be okay. And sometimes it seems like maybe he's heading that way. But a lot of the time you just always know in the back of your head. His ambitions are bigger than that. He's not going to stop at that. He has this fascination with technology. And now there's this whole fucking moon race coming down. Offering him, you know, the potential to to uncover technology thousands of years ahead of his. What will he do? And he doesn't really break bad until near the end of the show. But it's always there. Yeah. Well, I think... I think the thing that Gwyn does, and he does this from, like, the first time you see him, because before, because, so, like, at some point that you don't see in those two years, probably in that two years between Lauren landing and then where the show really starts, Gwyn has been in contact through the radio with the Moon Race yes. to set up everything that's going to happen. Uh, and it's, like, Gwyn, it's, it's sort of vaguely referred to around the edges early on, but at some point, Gwyn basically just straight up tells somebody that like I think he tells Kiel that he is intentionally protracting the negotiations so that they can gain a more a stronger position yes. in the negotiations but the thing about Gwyn and the thing the thing that makes him as such a like a despicable feeling character is that he is the kind of person who likes to think of himself as and always acts as if he is operating everyone's best interests. It's like, I am a politician of the people and for the people. Like, I, you know, I build my factories and I employ good, hard working families and I look after them. And, and what I'm doing is for you. And like, like, you know, I'm using my privilege to help all of you. And that's what he says. And that's how he acts. And I, and I think he legitimately believes that about himself. And once in a while it lines up. Yeah. And once in a while, the things he does, does help people. But Really, everything he's doing is to benefit himself. Yes. He's trying to create a more advantageous position for himself because he knows that the world is changing and he wants to be in a position to take advantage of it once it does. 
Like he wants access to the technology, the power, and the people to once that happens, once like the, all the moon race stuff finishes, because I think he knows that the earth is never going to win this fight. The militia is never going to stop the moon people from living on earth. If the moon people want to live on earth. They've got giant fucking robots. They're going to end up living on earth. But if he can stall long enough, he can gain enough political capital to take advantage of that and exploit the situation. And he, and it's like a more palatable version of war profiteering is basically what he's doing. And he's playing both sides the whole time. And it is only once he gets to the end and he, and um, the end game kind of goes into effect and he meets Gim um, that he sees this sort of window for like, oh, like I can swoop in all at once and kind of take all the shit I want if I ride on the coattails of this dude with the turn X who's clearly going to win this war. If I back this guy, I'm finally, I, he finally finds the right horse to bet on, right? That's what it feels like yes. he gets at the end. And he's just been waiting for that the whole time and building up capital until that moment came. And fucking Gwyn, man, fuck that dude. Yeah, because he, he has several off ramps in terms of negotiations where he probably yeah. could solve this thing. But part of that is he's kind of presented as a dark mirror image of Deanna. Yes. Where they are both leaders of their people. They both present very well to the public. They both feel very, like, honorable upper class, you know, to the outside. And they both have a lot of buy-in from the people around them, I think, and a lot of natural yeah. trust. And they, they exude sort of an air of trust to the people around them. But Deanna genuinely is trying to figure out what the best thing to do is as a leader. Yeah. And he is trying to figure out the best thing to do for him and his leadership, which is a different thing, right? Yeah, that, and I think he just is the kind of person who fully believes that if he's in charge, whatever he's doing is just going to be in the best interest of everybody else because, right. you know, he was, you know, you don't know anything about Gwyn's, like, history, but his daddy was a rich boy, right? Oh, yeah. Like, that's, like, that's, that's the kind of, like, he came from a rich family. He has this sense of sort of privilege about him. Um, and wealth about him but that doesn't feel like it was like rightfully earned it doesn't feel like he understands the value of money that's part of that the scene where th as Knox is falling around him he, he's afraid of dying and he just runs it up to a guy and is like I will buy that horse I will give you five million like but he's like he like empties his wallet I will give you unbelievable amounts of money to give you that horse and the, and the guy on the horse is just like fuck you dude no, like this is my horse and I'm riding the fuck out of this town because this country is not going to be a thing anymore. And, and that's the only thing that gives that money any value. And Gwyn doesn't really understand that because money is just money to him. And he doesn't, he feels very much like one of the Earth Federation people from the original Gundam because yeah. he is a fucking cockroach. He yes. survives the destruction of Nox, even though that's like, that's his little home kingdom. Like he is, he is the son of her. We actually do learn a little bit like his father. He's, oh, that's true. Yes. He's landed gentry, basically. Yes. Yeah. I forgot that we do get a little bit of he's that. A, he's a literal noble there, yeah. right? You know, he is a rung even above Kihel, who is his secretary. Yes. Um, but he is a rung above that. And, and he survives through that to again attain a position of power in the military, even though after that it's the, um, it's not the Inglesa military. That, it's, that, yeah, it's the Luciana. Luciana, military. yeah, militia that kind of winds up taking over, but he takes that over too. And then at the end of the show, he's still alive, which I think feels right because you're not going to kill this guy. He's, yeah. he's, this show's like Saul Goodman. He's the guy who's going to survive because he's a fucking cockroach. Exactly, yeah. And then, and he will live another day to find a way to like exploit people again. Yes. Um, and another, like, way that he does this um, is his attitude towards Lauren and his insistency that he's always calling him Laura. And, and it is this, like, way of him trying to just control Lauren. And, like, mm -hmm. he, he, you know, so, like, at the end of the series, you basically find out that he's gay. That, that his, he has these romantic feelings towards Lauren. And that becomes apparent, like, more clearly in that lead up to him desperately trying to get Lauren on his side. Um, yes. Before he knows that it's like, there's going to be a harsh break here. And if Lauren's not on my side before we do this, maybe he never will be. Um, but, you know, it's, I think it's really interesting the way that this show deals with his sexuality. Because he can't. I think, like, legitimately, the society he lives in, he can't do this. But he also can't see it in himself to be open about who he is and what he wants. And so it would not be appropriate for him to have affections for Lauren because Lauren's a man. But if he can put Lauren in this role that that is appropriate, and that's Laura Rolla, the pilot of the Gundam, hero of the militia, that's someone that he can be romantically involved with. And if only a handful of people know the truth, he can deal with that, right? And so he's constantly just 
trying to put Lauren in this role that Lauren doesn't want to be in. And Gwyn just assumes that Lauren's eventually going to accede to his desires. Like, eventually, Lauren's going to understand what it is that Gwyn wants, and, and Lauren's going to accept it and like it. And, and Gwyn just continues with that assumption the whole show until at the very end, I think it becomes apparent to him. It's like, oh, Lauren, Lauren is not a person that anybody can change his mind. Like, Lauren has a firm belief in what is right, what is wrong, and, and what he should be doing. And I think Lauren kind of always understands that Gwen's not a good dude, but can maybe do some good stuff. Um, and I just find that whole relationship and that dynamic fascinating. And so his his sort of beard in the first half of the show is Lily Borjano, who is his fiance. Yes. And I say beard because, I mean, obviously, it's, and she knows that. We find out. In uh -huh. Because, so their last interaction, I forget if it's in the finale or the penalty. It's in the finale. Okay, yeah. it's in the finale. Where she calls him on his shit in one of the best exchanges in all of Gundam. Where she says, she basically calls him on the Laura thing and says, you know, you need him to create this. She says, why are you making him cross-dress? Why don't you cross-dress for Laura? Yeah, so I actually, I have the scene pulled oh, good. up here okay. to get the, the uh, subtitles. Because it is the best dialogue maybe in any Tomino show ever. It is so good. It's so good that Romy Park in the episode commentaries on the, the episode, commentary for this episode and for a totally unrelated episode brought up this exact dialogue exchange because she was like, because she was, they were talking about like, Tomino's really interesting turns of phrases he uses and this yes. is her like example she brings up twice I love so yeah so uh yeah so this is in the last episode Lily is calling uh Gwen out on his bullshit and says if you really love him so much why don't you put on a skirt instead so basically instead of you trying to impose this on Lauren and try to pose like force Lauren into this like sort of feminine role in a relationship if you want to be with Lauren that bad why don't you put yourself in that position and subjugate yourself to him instead of trying to force him to subjugate to you um, and then Gwen comes back with this line, it'll take time before someone wearing a skirt is likely to be accepted as the leader of an industrial revolution. Um, and this, uh, let's get to the next line where she basically says, uh, she, she tries to get away and she's like, what the fuck are you? Or he's like, what are you doing, Lily? Why are you coming with us? And she waves him as he's flying away on a blimp. Farewell, I'll be taking control of Maria while I'm still wearing my skirt. Yes. And, and, and that is their last exchange together. And that sense of, like, that is where it's okay for me that Gwen doesn't die in this TV show because this is harsher than him yes. getting shot in the head by Gin Gingham. Is is Gwen getting called so hard on his misogynist, self-serving fucking bullshit that he's standing next to this woman who has been doing the real work the whole time? Yes. Lily has always been because. At this point, after after Knox falls, Gwyn doesn't have a lot of like official political power anymore. He only has power through his association with Lily and his relationship with Captain Mihal and other people on in the. Because we say Lily is the is the daughter of Duke Borjano. So. Yeah, so so she is like you know almost crown princess or whatever for this whole country, um, and he and she's been doing the real shit the whole time. And right at this last moment, she's calling him on his bullshit, and he says this thing about like, well, it's not. It's going to be like, you know, when when leaders of Industrial Revolution believe in someone wearing a skirt, that's when, you know, pigs fly is basically what he's saying. And right next to this woman wearing, you know, because Lily always is wearing the best clothes because that is the kind of person she is. And so when she leaves, it's like, oh, bye, bye, Gwen. I'll just be here taking over the world all while wearing my beautiful skirt. Fuck you. And then, and Lily completely cut ties and it is the best thing in the world. Lily Borgiano's arc in this show, from interesting background player to one of my favorite characters in, in this show, and maybe one of my just favorite Tomino creations, is awe-inspiring. Yeah. Because there's this key episode in the middle, it's the laundry episode we'll talk about, where Lily um, is like, she doesn't know Deanna is Kihel, and she's jealous of Kihel, and so she is giving Deanna all this like menial shit to yeah. do, and... And I, I would I would change that phrasing. I don't think she's jealous. I think she's afraid that like Kiel being there threatens her ability to use sure. a, have a political marriage with Gwyn. Because yes, that's yes. clearly her objective, right? right? She yeah. is jealousy is the wrong word. Yeah. yeah. She she I don't maybe she has romantic feelings for Gwyn. I don't think that even matters to her. It's no. entirely about like, well, if Gwyn is doing this stuff, then eventually like it would be an acceptable marriage for her and she would gain more power, a political power through that kind yes. of marriage. And she sees Kiel as a potential threat to that. Yeah. And basically, you know, so she she does this. It's it's a very ugly look on her to be doing yeah. this, right? And and giving her all this extra work to do at the hospital that that really makes Deanna kind of suffer. 
But then over the course of the show after that, we just see her coming into more and more of an understanding of her power, how to use it responsibly, um, what that means to her. Eventually she has to reckon with what she did to Deanna and Kihel, you know, slash however yeah. you want to say it. Um, and then until the end where like she is fully owning that she's going to be one of the leaders of this new world and her femininity is a part of that, not in spite of it. At, yeah. any, at any point, it's always like she is in very feminine, like, pre-industrial clothes. She's always using opera glasses to watch Gundam fights, which is fucking badass. Yeah. And um, and I love it. I think it's just a great character. Yeah, I love Lily to death. She just, like, left such a strong impression on me uh, the first time I watched the show. And it is this sense of... Because, you know, I don't think she's necessarily, like... I don't know if I'd call her a good person. I don't think she ever becomes not the person that would manipulate Kiel sure. slash Deanna in that way. Like, that's, she does all that fully intentionally, well-knowing. I think, you know, she's a little embarrassed when she realizes what, like, actually happened. And that she did that. She, 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 you know, in that episode, she says, you know, why don't you go do something more fitting of your station? Yes. Um, not knowing the irony that she's talking to someone that is quite a bit above Lily's station in life. Um, and I think she's a little bit embarrassed by that. But... I don't think she regrets doing that. Like, I don't think she regrets the actions she takes to secure the power she sees for herself. I think there's a certain humbling that happens, but... Maybe. But I think, for me, the thing I see in Lily that I like as a character, I think, is really entertaining and is a great counterpoint to Gwyn and why she's so likable compared to Gwyn, is that Lily completely knows she, who she is. She doesn't give a shit, right? Yeah. There's. I don't think Lily has any pretensions to the fact that she thinks that... She is a politician of the people that is that is helping out the working man and all of that. I don't think she really gives a fuck. I think she's like, I am Lily Borshano. I am the daughter of Duke Borshano. We are the richest family in this entire country. We have access to all this political power. And I'm someone who is, by my birthright, supposed to yeah. be politically powerful, right? And she is smart um, and effective at accumulating and um, sort of squaring her power off. And everything she does is, is to those like to her own political gains, but she doesn't she doesn't have any pretensions to anything else, which is fine. Like and it's and it's particularly in the society they live in, of course she would believe that about herself. It's I think it's like Gwyn's like faux American bullshit that he couches it all in that makes it feel so toxic and poisonous. Whereas with Lily, you know, maybe Lily could serve to be a little bit more of a broadly compassionate person would be nice, but. But I think she, as a leader, would end up doing things that would legitimately be more to the benefit of the people than Gwen, because she she understands that that will be to her own benefit as well. Yes. And she's then that's how she sees it. Um, versus Gwen, who who is just self serving in this kind of like self ignorant way, which is very gross. Yes. All right, let's talk about the big one, Kiel yeah. Diana, which I I would say Sean is the great character creation of this show. Would oh, you yes. agree? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, like, and, and it is that where I feel like this show is, depending on how you categorize Deanna and Kiel as one or two characters, this show has two protagonists. Yes. It's Lauren and it's Deanna slash Kiel. Like, primarily De Deanna, I think, is more the focus between the two, but those characters are, like, I mean, there are multiple times where they and other characters describe them as the same person at some point um, yes. by the second half of the show. And, and they are, as much as Lauren the heart of the show yes. and as important to the show in terms of what it is doing um and they're also are played by takashi both played by takashi vieko again one of her first roles she's not in a lot of other anime at the very least see she does a lot of like on-screen acting um based on her wikipedia her japanese wikipedia page um but it's a magnificent performance it is like an all-time great performance it is unfucking believable how good it is and how like subtle the distinction is because it's not it's not often that you have one voice actor play two major like main characters that are in most episodes of the show like you know a voice actor might play one main character and then characters that pop up a couple of times but this is there are many many episodes where they are the leading characters of those episodes and so she plays two of those kinds of characters also those characters look the same and then also there, there's not that much of a distinction between them Right there, there's not. They talk mostly the same way. Deanna, when she's being Queen Deanna, speaks a little bit more formally, but Kiel does the same thing. Like there's a specific form of sort of like Japanese conjugation and pronouns and stuff that she uses when she's being very royal. Um, but they are 
really, really similar characters. And so the distinctions between them, especially in these scenes where they are talking to each other, are so subtle. And yet it is a complete effect. Like it is something yes. that I never think about. In fact, I never really thought about it until I was listening to one of the episode commentaries where Romy Park talking to Takashi Yukiko commented on like it's so amazing that you were able to do this scene where you're talking to each other and like I can barely notice and when Romy Park said that it was like oh my god you're right that is her just talking to herself I it just it never crossed my mind because it's such a complete illusion I me. don't think I realized it was the same actress or I wasn't consciously I think exactly. if, you, if you asked me I probably would have said they probably are but I wasn't thinking about it until I think it's the episode where they switch and at the end of the episode, I noticed the credit below Lauren, so it's it's Roran and it's Romy Park, and then the one below that is Kiel, and then a slash and Deanna, and it takes up two lines, and it's yeah. one actor. I'm like, oh shit, it's just one voice. Exactly. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and again, it's not that like she's doing a totally different voice. Like if you if you listened to the two two voice clips in isolation, you would say it's the same person because she's not doing something different. It's just that I feel like the character creation between the two is so thoroughly complete. Yes. Um, and that there's just very incredibly subtle changes in like voice tone um, that totally sells it. And then like the slight difference of like the skin tone between the characters on screen yeah. also is I think a really good subtle visual cue of like Deanna is slightly more pale because she's from the moon. Kiel is slightly more tan because she's from Earth. But other than that, there's nothing distinguishable between the two characters. Exactly. Uh, and, and sometimes they wear their hair differently when they're in each other's, like... Yeah, so, so yeah, because there's Deanna's outfit and Kiel's outfit, which right. includes, like, Deanna has this cool, like, solid moon hair. I don't even know how she does it. I feel like she goes to the same hairdresser as, like, come on, Karin. That's what it feels like. I don't know how this hair even works. It's just crazy space person hair. They put her in, in cryo real early so that she could be there for all the leaders. Yeah, exactly. Um, no. It's, yeah. uh, yeah, so, but it's amazing how well it works. Because I had no idea this was going to be a part of the show. I mean, you don't meet Deanna until, I think, episode five. Yeah, it's five. And so in those first four, you get to, and Kiel is not a huge presence in those first four or five. Soshie, I think, is more apparent because she's with Lo, uh, Lauren. Lauren a lot. And, but Kiel is there and she seems important. But then, you know, Deanna comes down and you realize, oh, shit, they look alike. And then you get a few episodes later, and there's the episode where they very playfully switch places. Yes. And it's a Prince and the Popper kind of story. And I thought I watched that one episode, and when it was over, I assumed in between this episode and the next one, Sean, that they would have swapped back, and it was a one-episode thing. And I think I even made a tweet about, like, this is such a great episode about duality and doppelgangers and, like, an identity, and uh, there's so much I could spend an entire, you know, essay just talking about that one episode, blah, blah, blah. I, had, yeah, I remember this tweet, and I remember smirking at it. <laughs> no idea. But you know what I mean? Like, yes. you wouldn't... Because that one, it's played much more lightly, but then it's like, oh, wait, no. Deanna's just pretending to be Key Helen going around with Lauren and the militia all over the fucking country, and Keel and is Keel back is, yeah. with, with Harry, who we have Oh, we missed Harry. Oh, we'll, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll talk to we'll him with the other moon people, I think. Yeah, because yeah. um, Harry's my boy. But anyway, um, and then it keeps going and going and going, and it's it's a central piece of the show all the way through the very, very end. And and it is it, it starts as this kind of Prince and the Popper riff and becomes so much more than that. And it is one of the most fascinating things in all of Gundam. And it really is kind of the central idea of the show, yeah. is playing this, this thing with swapping these two characters. And it, it speaks to how tremendously well planned this show is as an anime too. That you know you don't even introduce both characters on screen until episode five. You don't introduce the swap thing until your episode ten. Yeah. But then that's a major thing. It's this is the kind of idea that normally you would see starting out in like episode one or two because it's so central. Yeah. But Tomino very smartly kind of plays the long slow burn game with it. Yeah, because it is that thing of... Because I was shocked when I rewatched it that it took as long as it did for that swap to happen. Yeah. Because in my memory, that's like the whole show. Like the yes. show is kind of just about these two characters swapping their positions and what that means. And then as the show goes on, I love how fucking complicated it gets with like... At some point, um, it's where, you know, they, they swap back when they're on Earth. This is like when Phil has his coup. And yes. now Deanna is with the moon people, just like pretending to be Kiel. And Kiel is with the Earth people pretending to be Deanna. 
and their like roles are completely flipped um, and like you know mirrored to each other. And at the end of like that episode where that happens, I wasn't sure which one was which or which one if or if they were trying to hide it. Yeah. And they make it very clear at the beginning of the next one. Like Tomino never wants you to be confused, but there are moments where it gets like a little confusing on purpose to to just like throw you into this and then untangle it but to yeah, show you how well they're playing it yeah and like a major plot factor in that whole kind of mill stretch of the show is like who knows who yeah. is who right like it seems like and i love that like you know one of the only characters that seems to firmly be able to tell the difference is harry um, yes because harry's very cool um and like Bloren himself like can't tell um and then in one of my favorite scenes of the whole show is the scene where Kiel finally reveals to Lauren, or Deanna as Kiel reveals to Lauren the truth that she's actually, that he's been with Deanna for like, at that point, probably like a week. It's been several episodes in the show. It's after the Will Game stuff. Um, and they're on that balcony together. And the scene starts with um, the camera like in a room with a, on a radio with a like old timey radio song playing. Um, a woman gets up and turns the volume up and a man off screen says, oh, come on, keep it down. Like, we're going to wake someone up. And she says, oh, come on, honey, it'll be fine. And the camera pans out onto the balcony um, first to Lauren and then keeps on panning, 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 panning. And then Deanna's on the other end of the balcony. Um, then they have that conversation. And it's just this beautiful scene where Lauren is so distraught by his inability to have realized that he was with this person that he admires so much the whole time. That he always like one of his goals in life was to meet. Yes, yeah. Right? That he yeah he met her once um, when he left the moon and the two years ago, and then his yeah that he's been working so hard. It's like I want to like meet and like his and he wants to serve her. He wants to be of service to her. Right, like that's like his goal in many ways. And he's been with this woman the whole time, uh, and and just that whole dynamic in the mixing of um, those roles and and the roles of who the people are and what their roles in society are and what that means and like the the clothes they wear both like literally and symbolically it is the, it gets so tangled in this way that kind of i think helps deliver this feeling of that those the the people that they play are characters right that that, that kiel and deanna in their real lives were playing fake versions of themselves just as much as they are when they're they're literally playing this the the their doppelganger, um, and it and it helps sort of melt away the facade that every character or most characters in the show are living under like layers of different facades, like a Gwyn um, in particular, um, and Deanna herself is living under those. Lauren I think is living under those. Um, the Earth itself is living under those and hiding the traumas underneath. Like everything about so much about the show is about disguises and masks and things that people are wearing and that they're performing and at the heart of that is this weird duality between Kiel and Deanna where these two different people get so mixed up in each other that the boundaries of their identities start to sort of like fall apart yeah it's like Ingmar Bergman's persona mm -hmm. played out with mobile suits over 50 episodes yes <laughs> like I don't know like that's one of the closest like analogs I could come to in film history because it's such a unique story device and it's also you know this 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 whole show has such a different perspective on war because it is ultimately about two factions who, other than a couple of players, largely don't want to kill each other yeah. because they want to keep, they both want the earth, so they don't want to destroy it, right? Like, yeah. there's no side, like in Victory Gundam, that wants to go set off nukes on earth. Yeah, they're not, yeah, they're not intentionally blowing up mobile suit reactors just to get that little extra radiation in the atmosphere. Yeah, like Phil wants to take the, the nukes at one point, but not to blow them up. He wants to threaten with them. He yes. does not want to set them off. Um, very clearly, that would be that would be very counterproductive to his yes. goal. Yeah, I want I, we want this rich, pure, beautiful Earth farmland, and then we're going to blow it all up and irradiate it. Yes, it's not it's, a great plan. Exactly. So, so you know, the ultimate goal is like is is to find some kind of way to live together, and having that be this this key struggle being these two characters taking each other's places. So an Earth woman is leading the space army and a space woman is helping advise and lead the Earth army and coming to a greater understanding of each other yeah. and taking actions that are against their own homeland and kind of understanding what that means and also coming to this point where the construction, because Deanna is a constructed image. Yeah. As we, we, we learn throughout the show, she is a symbol for the moon race. 
she is not an actual person. There's a person we know as Deanna, but there's the symbol of Deanna. And what they do is these two characters ultimately make a better, stronger Deanna symbol than they ever could alone. Yeah. And by the end, it's not even the woman birth name Deanna as Deanna on the moon. Yeah. What they've done is create the leader kind of people need, but to do that, they had to get in the shoes of each other and each other's people and each other's planets. I mean, it's not a different planet, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like space place. And um, it's fascinating. It's, it's, there's so much there and it is constantly, it, it adds just this extra level of invigoration to the storytelling of pretty much every episode once that starts. Yeah. Because you're always thinking about it. And it's drawing your attention to so many other aspects of identity and dualism and uh, what opposition actually means in these settings. And like, and what it means to do good in the world, right? Yeah. Um, because that's, if we're talking about like focusing in on who they are as individuals, like Deanna is, like feels like this truly benevolent person. Like this person that... Um, really legitimately wants to do what's best for people um but is m in many ways more of a figurehead on the moon than an actual like political entity right you have people like game king and agrippa maintainer there's like clearly also you, you get like those two major examples but there's this sense of that there are lots of these powerful moon families that exist that like you know have a vested interest in what's going on in moon politics and kiel is kind of like spearheading this we let's get back to earth let's settle back on earth um and all of that but it is her legitimate sense of needing to do good in the world and wanting to do what's best for people that i think one earns lauren's service at some point that like lauren especially after the whole encounter where he's playing being laura roller and sort of interrogates her um, and then they meet up again after the disguise melts away and Lauren, I think, fully comes to understand that maybe, like, even more than himself, Deanna is trying to do things to help people. And that's like, she's actively pursuing that, trying to end this conflict and do what is best she's for She's doing him. it on a macro level. He's doing it on a micro level. Yeah. And that she's trying to think of, like, how to settle this all um, peacefully and allow humanity to unite again because humanity has, is fractured between these two groups the people living on the moon and the people living on earth and, and, and she wants to reunite them partially for her own desire to live on the earth but also i think she understands that like living on the moon and when we get to the moon it's clear like that situation is not tenable like there is the moon society is fucked up in a bunch of ways that we'll get to because it's fascinating um but yeah her desire to do good is so powerful but when we first meet her it's clear that she doesn't know how to do that right she doesn't know how to reintegrate with the earth she doesn't know what it's like living on the earth she doesn't know like what the problems the earth already has and what their culture their politics their government is like um and so she totally royally fucks up the entire process of getting there and, and integrating the societies together um and has to make up for that sin and then the sins of the entire sort of like moon race government and and sort of body politic throughout thousands of years of history as she's constantly encountering different people um in her journey with lauren that have been hurt in some way by the the moon and what the people on the moon have done and her having to make up for it and and that's just like a middle stretch of about 10 episodes of, or so of where that is happening it's probably my favorite section of the whole show but it is so powerful seeing this woman legitimately wanting to try to do good and learning how to do it um and then we'll talk about the the laundry episode but that is like to me that is the key keystone of that whole arc is this oh you can the way to do good before you do big things that are good, you need to find out how you do small things that are good. It's like this small effort to help people can produce the kind of change you want. If I could make another Lord of the Rings reference, yes. it's like the hands of the king are the hands of a healer. Yes. And Aragorn, before he becomes king, the ultimate sign of that is all the stuff he does at the Houses of Healing mm -hmm. and in Gondor, just as kind of an anonymous healer who becomes and who is then asked to come in as king because he has proven himself on an individual level. Yeah. It is this you know very interesting philosophical theory of leadership that is acted out in this show really powerfully and i agree probably that is my favorite set of episodes too is the set of episodes on earth between when she takes over as key hell and then they kind of swap again yeah. not that there's any section of the show that i think is lacking i think it's as rock solid as a tv show gets but that's the one that probably fascinated me the most yeah because that's the one that's the most distinct from gundam yeah. like very little gundam stuff happens in that whole middle section because it is 
it, because for that section, Deanna is 100% the main character. And like from the beginning of the Will Game stuff um, through to her deciding that they yeah. need to go to the moon, she is absolutely, I think, takes over as the main character from Lauren. I mean, it really is. Like I made the, the joke about Lauren is kind of like Sam Gamgee, but if she's Frodo and he's Sam. And that's yes. kind of, and there's a there's kind of a, like in Lord of the Rings, there's kind of a dynamic who is the protagonist that goes back and forth a little. Um, and Lauren, I think, becomes more of it later in the show, just as Sam does in the book. Um, in, in the book The Lord of the Rings but there is a shared protagonist status to them there and I think there's something about you know Tomino has always I think written women so well in his work mm -hmm. especially compared to I think his contemporaries and compared to Gundam shows that he doesn't work on you know I think if you yes. look at them there's, there's very few non-Tomino Gundam shows I've seen that do women anywhere near as well as he does it. Yeah, we are finally, we, we've, after a long drought, we've gotten another show where women are allowed to pilot mobile suits again. Right, I mean, that's that's just one part of it, is yeah. that, yeah, his his shows, and some of the Tomino adjacent, like, One Year War stuff, like 8th MS team and whatnot, will do this as well, because it's established in the canon. But, like, the other AU Gundam shows just don't have women in mobile suits. Yep. And they generally relegate, sometimes they write women well, like, I think the women characters in G Gundam are really cool, but there's only a couple of them. It's a very yeah. male-centric show, and it's a very male perspective show, yeah. obviously. It's, it's shown in, in its blood, you yes. know? Um, but Tomino is, is interested in men and women and the lines between them, and he is not just interested in women as symbols, as I think a lot of anime is. See me on Genesis Evangelion for yeah. reference. Um, and I think Turnay has, you and I would probably agree, the best writing for women, because oh, yes. cause it's got the most women characters... It doesn't. I, Zeta has a lot, but it has the most, I would say, in central roles. Yeah, and and one thing that I like about Turn A is that, like, partially as a consequence of it having this, like, much sort of more, uh, you know, it's it's not a particularly bloodthirsty show. There's only a handful of major character deaths, and none of them are of the main cast. All of the main cast survive. I mean, like, even the main, ultimately, the main villain, Gim Gingenham, doesn't die really he gets encased in the who knows what happens to him yeah um but he's encased in the, in the cocoon with the rest of the rest of the weapons um but yes yeah, so so because of that it means that you don't get what i think was a problem with some of those other both tomino shows and non-tomino gundam shows where um there are a lot of female characters but and a lot of characters die but more of the female characters die than the male characters right there is a whole trope of the like started with lala of the psychic lady that dies in the male character like grows from that trauma which is like you know of of the kinds of tropes that this anime can have those i think were done fairly well um but it was certainly a trope that definitely eventually got very tiring and it's one of the reasons why i think it's so invigorating about turn a gundam is that it just doesn't deal in the tropes of gundam yeah. almost at all like there's it's like Lauren is not like a normal Gundam character. Um, we will talk about Harry Ord and how he is. If he is a Char, it is only because he wears sunglasses. Yeah, he's um, totally different. Like Deanna is the princess, quote unquote, of the show. She's a queen, but she's the Sela Relina, that character archetype, but done in a fucking totally different way. So it's like the the handful of Gundam tropes it, it uses, it evolves tremendously. Um, and and it just doesn't have the like psychic girl dying, the psychic ghost parade, like all that. Like none of that stuff happens in the show, and I love that. And I think one thing that's also interesting is that it has um, at least like I didn't do it I'm incredibly thorough because it would have taken a long time to do this, but a sort of cursory glance comparing this some of the behind the scenes people on this in other Gundam shows. And there are two women, uh, Mia Asakawa and Tetsuko Takahashi, who wrote. Um, collectively 17 episodes of the series which is way more than like almost no women wrote Gundam before this um, and so it's and that's like, just generally high for anime I yes guess. yeah and yeah. so that's a fourth basically of the show um, written by women obviously like Tomino was heavily involved in the scripting of all these episodes because he's a fucking maniac um, and so like the scripting credits are definitely a like all those are, like, co-written by Tomino, really. Well, but that's like any American show with a yes. showrunner. I mean, yeah, the, the series director role in Japan is they're able to call it a series director. In America, we can't credit it, but we do the same thing. We just call them showrunners. Yeah, but, like, Tomino's Gundam stuff typically is credited slightly differently because it feels like he works with way more people. So there's a lot more script writers in this than there yeah. were in, say, Gundam Wing. Um, yeah. Because really what Tomino is doing without taking a credit is he's the series com composer or like the series composition credit or the scenario credit that has like a bunch of different names. But, anyway, but like point being that there are two women at, at least like heavily involved in the writing of at least about a fourth of the whole show. 
Um, and then a lot of, I mean, not a lot, like a significant number of the animation staff are women, including, um, let me actually now like search for her name so I can get her full name, uh, Setsuko Takenochi, who was the key animator for 14 episodes, um, including some of like the best episodes, um, one of them being the Dark History episode. And I know that because that's the one that she did the commentary for um, with several other people. And so this does feel like, uh, here's another, like Taiko Watanabe also did, uh, was an animator on 14 episodes. So it feels like um, Yoko Kano, com the composer, also um, a woman. Like it just, if you look at the staff, it's still obviously majority male, um, but and and Tomino himself is a man. But there is a much greater number of women working on this show, and I feel like it. The show feels like that, yes. right? It feels like it is considerate to its female characters, um, even more so than any previous. Gundam show and and giving Deanna this role that is again co-protagonist in a way that no other Gundam show has up to this point has had a real co-protagonist structure like this um it kind of like suffuses itself through the whole show it's a weird comparison but it's actually quite a bit feels like a good version of Gundam Wing uh -huh. where where Gundam Wing is is kind of tries a similar thing with with Hero and Relina Urian it, it completely abandons that it completely abandons, like, I think a really considerate ex exploration of what Relina's leadership journey is. Um, it has a lot of m messy politics that are just bad writing, whereas Turne has some messy politics that are very good considered writing. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of that in there, I think. But yeah, I think, you know, Tomino's, I think we would say all of Tomino's Gundam has very well written women in it. But it is most of it from a very male perspective, which yeah. there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but there are things that crop up. Turnay is interesting because it's the first one that feels like it is it is from a male perspective, but it is also from a female perspective in places. Yeah. And and even as a whole, in a lot of it feels a lot more feminine in its outlook on the world than and I know that's getting into weird dicey territory of what is a feminine versus masculine outlook, but yeah. you kind of know it when you feel it of like this doesn't feel so narrowly from a man's eyes. Yeah. I agree. That and it just like the female characters feel more fully rounded in like front and center in Turn A Gundam than any other Gundam show. Like yeah. just basically full stop. I, I don't think it past this point. There's another Gundam show that feels like this, that sort of like privileges female perspectives and female characters to the extent that this does. Um, and like, and in a way, the part of that is, is as we talked with like Lauren himself, who, you know, has to present occasionally as female and is also very quickly off the top of my head that might be missing something but i'm pretty sure lauren is the only gundam protagonist voiced by a woman like typically they are teenage boys voiced by men this is a teenage boy voiced by a woman and and that's... Uso would have been voiced by a woman right? no no he wasn't Uso's um the guy from gintama yeah. oh right. so okay. definitely not um yeah so, that's the only one I could think of, but you're right. Yeah, yeah. Up to this point, certainly not. I'm, I'm trying to like very quickly go through yes. the other ones, it's like Gundam Seed, nope. Seed Destiny, nope. Uh, Double O, nope. Uh, the Reco and G, nope. Uh, the Build Fighters, nope. Wait, no, Build Fighters. Yes, I think both of the main characters, the Build Fighters, are voiced by women. But that's they're significantly true. younger than typical Gundam characters, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. And that's the Build Fighters. Like with G Gundam, eventually we'll hit a point in this podcast where I have to say we can't every time we talk about generalities in Gundam also then have to include Gundam Build Fighters is different in the way that we can't just always include G Gundam is different. Oh good. Build Fighters is different. Yes. Alright, so before we kind of move on to talk about other story and episode stuff, Sean, yeah. let's take kind of a step back. I want to talk about some of the aesthetics of the show. Okay. So like maybe some of the world building we have not dived into the mecha designs yet. Oh, yeah. We haven't talked about the theme songs. There's some things here to talk about. So I want to start with what an amazing world Tomino builds in this yeah. one. One of the key hooks as like just a piece of entertainment of Turn A to me is the idea of a Gundam set primarily in a pre-industrial society that is coming to uncover future sci-fi tech. I've, I've, there's certainly other works that do stuff kind of like this, but I've, it usually involves time travel, which this is not yeah, doing uh -huh. at all. And, and it's, there's, it, it does not have the attention to detail that a Yoshiyuki Tomino show has. And you combine those together, and good God, the, the, especially like the first half of the show, we are on Earth, and you have all the, the planes and the blimps 
and the cool old buildings and it feels like a Miyazaki movie at points because it's got that same kind of fascination with old-fashioned aircraft and militia style weapons and things like that and and then you build meld it together with I think some of the best mecha designs in the whole series in the whole franchise yeah it is such a gorgeous show to look at and watch this world unfold and of course all the ideas that come along with that like literally uncovering from the skin of the earth itself under the dirt the different mechs and stuff and the spaceship the, the Wilgem and things like that it is such an intensely cool series and I don't yeah. know what else to say other than that yeah no it is definitely it is like it's one of those where you're like oh right Gundam is just a rad sci-fi franchise right yes. in its way I haven't like thought about that since covering the original Mobile Suit Gundam because everything in it feels so new, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously all the stuff in Zeta and Double Zeta and Charles Counterattack and Victory, um, some of the stuff in Gundam Wing, a lot of the stuff in After War Gundam X, um, those are all cool, have cool sci-fi stuff also, but they're all pulling a lot of their cool sci-fi stuff just from what Mobile Suit Gundam did and expanding on it, whereas Turn A Gundam has such a fresh template to start from that all of it just feels incredibly new. And yeah, the just idea of here is we are not in um the distant past or, or several hundred years in the past and have time travel or aliens or whatever it is to get the like you know i think what you could broadly categorize turn a gundam as steampunk i don't think it really is steampunk but in the sense of steampunk is interested in like futuristic technology interest intersecting with the victorian period which is what turn a gundam is um, it just and I doesn't guess use the actual aesthetic of steampunk. It's just a similar concept. It's so much more interested in like agriculture and land and yes. food systems than, than I think steam. That's why I don't really consider it steampunk either. Yeah. It, I get why it broadly fits that, but it just doesn't phenomenologically feel like that. Yeah, I just like say this like there's a broad sort of similarity in the idea of what to approach. The main difference is the steampunk takes that idea and applies it to, and what if it was in London? And this like takes the idea and says like, but what if all that was in the countryside, basically? Um, and and I think a lot of the changes kind of come from that more naturalistic approach that Trinity Gundam wants. Um, but yeah, so it has that sort of feel. Um, but most of that, the works that deal with that idea have like go back to that actual period and go to late nineteenth century. It is very Victorian or um, Edwardian. It's more Edwardian, really. It's really like pre World War One, right at the cusp of World War One which is a very intentional thing for Turn A Gundam, World War One being like the first fully mechanized war that we humans have had so far. Um, and but instead of doing that and rolling the clock back, it rolls the clock way forward um, into what they call the correct century, which is a great phrase I love. I, I'm sure someone out there has created some sort of calendar that has like calculations for well if this is 2245 in the correct century that means it's 200,000 400 you know whatever it is in universal century time or after war time or um after colony time i think that was the uh the gundam wing one uh it, you know they all have their own weird timelines and turn a gundam's whole goal is let's wrap all those timelines into one massive timeline and have rolled the clock forward so much that everything has sort of reset and see like the cycle come all the way around again. And so all of the history of Gundam itself is buried in the earth. And the deeper you go into the series, the more Gundam happens, right? The yes. more like Gundam gets pulled out of the little earth itself and the moon as well, because you, they have mountain cycles on the moon. Um, and that feeling of this very sort of literalized metaphor of all the the trauma of Gundam has happened in Turn A Gundam. It is part of history and all that trauma is buried underneath the surface and as things escalate that trauma is is literally exposed and then and then escalates things further as it gets more and more exposed um, which is just like a beautiful metaphor like it's an incredible piece of storytelling. Um, well, one of the things I love is that the the first like half of the series every time lauren pilots the turn a gundam and he has another fight he uncovers like another kind of power 
that yeah. we all know is there in a Gundam, but he doesn't know. And in like the original Mobile Suit Gundam, Amuro would have discovered all that in like two or three episodes, yeah. right? But like, there's the episode where he first discovers the beam sabers are there. They're right there. They're in the animation. You just he didn't know. Yes. And and there's the one where he's fighting Corrin in that like underground lake of lava, and he discovers how to fly the Gundam. You yeah. know, because of the leg thrusters. Get, get they actually had like stuff in them, and it like blows out the dirt. Yeah. And then he uncovers the leg thrusters, and it's constantly doing that. Like there's the one where he just finds the uh, the guns on the top of the head. Um, what are those called? The, the Vulcans. Verniers. Yeah, or Verniers Vernier are the sorry, thrusters. Flight. Yeah, yeah Vulcans, sorry. Um, and and that is such a cool idea combined with uncovering all this stuff from the earth. I mean, it is it is so much about the way history leaves physical, you know, traces and lineage, but also non physical, non tangible ones, and it's it's both allegory and and not. Yeah, in that like history history comes back right that it's like yes. you can't you can't bury it or it won't stay buried forever that it has long lasting consequences um you know one of those consequences being when you get to the lost mountain section where the nukes are yes. and that whole land is infertile it's it's destroyed right that it's like clearly there were nukes went off there earlier and that's where the nukes are being stored and that land is just destroyed and even if it's been tens of thousands of years in the future like like what has happened in the past still has consequences um and and and, and our protagonists have to deal with those consequences right i should say the gundam wiki does have the chronology put together as well as they can from all the hints in the show mm -hmm. because lily borgiano does have a line where she's like looking at the stuff in the in the dark history and says that it looks like this universal century started ten thousand years ago so you can build it and say, if you use correct century as like year zero, 8,000 years pre-correct century is when the universal century began. You go through all of that. The dark history would have started in um, 5,000 years pre-CC. And then we are in 2345 CC right. is where this show starts. They, 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 Lauren lands on Earth in 2343. So there's about a 10,000 year plus span in all that. I don't know if I quite believe that that's a long enough time. Yeah, I think it's, I think like when, I think they we, could be wrong. Yeah, when they say, when we get to Reco and G, we will then readdress this and talk about how the timelines are bullshit. They will make no sense because Reco and G, in a vague way, maybe isn't part of the same timeline as Turn A Gundam. But if you try to think of it that way, it's very Zelda esque, or it's like it's like trying to put the Dragon Ball Z movies in the timeline of the TV show. You're like. Why were why am I even trying to think about this? This is impossible. Yeah. Well, it doesn't make sense. It will never make sense. There is no way to modify things to make it make sense and still have those things that happen in the show yeah. be credible. It's well, let's talk about that for a second it. because yeah. I think the idea that this turn A happens thousands and thousands and, I, and again, I think like the characters could just be wrong when they're guessing the sure, time yeah. scale, but like many thousands of years in the future from the universal century, I love that and I buy it 100% and uh -huh. I think it it being like a far future sequel to all the Universal Century stuff is very smart and savvy. And us as audience members being able to directly have a sense of what are the things that led to the history that we're talking about. Yeah. And I also think it makes complete sense if you, especially if you follow the non-Unicorn Gundam Tomino arc of the Universal Century through victory, yes. that Earth would eventually enter the Dark History period. Makes 100% sense. Oh, yeah. I don't really think I buy that the other shows could have happened. Sure. <laughs> Obviously, it's supposed to be more of a metaphor than, yes, like, literally, like... Yeah, I mean, because if for that to be the case, and I think this is where, like, the timeline thing doesn't make sense, is th that would mean that this is the, like, fifth time, or whatever it is, that the cycle has come, that it's turned all the way around, right? That yes. that A has turned all the way. Um, and humanity has gone to space, destroyed itself... Fallen back to Earth, let Earth reset, start. Yeah, this. then then G Gundam happens, and all this shit happens again, and then eventually Gundam Wing happens after the cycle starts again, and, and after yeah. Gundam X, and after Gundam X is the one that makes that feel most legitimate because like that is literally history having repeated itself, um, yeah. and the world being destroyed and then building up. Um, but yeah, it, and, and I think that's one of the cool things about Turn A Gundam as a Gundam series is that it uses all of the past Gundam shows and the, the ways that they are thematically similar to lend fundamental credence to this big scale argument that Turn A Gundam is making. And it basically feels like um, Turn A Gundam trying to do the kind of thing that Romance of the Three Kingdoms does as a 
the multiple thousands page historical novel dealing with over 100 years of actual Chinese history. But Trinity Gundam uses it like a cheat code, basically as a shortcut, because Romance of the Three Kingdoms makes this huge historical argument about the cycle of empires rising and falling by showing you the entire scope of an empire having fallen into decay, a new, and a new empire building up, and like, you know, you as the reader in 13th century China reading it when that novel was new would have known, okay, then this cycle happened multiple times. Us reading it, if you've read it like me, like now in the 2000s, you look at the history and see even more examples of that exact same cycle having occurred. Um, then Turn A Gundam, instead of needing to be a 500 episode TV series that does that whole thing, it uses the hundreds of episodes of other Gundam that has happened as a shortcut for the viewer, if you have seen those, to give you that same kind of effect and like lend what feels like real legitimacy to its like cyclical argument it's making. Absolutely. Here's kind of a, this is slightly off topic, but it was related to something you, you kind of just said. Do you think this is a Gundam show people could watch without having seen other Gundams? I think so. I think it would actually be a very interesting yeah. way to watch the show. Like I think there's there are enhancements to be had from yes. having that context. But I think that there would be something really cool about watching Turn A Gundam for the first time and getting to the dark history and seeing clips of like old anime in there and not and you being like the characters and not knowing what that is and seeing the fucking Gundam X firing the satellite cannon and being like, what the fuck is that thing? Um, I think that would be kind of rad to watch it that way. Yeah. I mean, certainly for a lot of the show, there is no essential necessity to that. No. Other than some added context of recognizing, like, I see he's got the bean sabers. He doesn't know how to use them. Yes. Right? It's like, boy, that, that Borjarnon sure is a Zaku, huh? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. But other than that... Although also, there is no Japanese person by 1999 that would not have known what a Zaku looks like. Well, so, 100%. Yeah, you yeah. would not have needed to have seen Gundam to have the Zaku context. And I think that's probably a good... Thing to, that, that's actually a good perspective to have here that in Japan nobody would have zero context yeah you would have had a basic understanding of what Gundam was yeah which I do think is I do think a basic understanding is is probably quote unquote necessary you do not have to have like seen all the shows no, no certainly no. not yeah um, in fact this this would actually be a great one if you've only seen the original and want another one to see this would be one to recommend I, I would still say you should go through the original cycle because they're all so good but you could totally jump from the original to this one and get a lot of what they're going for here. Yeah. But I think it's part of why this one stands on its own so well. And more so than something like After War, which we love, or, or Unicorn, which I love even more than, than After War. Because um, this one is in conversation in much more subtle ways, and it stands on its own much more clearly. Yeah. Although that reminds me of um, Forever Go on this podcast. Thinking about it, here's a little one-year anniversary kind of thing, um, is... I remember when it became apparent to me that it was going to be a thing that, that you had caught the bug and that we were going to be going. I'm like, eventually you're going to go to Turn A Gundam. But I didn't because, you know, like I'm not the one who decides what shows we're watching. Like the, I never said we're going to do this chronologically. That was eventually you, you decided that was the course you wanted to take and I'm happy to go with it. Um, but I remember coming up with ways like, how can I tell Jonathan that if because I knew that you knew that Turn A Gundam was really good, or at least I thought it was really good because I'd said it. But I'm like, but I don't, but don't, you shouldn't skip to Turn A Gundam because it has all the little references to the stuff in the middle. I'm like, how can I possibly tell Jonathan that we should probably watch at least like Gundam Wing or something right after we're Gundam X before we watch Turn A Gundam without letting him know that that's what Turn A Gundam is, that it does all that shit. Because um, I wouldn't want to just like spoil you without thinking about it. Um, and that, that's just a little insight into a thought process I had of like, and, and luckily I didn't have to worry about it because you just went down that path anyways and it never became a, oh, I remember the specific thing was we, I knew we had to watch G Gundam because, because the Shining Finger yeah. uses the Shining Finger. That's what it was. That's why I'm like, we can't, I can't have him watch this without... Um, watching G Gundam because he will not be able to have his mind blown by Gin Gin and Hum go, so that's what the Shining Finger is, and yes. be like, oh my god, this is the coolest thing ever. It's so cool. Um, yeah, I think it's because, you know, the initial plan was just to do all the unit. Well, the initial plan was just to do original Gundam. Then it yeah. became, let's just do all the Universal Century stuff. And then it was time to move beyond Universal Century. Going chronologically through the AU stuff made the most sense. So luckily it all worked out. Yeah, because again, I never told you to do the chronological thing. No. You just did it. I'm like, okay, great. I don't have to 
be like, I know we really should. I know that it's a very different thing, but I think you'd like it. We definitely probably should watch G Gun, and maybe we do it if you turn, turn it Gundam. I don't know. I don't know. There's no, no particular reason. Um, let's talk about some of the mechs, Sean. Yes. I think the mech. De- so my favorite beforehand, I've said this. My favorite overall mech designs, like the entire canon of mechs within the work, are original Gundam. Yeah. And F ninety one would be my two S tier ones. Yes. And then uh, there's a lot of others. Like I think Zeta and Double Zeta, phenomenal. Um, I think actually most of the 90s are pretty bad. Um, Gundam Wing probably has the best in the 90s, but it's still pretty derivative. Um, I think like yeah. Victory has a couple of interesting designs, but a lot of them are kind of ugly. Um, Turn A is my other S tier now. Oh, yes. I, I think, and I know that's controversial in the fandom. I've seen that, that some fans think the Turn yeah, A Gundam... It's... I, I don't know if I would say it's controversial. I would say, I mean, it's like, it's divisive. It's divisive, not okay. like, you know, it, that, like it being controversial would be like arguing that after we're going to mechs had the best mech designs because nobody right. thinks that. Yes. It's more that it's like there are people that are like hard pro turn A Gundam designs. And I, and I feel like most people are at this point are pro turn A Gundam. I think it's like at the time, understandably. It's like, very different. People were really surprised um by the the way that everything looked um because particularly the turn a gundam which is the most not gundam gundam until we get the g self from reko and g because tomio don't give a fuck <laughs> he's gonna make <laughs> his gundam not look like a gundam if he doesn't want it to look like a gundam um but yeah so but it is that incredibly unique very particular style that stands totally on its own which i think contrasts particularly well with a lot of the other 90s Gundam stuff where I think the main problem with a lot of it is just like feels like generic Gundam like yes. even Gundam Wing which has a lot of cool looking Gundams in it they're all just kind of Gundams um, and and I love me the Gundam Wing um, Zero Endless Waltz but that's because that's the one that's the least Gundam out of all of those because it has giant fucking an- angel wings on the back right Yes. Um, and then after Gundam X is the one that is also hit super hard by like the Leopard and the Air Master or whatever are just the most generic looking Gundam mobile suits. They look like they would be suits that would be blown up in five seconds and build fighters that some random person had, right? That's like not even a main character. Yeah. They're so generic looking. And then you get to turn a Gundam. Um, and, and I think a key thing is not only do they have a really unique design aesthetic with, within the world of Gundam and largely with the, outside the world of Gundam as well, they look very particular. Um, but they're also animated very differently than mobile suits are, and and particularly how they have come to be animated in the '90s, which is more and more just sort of like they're big humans. Uh, and by the time you get to Turn A Gundam, Turn A Gundam has for me the best mech animation I think of anything I've ever seen. You can find stuff that has like more frames and is like higher budget and all that kind of stuff. You know, obviously a lot of the Gundam OVAs and, and movies and stuff have technically better animation in some of those ways but in terms of the way that they've thought about this is the way this mobile suit exists in the world it affects the world around it this is how it moves and what it can do and that it looks like a person but it doesn't have to obey the physical laws that people do um turn a gundam is like the best shit for that like it is just the best um and the way that the action is directed um the way it's cut the sound design they use for the mobile suits all of that um, you know, most of the Turn A Gundam action scenes are very brief. They're like a couple of minutes long. They're will, very similar to original Gundam. Yes, but I will take any one of those almost over almost any other action scene in any Gundam show. Like they, yeah. like I think Turn A Gundam routinely has the most interesting mobile suit action of the whole franchise. I I pretty much agree. You know, I would still say F ninety one has the best animation overall. Um, cause the cause it's a movie. It's, yeah. a, it's a movie. movie right? it's, yeah. it's Kunio Okawara really going to town with like his kind of classic designs updated. You know, I love all of that shit. And, and F91 also has really good att- attention paid to like space combat yeah. and that kind of stuff. Uh, turn a, you know, all Gundam does really interesting stuff on earth. We talked about that a lot with the original show when they get to earth and how Amuro has to deal with fighting and gravity and all that. But turn a, like I mentioned this earlier, just with like how they interact with the physical earth itself, like leaving footprints in the dirt. Yeah. That's like, the kind of attention to detail that I think you're talking about. Yes, and, and knocking trees aside yes. and having to be careful not to step on things. Yes. Um, and, and just the feel of like weight and terror of these things. Because if you go in like the first four episodes, that kind of opening arc where Poe and the rest of the Anaconda lands on earth and they're in their wadams. And the Wadham fires a particle beam that goes over the buildings of Nox and like blows a bunch of them up. 
and then the turret Gundam wakes up and fires its beam rifle that explodes. And and again, it is like the animation, the editing, the direction, the sound design. The those particle beams feel so dangerous. Yes, they feel so much more dangerous than anything in almost any other Gundam show. Like every time a mobile suit moves, like something is destroyed by that sheer act of movement. And it, the way that like. Lauren fights um, early on without having any weapons or tools. So he's just like steps on a Wadham and just the sheer weight of the turning Gundam creates this huge just crevice. And it's just like wrapping, like crinkling up tinfoil basically. And this massive thing crumples underneath the weight of the turning Gundam. Uh, and, it's, and it's every fight has that. It's every single time the mobile suits go into action, there is so much thought paid into how do they move and what effect do they have on the world around them and I mean if you go back and listen to our original Mobile Suit Gundam podcast I talked a lot about that that my favorite thing with mechs and I think the thing that kind of really attracted me to the mecha genre as a whole after I got into Gundam is specifically this kind of mech that that has this kind of uncanny quality to it where it looks like a human but it is totally unhuman right that and Lots of mobile suits, or lots, sorry, lots of mecha stuff can go too far on either side of it for me, where it's either like, these are just like way too machine-like. Um, there's lots of mech video games like a Chrome Hounds or an Armored Core that are like that, where they're basically tanks with legs on them, and that doesn't interest me that much because it doesn't have any uncanny quality to it at all. It's just a cool-looking tank thingy. Yeah. Or you have something that it is where some of the 90s Gundam, I think, gets into this, where it is a technically a mech, but it... It's, it might as well just be a big dude in armor for like all I care with the way it moves. It's way too human. Yeah, G um, Gundam goes really hard on that. Yeah. And it makes sense for G Gundam, but I agree, then Gundam Wing and After War don't go far enough back in the other direction. Yeah, whereas with Turn A Gundam, it's really simple stuff like Lauren, like having the Turn A Gundam just walk forward while he has the fucking cockpit open because it's a hot day and he's sipping on his like yes. water bottle. And the Turn it Gundam's arms are like perfectly just at its side. Everything on, on the, its upper torso is completely still, and its legs are just moving forward in this like quick walk cycle that is just like vaguely like how humans move, but it doesn't have to be how humans move. It doesn't have to balance its weight the way a normal human would. And probably, you know, none of that is actually physically accurate. This is the, the giant robots can't exist. That's not how physics work. It wouldn't look like any of this wouldn't look like this. But it has this feeling of mechanical accuracy to it. That, that, the, that these legs are operating on like pistons. And they're just like really moving. And it's all automated by the, the ship's computer, the mobile suit's computer. And it's that shit of just, it, it, when he runs, he doesn't have to swing his arms like a person. He doesn't have to, like the hips don't have to bend like a person. None of that. It's just the legs are moving completely independent of everything else in the Gundam. And that's fucking cool. It's, it's, I don't know. There's no other way to say it. Other no, it it's is. really fucking cool. It is. And there's so many good fights and like moves within those fights because of that. Like My favorite probably thing that Turn A Gundam does is when it gets the giant fucking ball and chain. Oh my god. And, the, the, the bringing back the Gundam hammer from yes. that one episode of Mobile Suit Gundam. Is did Tomino realize the sin he created in, or committed in cutting that scene out from the movie version of Mobile Suit Gundam 1? And he's like, the Gundam hammer must see a day again. And so, yeah, Lauren goes, finds an armory. And I just, I love, here's the thing I love about him finding the fucking Gundam hammer in that armory is I love the idea that this is the, Turning Gundam is the most advanced mobile suit we've seen by far of any of these. Like, it's so advanced that Lauren can barely do anything of like what clearly the full capabilities of the and he machine. never does no yeah he this is not an amuro gets better than the gundam this is like lauren fulfills like two percent of the potential capacity of what this gundam can actually perform. this is a gundam with a fucking nano skin that can self-heal exactly it, it it is it can project its nano uh machines out in a curtain behind it and literally destroy the entire planet um i, I think in like the novel version they say that the tornado gundam can literally teleport um if it has like a new type pilot and all this shit um, it's, so it's like it's clearly supposed to be this crazy powerful mobile suit but I like that I feel like there is the people designing the weapons for it it's like this is the most powerful mobile suit ever but with all the nanoskin stuff I feel in, in the history repeating itself thing I feel like they knew well there's there will maybe will come a day where 
where we will have lost this war or something, and the Tornade Gundam will be encased in the Earth's soil. We've done all this nano skin stuff. But you know what? In 10,000 years, this delicate, like, anti-ship beam rifle thing, that is, that's going to fire one, two shots. It's going to blow up. It's fucking useless. Like, this, all this delicate weaponry we've made... And then, like, it's just not going to work. What should we do? And then one man in the back, Frank, raises his hand. It's like, you know what we can do? We can get a big fucking ball, put some fucking spikes on it, put it on a chain. And, and that, th that is good forever. I don't care one million years in the future, you get a big ball with spikes on it on a chain, you can fuck someone up with that thing. Do you know how we can make it even better? Just put some fucking rockets on it and make it spin real fast. It's the coolest thing ever. And so, yeah, when it's so good. And the sense of weight and momentum that this show is so good at portraying, yes. along with everything else you were just talking about, makes it, like, one of the coolest Gundam weapons. Yeah, it is, like, that episode, because because later the Kapool gets it, which I think you posted a, the gif, GIF of that, which is very good. I had to make a gif because it's the Kapool swinging it kind of wildly and un like not very disciplined and it's yeah. fucking great and it's clear that like the kapool is not designed to swing that weight around yes. so it's getting pushed around by the weight of the ball um but the episode where the turn a gundam uses it it's the most vicious feeling thing in the world and like if you look back at that cut that that scene like and just pay attention to the sound design of the chain and just the inhuman speed that lauren is able to swing that thing around which again just it's it, it is sort of just breaking rules of how things move with the sheer strength of the machinery of the Gundam. And it's just spinning the ball so fast that you can't even see it. And, and it just whips it around and then the thing spins and drills into um, Poe's Wadham. And that, the physical ferocity of these mobile suits and the sheer amount of damage they can do. And it's the, the way that they, they execute on it in those fight scenes with very simple like quick cuts and like short decisive actions that end fights very quickly most fights in turn a gundam are ended in like two or three moves between the two opponents right and in that sense of power um when he gets the fucking beam saber and the beam saber just feels like the most dangerous thing in the world i like, love how they use the beam sabers in this one because i also love like the way they animate it doesn't look like a lightsaber anymore it looks mm -hmm. like an actual like pulsating like light kind of coming out yes. of it Oh, it's so good. There's and the when one... it cuts through metal, it melts the metal around the edges and it curls out and then causes yes. it to like bubble up and explode. Um, and then when Lauren starts getting better, and again, it, the turning gun is not a human, its wrist is like a separate thing. So he just spins the wrist impossibly fast. Um, and that's where when he's fighting Gim Gingenham the first time, I think he spins it so fast and causes and like hits the sabers against each other to create this giant explosion of car particles that then Lord disappears in the middle of. Like, that shit is so fucking cool. Yes. And it is done with some of the best animation that any TV Gundam has ever had. And that combination of direction, of vision, of these are how these mobile suits mechanically move, how they impact the world around them. And then here's how we choreograph these fights to have this, like, old-school samurai movie sens sensibility of quick decisive actions it's not a lot of you've got a beam saber i've got a beam saber here we're just gonna flail at each other and clash a bunch like nothing has a beam saber other than the fucking turn gun it's just nope like one quick move and that's exploded one quick shot that's exploded like i dodged your hit i hit you with the, the ball right like it is just quick fierce feeling fights that has this very raw powerful feel to it which is the only gundam show um that i think has captured the feeling of some of the action from the original Mobile Suit Gundam, particularly the sequence in Cosmic Glow where Lala gets killed and all that happens. Like, the Turning Gun is the only other Gundam show to me that gets that same feeling of Mobile Suit action across. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's something special. Uh, the Turning Gundam itself as a design, yep. it might be my favorite Gundam. It's very good. It's very good. I, I, I know that's a high order. There's a lot of good Gundams. Yeah. But it is up there. I think the f it is such a cool blending of... Kunio Okawara's, you know, iconic original Gundam design, which is still absolutely there. It's different here, but it's there. With Sid Mead's kind of visual futurism, I just love it. And I love the amount of personality in the face because of that fucking mustache. Yeah. That mustache is the piece de resistance on this, on this Gundam. It is such an expressive machine. I love how it can... It, it gets something that I think original Gundam had as well, 
where the Gundam can look either friendly or scary depending on how it's being used. Yeah. And Lauren very clearly sees the friendly side of this mustached thing and mm -hmm. he kind of brings that out and so when it's walking around the countryside transporting cows and stuff, it looks like a very friendly benevolent machine with a lot of personality. But when it's, you know, doing the moonlight butterfly shit at the end, yeah. boy it looks terrifying. And I just think it's one of the best mech designs in the whole show, Gundam or not. Uh, in the whole franchise, and uh, there's so much cool stuff. I also love a lot of the mobile suits in the show do it. The way they do the cockpit, yes. where it's this ball sort of down near the crotch that comes out from this, like, and then it lowers down, and the pilot can just jump out. So fucking cool. It's yes. so different than anything else. Yeah, and it, and it solves the Gundam Wing problem of people just falling out of their cockpits and surviving, like, 30-foot drops, which Hero does, like, four or five times. Yes. Of course, of that series is like, what if we just had that thing kind of gently lower you down to the ground? Um, that also allows them to do something very different with the chest, which comes into play in the nuclear weapon episodes. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I, one thing I love about the whole design philosophy um, of all of the Sydney design suits, which is almost all of them, um, other than like legacy suits that that came over to the show, is they have a slightly more like organic feel to them because they're like rounded and they feel like they have all like muscular to, to them um, in a way with like the big rounded kind of chassis uh, particularly like the sumo has that but then also the Turnit Gundam has the like weird fibrous like cables on the back of the legs that also the, the, um, like allow it to fly that feel like they're like tendons or something and, and a little bit of that sort of organic design to it um, mixed with the very inhuman way that they operate I think again adds to that very uncanny effect um Combined with it having a mustache is the, yes. the most uncanny thing of all. Uh, do you want to talk about some of the other mobile suits? Yes. I mean, they're all great. I um, I do like the ones that they bring back. Like, I love that the Zaku is one of the key ones here as yeah. the uh, Borjarnan. And I don't feel like we're, we're being robbed of another design. Because the Zaku, it's amazing how well it just fits in. The Zaku is just such a good design. Yes. I think you could throw the Zaku in pretty much any Gundam show. Absolutely. Um, it, I also particularly like um, that for... The first few episodes, I think before it gets destroyed, um, Gavin Gooney is piloting a Zaku-1. Um, and I love the idea that the Zaku-1 is a way inferior machine, but they don't know that because they don't know anything about right. this. Because, so it's the one that looks different, so the captain of the team pilots the one that looks different, even though it's a worse mobile suit. I think it's a small little like visual gag that is very good. Yes. Um, you also get the, the other major returning mobile suit is the Kapool. Um, which is a good choice as a turning mobile suit because it's only very briefly in Double, Z, uh, Double Zeta. It is from the episode where they land on Earth and there's like the fishing boy who's piloting the, the Kapool and his yes. like, sister wants Judo to stop him. Um, so it's only really in there. And I think it's a good both, it feels very sort of comic because uh, it's like this big rotund mobile suit that's very awkward. Uh, and I love the realization at the midpoint of the show that the characters have that the reason why it's so awkward is that it's an aquatic mobile suit it's yes. not supposed to be on land and they're like worried at first it's like oh god will this thing be able to even like stand up to the water and they get it and then so she's like lauren i think this thing actually is supposed to be in the water it's like way better down here i love it and i actually could not have pinpointed for you where the kapool is from initially i thought it because I didn't do my, my homework here, I thought it might have been a play on some of the original uh, aquatic designs from the original Gundam, which the Kapool is in Z Double yes. Zeta. But um, I forgot that it was in that episode of Double Zeta, but it's so great. And I think giving it its day in the sun is wonderful. And I think tying it to Sochier's character feels so right. Because it is this like big, awkward, flailing thing, which is kind of how Sochier goes out into the world and yes. fights. Yeah. So it's great. Uh, I, I think the Wadom, which is the first oh mobile God, suit I yeah. think you see in the series. And it has arms, technically, but you don't see them a lot. Because it just like does this like fucking like Naruto run all over the place. Yes, yeah. And the arms are usually sort of like lying limply at its side. And it's yes. just two massive fucking legs, legs with a big laser dome thing yes. on top. It is so cool. It's so cool. And it really tells you right from the beginning this is a different set of designs. You yes, know? Yeah. And, yeah. And I just love, I love the idea that the moon people created a mobile suit specifically to help them colonize the Earth. And they're like, well, if we're going to the Earth, what do we need? Okay, we, it, it, there's big, big gravity. We need big legs. Yes. Um, it's, it's the exact opposite of the Zeong thing from original Mobile Suit Gundam, where the engineer is like, no, what the fuck do you need legs for? You're in space. Just go out and pilot it. And then here, like, no, you're on Earth. We don't just need legs. We need like 80% of the mobile suit. It has to just be these giant fucking legs. And it is very good. Yes. 
Absolutely. Um, let's see. Uh, the flat, the flat, yes. which we see from the inside first, and then later see it as like an overall mobile suit. Also, just a tremendously different one with all these like long, kind of thin panels. Yeah. I really love the flat. Yeah, flat's very good. Um, then you know the sumo is the other major uh, mobile suit because it's Harry's. Because that, and again, the sumo was originally going to be the design for the the Gundam before they're like, this is maybe which. Very understandably, a bit too far from. Yes. It's not would not even if you colored it Gundam colors, it would not be particularly identifiable as a Gundam. Um, but this is the one that feels like the sumo is just built to fuck people up. Like yep. it just looks ripped. It is a mobile suit that looks fucking ripped. It's just got these huge shoulders, big beefy arms. It's got this like, you know, wide chest with with the slightly smaller hips. So it has this like it just feels like it like benches a million pound uh, weights basically. <laughs> Um, it's just fucking this built ass mobile suit that also did not skip leg day. Um, it is, <laughs> it's red. Like it's just fucking cool, and it helps that it is piloted by uh, Harry Ord, who is the best pilot in the whole show. Yes, based it's certainly based on like fucking kill count. Uh, and yeah, the sumo because because I like because the sumo is just so compact. It's it's a, not a huge mobile suit. It's quite a bit smaller than the Tornado Gundam. It just you look at it and it's it's built like a gorilla. Like it's yes. it's compact and just gonna fuck you up. Yeah, I think they were right to not use it as the Gundam, but I think they found the perfect place for it because yeah. it, it totally is an essential part of the show's aesthetic. I love the sumo. I especially love it painted gold for Harry Ord. It's a good, it's a good suit. Yes. Um, let's see. The the Mahiru, um, which is part of the Gingham fleet. That, yes. one's, that one's very good. Got a giant fucking shield that it uses, and it's otherwise like very small, kind of. Yeah, and that's a cool one because that one's clearly designed for space because it yes. is just like very quick kind of almost like fighter mobile suit. I like the bandit, which mm -hmm. you get kind of in the yes. latter half of the series. Um, very cool. And of course, there's the Turn X, which we hadn't talked about yet, which is one of the wilder ones in the series because of how it like separates and comes back together and yeah. fucking glows in the chest. And is this like, it almost looks like like an insect in some parts. It's yeah. a really cool one. Yeah, the Turn X, it, 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 the Turn X also just communicates this feeling of power and it feels very sinister. Yeah, it feels um, alien in a lot of yes. ways. Yeah, it definitely feels like if like an alien built a mobile suit, you would make the Turn X. Yeah. Any others? Um, I think that's all the major ones. Because that's one of the things that's interesting about Turn X Gundam is it has the least amount of mobile suits a, a Gundam show has maybe ever had up to this yeah. point. Um, there's just not... A lot and a couple of the slots are, are returning classics um it was a rediscovering a lost classic in the capool because yes. i also the first time i watched turning gundam did not realize the capool was from um double zeta so then when i rewatched double zeta and i got to that episode i'm like yes finally i get to watch this episode understanding the actual gundam importance of what the capool is yes but it's a great set and i think it's it's very much a quantity quality over quantity kind yes. of thing and also, like, this show doesn't need as many mobile suits because no. this is also not an all-out war show the way all the other Tomino no. ones are. There are lots of episodes that have no mobile suit fights, yes. um, which is a rarity in Gundam. And yeah. there's no big space fleet battles or anything like that. Even on Earth, the battles are pretty small scale. Yeah, there's never more than, like, five or six mobile suits in a fight. And yeah. usually if it gets to that number, it's because Harry's going to kill four of them in two seconds. Yes. Oh, Harry. I love Harry. All right. Um... Let's talk about, I think, to, we're at three hours, Sean, so Jesus. we shouldn't go too much longer. That's unfortunate for you, because there's still a lot to talk about. I know there's a lot to talk about, but I think, I mean, what, what more, I think we should probably hit some specific episodes and plot points. Okay. But what well, did you... Because I feel like we, we just have not actually just probably done it. We just need to talk a little bit about Harry Ord. Okay, let's because, do it. Yeah, because we've kind of, like, skipped over him a little bit. We did. It's uh, too bad because Harry's fucking awesome. Yes, because he is nominally the char of the show, which again is entirely just because he has cool glasses. Um, yes. He's not particularly char-like. Um, other than in this one way, because here's something um, that was really interesting from one of the commentaries I heard, which was a piece of feedback um, that the voice actor for Harry, who also, this was one of his first big ones, Inata Tetsu, um, he got this piece of feedback from Tomino on how to play him which is that Harry is someone who sort of acts out as an adult. Um, he specifically uses the, the, the phrasing enji te miseru, which means to like play and show it. So it's like play like you play a character in a movie um, and miseru means to show someone something. So because it, it, it's not a normal turn of phrase you'd use in Japanese. And so the way that Tomino envisioned Harry Ord is that he's someone who is an adult, but like shows everybody that he's an adult, yeah. um, which I think is a really smart way of like, like thinking, obviously a smart way to think of the character is the dude who made the character. 
but it, it is a way that I think that's the actual similarity to Char because Char is the exact same way. Char does the exact same thing. Char wants everybody to know how like mature and sophisticated and how much of an adult he is, especially next to all these fucking children running around. Yes. But otherwise, he's not. Like, for one, he is fiercely loyal. Yes. Which Char is very much not. Um, he is, I think, capable of genuine love, although there is the scene where he kind of uh, where he kind of pledges his love to Kihel has a very like Char undercurrent to sure, it. Sure, yeah. Although I think he's more sincere in that moment. Than oh yeah, Char no, he, I think he legitimately loves Kiel, but he has his loyalties with Deanna. It had yeah. to come first, yeah. Yeah, uh, and he's all, and he's an ace pilot. All those things, but but yes, he's otherwise a very very different character. Um, but he's awesome. I love every time he shows up. He is very clearly the best pilot in the series. Like, there's no real question about yeah. that. He, he and Lauren only fight once, um, which is and it's like an episode like 13 or something. And he kicks Lauren's ass, mm -hmm. um, and and because he's the one, he makes like a massive dent in the turning Gundam's head that's there for like three more episodes. Yes, it's great. And and you get the sense Terry is one of those characters. If he wanted to end the war in a couple minutes, he probably could. But yeah, he is. But he's loyal to Deanna, and that's not what Deanna wants. And and I think he also has his own individual sense of morality that would sure. stop him from that. Yes. He is loyal to Deanna, not blindly, but because kind of the same way Lauren is. I think he believes in what she's saying. Yeah. And if Deanna suddenly said, I want you to commit genocide, he probably wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he, he also has, you know, the sumo has like those two beam pistols, uh, yes. which is a very good. Oh, look. they're so good. Um, and Harry Ord's best moments are when he gets mad because there's a couple of those moments where he just sort of like breaks there's the one where um i think you posted this one i on tweeted twitter. it out yeah. yeah where midgar and Meeden uh kidnap deanna and they take her away on the the king and Ham ship to go out into space the gendarm yes and and harry sees that and he's it like in his cockpit and it's just like close up on his face with like flames reflected in the frames of his glasses even though there's no fire there so i assume that's actually his eyes are just fire because you only see his eyes once when he's um wearing his civilian costume that is also very good yes. um but yeah he's just like midgard Miren, if you do this you know you will awaken a fury in me that will live for a thousand lifetimes even yes. if i'm reborn a million times i will still come and kill you which is then paid off in one of the best scenes in the whole show. Um, it's, it's, I think, at the end of the, episode, the Dark History episode where Lauren is pushing back the ship with the Moonlight Butterfly and Midgard realizes in that moment every, like, like, everything's gone wrong, that everything he's done has actually led to the cycle of the Dark History continuing when he's been trying to stop that from happening. And he's freaking out. And then Harry Ward flies up and sees him. And it's just like, I'm sorry, Midgard, but these are the moon's laws, and the moon's laws are sometimes cruel. And he just, sl like, fucking just, like, slams him and just swipes his hand across the fucking, like, side of the ship, ripping it all to pieces while the guy's standing in the doorway. And it is the fucking coolest thing ever. Because it's, you actually, the, the order of that is slightly different. He goes up to it, and he just, boom! right yeah. through it and then he oh, has then the thing about the and yeah. so he doesn't even hesitate he just yeah. goes right up to it and I don't think we've ever seen that where a mobile suit just hits a ship to kill someone yeah and it just like he just like smears him basically yes. it's fucking like killing a bug up. yeah it, exactly it's really good it's actually somewhat similar to if you've read the uh, mobile suit Gundam novelization how it describes Char killing um uh what's her name the uh, Zion Lady. Why am I forgetting her name? Cecilia. Cecilia Zabi. In the in the show, obviously he does the rocket launcher, and that's yeah, great. Yeah, cuts her head off. In the book, it, yeah. he has her on his hand, and he just yeah. tosses her, and she becomes like an insect on the pavement. Mm -hmm. That's very similar to that, I think. Yeah, it's just yeah. Harry. Or it also, I mean, one of the things to say about Harry is I love that he like his whole design aesthetic is basically like he. He looks like if you, you tweaked a couple of things, he could be like a Spider-Man villain. He's yes. got this very, like, I'm like Mothman look to him, which is very good. The and red glasses great. with the silver hair yeah. is a very, yeah. And then the kind of, like, uniform he's always in. It goes together very well. It's very good. But, yeah, Harry Ord, uh, great character. I just, I love him. He's, he's fucking cool. Yes. Oh, I love it. All right. So where do we want to go? Now, do you want to kind of go through and hit some like key episodes and, and major plot points? Um, yeah, so one thing I would want to talk about a little bit is episode two, the coming of age ceremony, and specifically that part of it, the coming of age ceremony. Because one thing I think is really a, sm a smooth bit of world building here is this kind of lampshading of the Gundams are coming of age story thing. 
by having Lauren um, lands on Earth and he witnesses that coming of age thing in the first episode when he's 15, which is when you're supposed to have your coming of age, which again is the normal age of Gundam pilot, it's the age that Amuro was at when he became a Gundam pilot. Um, and then, but because Lauren's not from there, he doesn't be able to get his ceremony when he's 15. So two years later, when Sochi is 15, she gets to have the ceremony. Lauren also gets to go along. So the night that all this happens is both the night of the coming of age ceremony of when Lauren and Sochi are, like Lauren's supposed to become a man, so she's supposed to become a woman. Um, and then also when Lauren's supposed to officially be really a citizen of Earth, that he's going to be a citizen of Knox uh, after this ceremony is completed and it gets interrupted, um, which is just good symbolism. But the other thing that I think is great symbolism is that the whole ceremony itself, unbeknownst to all these people involved, is symbolic of people becoming a Gundam pilot, yes. right? So because it is the white doll and it's like the marks on the back, which are marks that the pilot suit has um, and the seat has of the turn A Gundam. Which they realize when Lauren gets in it naked and suddenly he has those on him. Yes. And so this whole like culture's conception of coming of age literally comes from the tradition of being a Gundam pilot, which is a really cool way of having themes from the previous shows being baked into the history of this world that, that that the way that these people like ritually symbolize the idea of becoming an adult is by becoming the pilot of the Gundam um, which is just very cool yes Sochier's ritual is unfinished and is left unfinished for the whole show uh, although I think she comes of age anyway Yes, it depends on how you want to read that, but it's interesting. It's yes, I agree. It's a great scene. I love the the and they call it the white doll for most of the show. They uh -huh. they almost never call it Gundam. They call it white doll or they call it the mustached mobile suit. Yes, Hige no mobile suit or something. Yeah, yeah. oh no, Hige no yatsu like that that damn mustache. I love all the ways the translators have to figure out how the fuck do you translate the like weird Japanese ways that people refer to the mobile suit by referring to its mustache. Yes, it's great. Um, all right, where where to next? Um, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about episode 8, Laura's, yeah, Laura's Cow, Cow. Yeah. which, gun to my head, might be my favorite episode of this show. Um, there's lots of other ones that would be in contention, but for me, it's the one that feels like most sort of defining about all the things that makes it special. Because it's a very simple story where they are, the moon race has seized land and crops, uh, and there are all these tensions because they don't have enough for rations. Lauren and Sochier and some of the others, this is also a Keith and Fran episode, um, realize that the, there's a Moonrace family that also does not have enough yeah. because both sides are struggling here. And so they decide to help this Moonrace family just by going to this abandoned farm and getting some crops and livestock, including a cow. Um, Poe thinks they're up to no good and attacks. Harry intervenes in this one. Um, and that's the one where at the end, Lauren publicly announces that he's, I'm, I'm of the moon race, which is a great ending, but also like there's an image, it's going to be the key art for this episode of the show. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you're looking at it right now of the Gundam walking with the cow and a bunch of hay in its arms. And it's got the cow in one of its fucking missile mm -hmm. slots and bringing it. I, I just, I remember that being the moment where I really fell head over heels in love with this show. Um, and, and there are lots of episodes in the early going about agriculture like this, but yeah. this is probably my favorite one of them. Um, and it's, it's just so good. It's just there's nothing else that does a story like that. Yeah, it is like the visual juxtaposition um, that is so powerful. And Jonathan, I uh, purchased recently a, the Master Grade of the Turn of Gundam, which was the, the 100th Master Grade that they made. Um, and it came in yesterday. I've got, and I've only built a little bit of it. I've got some exciting news. Oh boy. They package in a cow, a little tiny cow figure. Um, it's a 1 100th scale cow that can actually fit into the missile pod. And that's how good that episode is. Yep. is they, they, they fucking put the fucking cow in there. And when I saw that um, on the back of the box, I'm like, the people who made this fucking get it. Um, I'm gonna have to get this uh, this master build at some point, Sean. Yeah. This is this is so good. Yes, uh, that's that's wonderful. It is a classic. Yes. Um, another great episode, episode ten. We, we talked about it a little bit the visit to a grave. Mm, yep. um, specifically, so that's the one where the Kiel Deanna switch happens. Specifically, I want to zoom in on that the last scene from that episode, which is um, Kiel and Deanna uh, with their places switched are at uh, the Heim home with Sochier. And Lauren and everyone and it's the first time that Kiel has been home since her dad died because she's been in Knox the entire time and Deanna in the guise of Kiel 
falls to her knees in front of the grave and says all the stuff about like I'm so sorry father like I'm sorry I couldn't be here I'm sorry it took me so long to get there um like weeping and Kiel as Deanna watches this happen um with like tears quietly streaming down her face and basically saying like you know these must be the words from your heart like thank you Deanna Sama um and it is this really powerful moment where it is a lot of that like weird duality of it feeling like it's hard to imagine Kiel having that kind of emotional display and her like being that sort of emotionally vulnerable in that moment, but Deanna is able to do that. Um, and then that's that scene is contrasted with a scene in episode 18, Kiel and Deanna, where um, Kiel as Deanna makes the proclamation, or it says she's going to make the proclamation that they're going to um, basically just establish their own kingdom, fuck the whole treaty and all that shit. Um, but then actually gives this speech saying, that's not what we're doing. I have rejected the, the, the like, Deanna Counter's proposal that this is what we're going to do. And instead, I formally ask for negotiations to reopen um, with the, the Earth countries. And, and while she's giving, Kiel as Deanna is giving that speech, Deanna as Kiel is watching her and thinking about, I couldn't have made the speech that was that good. Like, this is, this is, she's saying all the things that I would want to say but never can. Um, and it is that really fascinating duality between the two where by switching their roles, they are able to perform their respective roles better than the person actually could. Absolutely. Starting with episode 13, you get the little Will game arc. Yeah. Which is where there is this man that they find trying to dig a spaceship out of the mountain. And Deanna, as Kihel, initially thinks, oh my god, this is Will game who we see in a flashback was a possible lover possible fiance of hers yeah. in one of, and this is also where we learn I think for the first time that Deanna has been undergoing throughout history of uh, through many hundreds of years a cycle of being awake and then going into cryostasis and then coming back so she's been the queen for generations of moon races yeah yeah that she is like physically hundreds of years old even if she yes. hasn't like experienced that right and so Will Game is is someone she knew from a prior visit to earth this is Will Game's, like, grandson, I think, or something like that. Yeah, I think maybe great-grandson, because yeah. it, it would have been the last time she came to Earth, which is also when all the Red Team people, like uh, Cancer Kafka, yeah. were, um, their ancestors were left there. And then Agrippa, main like, the implication is that Agrippa Maintainer, who doesn't like what Deanna's trying to do, like, use some sort of political capital to bring Deanna back to Earth, preventing her from doing this and preventing her from having that relationship with Will Game. Yes. And so this is Will Game's um, descendant, and he is trying to uncover this ship that is like his great, and, and he wants to get to the moon to find Deanna, right? That's his. Yes, yeah, so then because it's the, he had, knows the legend that his ancestor was in love with the queen from the moon, Deanna yeah. Sorrel. And so Will Game goes through this whole thing of joining up with the moon race with Deanna Counter so that he can hopefully get back to the moon and he is ultimately killed in battle. Yes, he's piloting a like gun cannon, which is yeah. also a good mobile zoo callback. Yes. Uh, and in a very quietly brutal moment when he dies is, is when you see his like arms hanging out of the suit. Yeah. And Sochier says, we've got to go help him, Lauren. And Lauren says, Sochier, I don't think those arms belong to a human anymore. Mm -hmm. Because he's dead. Yeah. So, great stuff. Will yeah. Game is a really interesting character. There's an episode where she is at like his house going through and finding all these like artifacts. Like the carving on the tree and this old like photo um, slate sort of thing from an mm -hmm. old camera system and oh it's such a beautiful series of episodes because this is firmly where we're in the territory that you talked about earlier where Deanna is the protagonist so yes yeah she's absolutely the main character of those episodes like the arc is about her yeah and that's also where I think it's related to Will Game's death where Lauren like where like Sochier for the first time kind of really realizes the consequences of the whole war that's mm -hmm. going on that like people are dying and Lauren has this comment about like you know that people that like the people like are able to destroy these mobile suits and kill the people inside of them because they don't see that they're people yes um and that's why that this like these tragedies are happening so, yeah good and then of course the ship when they dig it up later on is named the will gem yes after will game mm -hmm. yes which i think is cool all right you have an episode 17 which has my favorite title of this series uh in terms of this episodes dust blows on the founding of a nation mm -hmm. that's just a really good one. that has one of my favorite action sequences which is where they try to um where bruno and Jakob, along with there's a character in here what's her name who's uh tetis -san? yeah tetis who, um, who's in a couple of episodes and she is trying to assassinate diana yeah and there's this 
action beat in that one that I also, I think, tweeted out where Lauren runs up to one of the mobile suits, grabs its arm, twists it around, and shoots one of the suits on the other side yeah. because he's trying to get to the people assassinating Deanna. This mobile suit is trying to attack him. He gets the one attacking him, breaks like its arm backwards, and shoots it at the other one. And, oh, it's so good. It's great action. Yes, that one's very good. Um, I, you already mentioned 18, which is great. Yes. Um, I also really love uh, episode 20. Anissa's power is the one Oh, I love where, this one. Yeah. Um, Bruno and Yakov are, like, been basically enslaved by this, like, very stern grandma into uh, working on this field when Lauren encounters them. And it's basically about um, them trying to get this woman um, off of this farm and get her safe and her and her donkey he later realized that is the donkey from the donkey bakery yes. that Keith works at. Um, and it's just one of those episodes that it is totally a standalone. It feels like the kind of episode that we haven't really gotten since Mobile Suit Gundam, um, which is, it's you know, it's like the the time bomb episode from Mobile Suit Gundam where all those young soldiers put the bombs on the Gundam. But it's like you could cut that episode out and... They do in the movie. Yeah, and yeah, and like you wouldn't really notice it. It has no effect on like the capital P plot of what's going on. But it feels so essential it's the show, it's the episode that I think most makes use of like the beautiful natural animation of the long blowing fields of wheat um, yes. that the farm sits on and it all being destroyed by the war. This very much feels like a sister episode to Laura's Cow and yeah. I think they're two of my favorite episodes absolutely yeah. and I love the farmer Anise she also looks like a Miyazaki character uh -huh. like literally she looks like um, the woman from Laputa Castle in the Sky who's the leader of the pirates. Uh, and she also looks a little bit like old Sophie in Howl's Moving Castle, but it's that kind of archetype. And, and then we see her in the finale when she comes back to the city for the Donkey Bankery yeah. 6 that Keith is opening. Because uh -huh. he is he is an intrepid uh, capitalist. Yes, he is. All right. Then episode 21 yep. is my favorite episode of the whole show, uh, Deanna's Desperate Fight. Um, this, is, this is the laundry episode, as we referred to it before. This is another one where... Like, Lauren isn't even in this episode that much. Um, it's basically at the beginning of the episode. Um, Lily tricks Deanna uh, into... Well, Lily sees it as tricking Deanna into doing menial labor for this sort of, like, field hospital that has popped up to uh, help medically help the, the injured militia soldiers in the area. Um, Deanna is really grateful to this because she realizes oh like how could i've not realized something so simple that there is something i can do to help that is like something real and tangible and physical that i can just go and help people and the episode is mostly just about deanna going and doing that work with occasional cuts away to other groups of characters like kiel and harry while like they move forward the capital p plot but it's basically about her just going and like changing like like dressings of soldiers and helping um a doctor amputate a leg that she then passes out because of how um like horrifying it is and then it has a great moment like a great awful moment where deanna after that she like sort of loses her consciousness she, lily sees her going with a bucket uh that's full of something and lily's like oh so they just have her um like going and cleaning laundry and then you see that she's dumping the bucket and it, the bucket's just full of blood. It is completely full of blood. Um, and she's not doing the laundry. She's just getting rid of the blood, presumably from that amputation that happened, uh, which is really fucked up. Uh, yep. It's, uh, yeah, I think this or Laura's cow would be my favorite. And I, this very much feels kind of like the coming home of yes. Ternay Gundam uh -huh. because of how it encapsulates so many of the different themes and, you know, the scene that we've mentioned many times of the Gundam doing laundry and Lauren using the Gundam in this very novel way as a, as a why he says, I'm going to make it a washing machine, basically. Yeah. And he does. And it's, it's genius. But it is so much about, like, the, the mobile seat being a tool that can be used for all these different purposes. And that this, this machine was never built for the function that he's thinking of. Yeah. But he's able to use it very well for that function. And that is part of, like, the hopefulness that is embedded throughout this whole show is a, a young man, a new generation, using what was left behind for better purposes. Yeah, you know? and, it, and that climax to me is just so powerful. It's beautiful with all the bubbles going yeah. everywhere. Because it's Lauren stumbles, because basically I love that like, near the beginning of the episode, Lauren goes off on some mission, and you never see what he does, and then he comes back, and when he comes back, he just sees Deanna cleaning clothes, bloody clothes by the river, and he's just like... What? Like, what are they having? The queen of the moon. He's the only person that knows who she really is. And, I, and it's just, it feels to me like it's the most heroic thing that Lauren does 
in the whole series is just this revelation he has that I can use the Tarnay Gundam to do this. And it's it, it's his version of Deanna's realization at the beginning of the episode that's like, you can just do this small thing um, that will really help. And this isn't going to end the war, um, but nothing that you do is going to end the war right now. And so instead, going and doing this small thing that's going to help the people in front of you is really powerful. And then, yes, it is that image of there is soap that was in the cart that is causing it all to bubble up. Um, and they neither of them knew that there was soap there. Uh, and they're like, oh my god, it's like a miracle that this soap was just there and it's going to like really help us do this. And Lauren says that this miracle is, you know, a reward for you, Deanna Sama, for like all the good things that you've been doing. And Deanna has this line that I think is really powerful where her response to that is, can something like that really happen to somebody like me? Which is that response that is the decide, like the finding line between Deanna and the other people of power that we see in the show. That Lily Borsharno or Gwynsard Reinford or Gim Gingenham or Griffin Maintainer or any of those people would never think of it that way. They would never think of it as I'm someone who's not deserving of these good things that happen to me because the consequences of actions I've made have hurt people. Um, they, they just don't have that sort of empathetic frame of mind. Whereas Deanna, that's the lens at which, through which she sees the world. And you get that her like, you know, joyous expression reflected in a million bubbles of soap. It's just amazing. Oh, it's a perfect, beautiful, one of the best sequences in all of Gundam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, this is a series of episodes that are all, 19 through 24, I think, all have character name something. It's yeah. Sochier's War, Anissa's Power, Deanna's Fight, Harry's Trouble, Tethys Last Words, and Laura's Distant Howl. And I like that that makes like a naming kind of scheme, shows this as like a little arc almost. Yeah. Um, uh, Tedith's last uh, words is a, is a good episode and where Tedith dies at the end there is this moment the way they illustrate that is where she is she and Laura are fighting on like the, the cockpit of the Gundam and yeah. he kind of flips her and she's upside down in the air and a bullet this is from Midgard I think fires yeah. this goes through her head and it's all done like in silhouette and it's the bullet going through her head and then she falls on the ground and it is this super stark image where she just has a black hole in her head yeah kind of shocked me because this is not generally that show but for that moment it just boom because this is kind of the lauren discovers death episode <laughs> yes um, yeah this is like you know he wasn't intending to kill her but yeah and like i mean he very much didn't kill her but, no he, but in the middle of that fight she died and and you know he was right there yeah, yeah and, and it is because ter because turn gun doesn't have many character deaths at all like regardless of the like yeah. the importance of character like which i think is important to emphasize that not only is lauren not going around killing people like turn it gundam very rarely ever needs to have the classic like tomino gundam style cut to interior of cockpit of person going no as it explodes in flame they blow up in their zaku or whatever right like, which you see a million times in all the other tomino gundam shows um some of the other 90s gundams don't have that because i don't think they have the balls to actually like demonstrate the human cost of all the human lives that are being lost certainly gundam wing can't oh, deal yeah. with it um but like turn a gundam doesn't have that because people rarely ever die because this you're not having that kind of scale of conflict happen so the handful of times that people die like will game and Teteth here uh is really powerful with they think the next major episode i want to talk about is the other major death uh the episode 27 which is probably my second favorite episode of Turn A Gundam. It's Sun so good. Yeah, Sunrise at Midnight, which this is my favorite uh, title of the, the whole series. It's also in Japanese, it's really important. It's Yonaka no Yoake. So it's got yeah. this like, the way the words are structured similarly, it's extra evocative, I yes, think. Yes, it is a very, it's a it's a brilliant title in Japanese that translates to English brilliantly. Because yes. the phrasing Sunrise at Midnight is very poetic and kind of haunting. Um, and this is the nuclear weapon episode. Um, this is where good old Gavin Gooney uh, does he's a good guy that doesn't know anything about anything, anything. yeah um, which fair enough I mean they don't they literally don't know what nuclear weapons are so I don't never necessarily blame him but it is like that moment I just remember so clearly the first time I watched the show where you have the um, scientists for Deanna Counter are, in are investigating the Lost Mountain because they think it's another uh, mountain cycle where there might be other mobile suits and instead of stumbling upon mobile suits they stumble upon a cache of nuclear bombs and that moment where you see the like radiation signal on like a small uh, like screen in someone's cockpit uh, that they're looking at, and you're like, oh shit! It is like, and, and just this realization of 
this is like it's very Godzilla-esque to me of this feeling of like the original sin of mechanized warfare, which is not actually you probably like chemical weapons in many ways is that, but like the symbol of that being yes. nuclear weapons and the like a chemical weapon on a large scale. Yes, yeah, the weapon of mass destruction, the, like the weapon yeah. so big that humans can't control the outcome of the 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 damage that that weapon deals, which is what a nuclear bomb is, and it being this thing that is, like, buried deep in this mountain that is desolate, that has no grass, no trees. Um, it is it is not even just a desert, because it's not even sand. It's just a rock. Um, and, yes. and 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 the, it being one of the quote-unquote villains of the show, someone from Deanna Counter, encountering that, and their reaction being we can't deal with this like this is this is not good this is the, it's like so far beyond this conflict between these two sides this is a this is something that should never have been unearthed it's like the fucking balrog we got to get out of here um so earth's not worth it i'll go back to the moon i don't need this yes this, you can have it i'm gone yeah That's and the fact that all the people from earth don't understand the consequences of that and they don't believe them when they're saying just get out of here and it's stuff of like Lauren having to ex try to explain to Sochier the concept of what a nuclear bomb is and the kind of damage it inflicts that it's not just it kills people, it's that it poisons everything around it for dozens if not hundreds of years if it goes off. I think I tweeted about this because I, I was talking about like it's, I've never seen that perspective on a yeah. nuclear weapon story in sci-fi where it is a pre-industrial society that has no real way of understanding a nuclear weapon, encountering it, and then these future characters. And again, doing it without time travel is like what makes it so good. Because Doctor Who could do this if yeah. they wanted to. But like this is all these characters being contemporary with yeah, one another. Yeah, they have a shared history together yes. that, that both created this, yes. this bomb. And yeah. and yeah, I agree 100%. Everyone having to explain it. And then that leads to the whole title of the episode of when the bomb goes off and kills Gavin Gooney and the only way people have to like the only way they have to understand what they're seeing is to say why is the sun coming out at midnight yeah that is such it like it instills in you the sense of horror of nuclear weapons more than you know a fucking episode of 24 where it goes off or something in the background yeah. and it's just this thing that happens right it really you feel it i also think like that episode is one of the tensest oh, single yes. episodes of gundam it is edge of your seat holy shit especially because you know more than most of the characters about what these things are, you know? Yeah. Like, some of the moon people know, but, like, you're watching Gavin Gooney run around just flailing these things around, and it's like watching a little, like, a toddler play with a knife, you yeah, know? And you're just like, terrified, right? Yeah, it, it is... Yeah, it, it reminds me of the Colony Drop episode uh, from Double Zeta, yep. um, where it is just building up to this inevitable conclusion that you see coming at the beginning of the episode that doesn't come till the end of this thing is going to happen and people are going to die because of it and you have to live with like the consequences of it um and yeah sunrise at midnight ends with one of like the best lines um which is deanna watching it she's because everybody else is like trying to compare it and they're like is it dawn what's happening and then it cuts to her and she's because it's when she's back on the soleil um and she sees it and she just says a sunrise at midnight is a thing that should never be witnessed on this world um yep. and it is just this really truly haunting episode that again is one of the the few major character deaths in the whole show is gavin gavin biting it um again right before uh he's going to get married to socia so you know yes. kind of set it up for himself but other characters set up you know like joseph at the end of the series sets up his death more than any character in anything ever uh but he makes it out so so turning gundam is a show that's just so reluctant to kill its characters that when it does it you're it's like it it feels very impactful yeah, and the whole arc that follows from what I agree, one of the two or three best episodes of the whole show, um, but the arc that follows where um, where where Lauren is entrusted by Zenoa, the, the yeah. guy from the Moon Race, to find a place to dispose of these nukes. And he hides them in his chest in one of my favorite pieces of animation in in the history of animation is him pouring the dirt in testing it out tapping back and forth on both gundam feet yeah and he's like, like like leaning over on one foot and kind of like hopping a little bit to like make sure that the dirt's like really packed in and then he goes and gets some more and packs yeah. it in and and at the time i watched that scene i'm like okay and at the end of this episode he's going to bury them somewhere else and no it also becomes an arc because ultimately he disposes of them in space uh, and then finally, in in a, in a big action scene where the the meteor is is coming towards the moon, yeah, or not the meteor, it's a it's, it's a colony, the, yeah, the mistletoe colony, yeah, yeah. Um, 
It's so good. And it is such a unique perspective on nuclear weapons, which obviously is an, is well trod, trod ground for sci-fi, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the way this show handles it is incredible. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so I think we should probably skip a little bit further um, unless there's any of the episodes up to... Mm, where, where there's the a lot of really good stuff in there. There's the yeah. whole there's there's one section that's very different for the show, the Manui pitch section, right? Where yes. um, like it it's the most different, but I liked it. It's not bad. It's something I really liked. Where there's this 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 um, there's this, the kingdom of Manui pitch, and there is the Adeskin people, and there's the king Coddle. It's it's kind of like an Aztec sort of thing. Yes, yeah. And it is very out there for this show. But I really enjoyed it, and it is a very memorable two-parter, um, very clear two-parter. Like, it's not called part one, part two, but it's completely what it is. And they have to get in there and destroy the cannon so that they can make liftoff, because this is Manui Pitches where they have the big fucking booster to get into space. Yeah, it's it's it, there's the great section there where the old king, Guadal, is telling yeah. them the history, um, and it's clear that, like... There used to be a basically a space elevator there that they call the Tree of the World, um, and yeah. that it was destroyed. But there's like sections of it left, and there's like an old. Um, it's it's basically like that the one episode in Victory Gundam where they have to get on the thing that shoots them into space, and yes. one of the characters dies holding it up. Um, um, it's like that, and the, the Zach Traeger. This is kind of you could call this the Zach Traeger arc because yeah. that's where they're trying to get, which is this way station in space. Um, and yeah, I really like those two, even though. They're, they're easy to forget because they are so different, but I like them a lot. Yeah, they're, they kind of feel like more successful versions of what Double Zeta tried to do with the uh -huh. Moon Moon episodes. Yeah. 100%, yes. Um, yeah, so then you get up into space. Um, you know, there's a lot of... I, I think we probably want to move to maybe even just like the Dark History episode and, and start talking about that and kind of contain a lot of the space stuff there. I, I think so, yeah. especially because... There is a lot of this set is is kind of set up getting into it. I mean, we already talked a little bit about when you get yeah. to the moon and what you see there. I love all the stuff with militia people having to get used to zero G and stuff like that. There's that very good episode where Ke uh, Captain Mihail tries to uh, he he and the other militia people like stage a coup and yep. try to return to Earth. Um, Captain Mihail like or like the one sergeant who's drunk tries to like get back to Earth in a barrel. Yep. Um, and as soon as he like gets out there, he's like, oh, it's cold. Oh, why did my eyes feel weird? Because, you know, it's like he's, there's some air trapped in the barrel, but not enough. And, like, the rest of the, the effects of the vacuum are still <laughs> almost killing him. Lauren has to save him. They all try to get back to Earth and are idiots. But it's great, yeah. yes. But, yeah, I think we can talk about the dark history and kind of the that section on to the yeah, ending. Yeah, and, like, all the, the moon politics and moon yes. people are wrapped up in the dark history stuff. Because it is, like, it's because it is that thing where you have a very intricate like world building stuff at the beginning of the show setting up this like weird society and and all the weird hidden things buried under the earth and hidden mobile suits and everything and then it just feels like the show is spoiling you to basically give you a second version of that when you get to the moon and how weird the moon uh culture and politics are where they have all these families um where you have fucking uh grip and maintainer all-time great Gundam name um, he has has. I thought for the longest time it was an organization or a building or something because it's named Agrippa Maintainer and I that sounded like a, a militia organization or something but like no it's a person yeah it's just a dude um, he's part of the Maintainer family um, which I, th I think maybe that the implication is that's like a, a, a family name slash job title it's like Smith kind of, yeah that's yeah. what it feels like to me um but yeah, he's like taking control of the moon and he's like imposed some like kind of draconian laws. Because we should say the maintainer family, their whole role is uh, is overseeing the cryo chambers. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So and then 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 Gim Gingenham is the leader of the military. Uh, and so they have all that going on. Uh, and so Deanna arriving there with Lauren and they start in the Lauren's little fishing village and then work their way into the capital city that the G Gim Gingham's ancestors helped build. And there's just this sense of one that um, Moon Society has replicated a lot of Earth Society stuff. So like they, the fishing village, a lot of like the class distinctions are there. But there's also this sense of while Earth has been doing this thing where it kind of got reset and then it's like trying to, it's building back up. Um, again, it's like right at the threshold of World War One era technology um, is where they're at uh, on Earth. Meanwhile, the moon culture is like totally stagnant, that they are this, the same, not only is it the same families, it's like really the same four or five people 
have been in power for hundreds of years because they keep on going in these like cycles of cryostasis. Uh, there's like they say there's like a hundred million people in cryostasis because there's not enough. You know, the, the, you can't just live on the moon. You have to build facilities just to be able to live anywhere on the moon. So they like have this like population concern with that. But there's all these moments with Teteth. You get one with Harry Ord where Harry tells Kiel that his parents died when he was young because they were a poor family and they didn't get the good. Uh, they didn't get the good cryostasis stuff. It's only the rich people that could get that. So their cryo system failed and they died because of it. Teteth's uh, ancestors originally were from the Earth and they were taken to the moon when Deanna went down with all the Will Game stuff. And so she experienced prejudice on the moon when she was there because she's from Earth ancestry originally. And so there's all this sense of like a lot of the racial problems, a lot of the class problems that we see on Earth are there on the moon but they've been so solidified by this incredibly frozen society um, that has just not changed at all for hundreds of years, which I think is just a fascinating kind of sci-fi concept. I also think it's really important in the pace of the show that we never, ever, ever see the moon yeah. until we get there and see it through Lauren's eyes again. Yes. We hear about it, people talk about it, we piece some things together, but it is a genuine event when we get there in like episode 40 or something. When we, yeah, 40, I think is the one, Sea Battle on the Lunar Surface is when they first, because um, he lands on the moon in episode 39, but they actually go into like the actual living spaces in episode 40, and we actually see it. And so there's this, there's 40 episodes, almost the entire show, four fifths of the show, yeah. anticipating what is the moon going to be like. And it is even more so than the space colonies in the Universal Century stuff. It is just this kind of almost pathetic in some ways recreation of Earth. And I yeah. think that's a really radical move to get back there. It's like, it's not that different. And that's really fascinating to me. Yeah. Along with everything else you said, because there are these fraught political dynamics, um, including Gim Gingenham being a purely theoretical um, soldier. Because yes, he, yeah, all he's nobody done, to fight. there's nobody to fight. All he's done is simulations, and this follows with his character, because he looks big and burly and powerful, but he's actually really shitty at fighting. Yeah, and he, I mean, he's even, he's got a little top knot, because he's, yeah. and he's got a katana, because he's, like, modeled himself after a samurai, which is a good, like, Japanese political commentary from Tomino of the, like, nationalist, militaristic, like, aggrandizing of the Bushido and the samurai and all yeah. that stuff that the Japanese empire did. Um, and that Japanese culture continues to do, to be clear. Right. But, but, like, he's always brandishing that sword. Yeah. But there is there is the obligatory fin final episode. We have to have a little sword fight. And, and he, he pulls for And he sucks. Lauren cuts him down in, like, two seconds. He, like, makes two swings. And Lauren is so much better at it, he just cuts the sword in half. Yeah, and, like, Mary Bell, the, like, weird little girl that is, like... If this show had new types, she would be the new type girl yes. pilot thing. Um, she even makes multiple comments because she's in more fights than games. It's like... You don't even know what you're doing. Like, yeah, it's yeah. like well, you're piloting the turn X, but you have no idea how to fight. It's what, it's one of the really great inversions because he looks like he's going to be a Yazon or something, but yeah. he's not at all. He's very bad at it. Yeah, if 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 you know Harry or if you just gave Harry the turn A gun, then that fight would have been over in two fucking seconds. Yes, exactly. It's the turn X is powerful, not yeah. Gim Gingham. Yes. So um, the, this is kind of interesting because you reach a plateau in episode 44. Is kind of the we talked about it. It's like the. Um, the climax of the show up to that point, because that is where Harry kills uh, Midgard on the ship yep. and all that stuff. And it feels like, and Deanna has like taken over again. We've seen all the stuff with the, the dark history. Um, she is starting to get power again. Agrippa is killed. There's that. We should probably talk about the moment yeah. where Deanna and Kihel decide together to kill Agrippa. Yeah, and, and then, then Midgard shoots him instead. Yeah, yeah. before they can. Yeah, because he's good. like, I'm going to shoulder the sins. Yes. I'll get my hands dirty so you don't have to. Yes. Kind of thing. Yeah. But they're ready to do it. And then episode 45 kicks off, and I, I, I could tell, because the way 44 ended is so like, this is the end of an arc. And yeah. I'm like, there's only six left. I will watch the last six in one sitting. And I did. I did the same thing, yeah. Um, because 45, Gwyn's betrayal, starts with like this very like faux ending of like, oh, things are good on the moon. We're letting some people out of cryo. Deanna is in power now. Yeah, like like Deanna makes this speech saying that like when, when all the dark history stuff is happening, where there's also all these like riots happening in the streets because they now realize one that like a group of maintainer has been doing all this bullshit um, yes. while Deanna was away without her consent, and that also all this dark history shit happened. Um, and so they like there's the sense of like revolution has just happened on the moon, and that Deanna is now. Basically going to outlaw um, 
the cryo freezing stuff and there's that scene where Frandall is watching as people are coming off this bus um and there's like this like looks like a slightly old woman comes off the bus um and then this other woman like voice off screen says mom and then she walks into the screen and it's this like 80 year old woman walking up to like a 50 year old woman and the 80 year old woman is her daughter uh and it's just this very like uncomfortable feeling like yeah this is deanna's right like this is weird like this probably should not be a thing that humans are doing yeah it's a fucked up society yeah um and then gwyn makes his betrayal and and allies with the gim and ham and uh and that kicks off the final phase of the series where everyone's going back to earth they gwyn, yeah uh lauren is defeated and escapes in the uh, core fighter and which they is, take the turn a. and that makes for a really cool arc in the end here where 45 he loses the turn a and he's just got the cockpit and he finally gets back in it at the very end of the penultimate episode yeah. for the final fight and so he's without it for several episodes at, in the middle there at the end and I think that's a really good dynamic for the final push of episodes you yeah. know we also this is the one Tomino series that does not have a proper re-entry to earth episode because they re-enter earth off screen Yes, because you, there's a good, just like, the next episode starts on Earth showing, uh, like, sweats in and some of the other Gingenham pilots running around just, like, destroying Earth cities and fighting Deanna Counter. Yes. And then um, Deanna and everybody comes to Earth in their cool whale ship, um, the whales. Yes, which is great. They put yes. fucking whales on it. Like, uh -huh. like emoji whales, almost. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's good stuff. Yep. Um, and you have, yeah, you have lots of interesting stuff here. I think the scene where... Um, um, Gwyn tries to take Lauren to Earth with him and yeah. like, tries to trick him and Lauren finally <laughs> breaks and says I'm not Laura I'm Lauren and like punches him in the face yeah and just like fuck you dude and leaves yeah, yeah it's, it's, good. it's good stuff but yeah I mean so the final push of the show becomes about defeating uh, Gwyn and, and Gingenham and preventing Gingenham is basically trying to activate the Moonlight Butterfly again um but it's interesting to me because I think this is... Can we start talking about the ending and yes, how yeah. it wraps up? This feels like a show with a much less definitive conclusion than other Gundam shows. Mm -hmm. And I think very intentionally. This is not like they got canceled and, oh my god, it's done or something like that. It's just, you know, like Zeta Gundam has a really dark set, ending, but it's very definitive. Yeah. They all lost. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and Haman Karn is the queen of space. Yes. That's the ending of Zeta Gundam, right? But this is a conflict to end the show on and certainly earth is like it's going to be more peaceful at the end here this it's not all fucked up at the end but like there's a lot more work to do we have not settled what's going to happen with the moon people and how they're going to come back to earth or not um you know we haven't exactly seen how deanna counter is going to come back into the fold or not um gwyn is still alive and he's a cockroach out there somewhere um really what they're stopping is the big apocalyptic thing but there's a lot that is still unsettled. And it feels very much to me like if they wanted, Tomino could have done another fucking 50 episodes of this sure, thing. Yeah. This, this show feels like it totally could just keep going. And it ends very intentionally in a state of the A is still turning, you know? Yeah, that, um, that you know, I think the, the show is so much about history that, like, it can't have a definitive ending because nothing is ever over, right? So yes. it is... It is you 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 can't or maybe maybe you can but nobody has yet to figure out how to solve the dark history right that is not a we, we haven't yet figured out how do we how do we stop the dark history and start the good history you know we haven't gotten there yet um yeah. and 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 tomino has not envisioned how to do it like no creator has envisioned how to do it like this is a an interesting like continual thing that i think lots of science fiction once it reaches a certain scale of like the perspective it wants, Gundam definitely hit this with Shars Counterattack, where it just hits into this wall of you can't you can't imagine what the new type society is because we don't know. Like for you to be able to imagine the new type society means that it's not a new type society because you're because we are all bound by the gravity of Earth, right? Yes. Um, and so yeah, like Turn A feels like it's its method of how to end. I think is gesturing at this recognition that it cannot envision the different version of what happens next because the climax literally is predicated on something we don't understand and is never explicated to yeah. us which is the some reaction happens between the nano machines in the two gundams the turn x and the turn a and they encase gingham and the two machines in this cocoon basically yeah and and they they take the swords also which yes. i think is like a very important detail that these tendrils come and rip the swords 
like Gingenheim's broken sword that the fucking Lauren just smashes into pieces, uh, which is very good. And then Lauren's sword gets ripped from their hands. And that's where we leave it in terms of the main plot is yeah. this has happened. This, this cocooning effect has taken the weapons and set them right there. And then humanity has to move on with that as like this permanent thing in the midst of their society. It's another layer of something buried on the physical traces of the earth. It reminded me a lot, Sean, of the end of a movie we both love, Shin yeah. Godzilla. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Godzilla. I said tried to say both titles and it came out wrong. Yes. Shin Godzilla yes. or Shin Gojira, not Shin Galala or whatever yeah. I just Godzilla. Godzilla. Yeah, Godzilla. Godzilla is the is the Russian knockoff Godzilla. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the Shin Godzilla is the the name of the American Godzilla that they put into Godzilla Final Wars. No. Yes. Um, but Shin Godzilla ends with the frozen Godzilla that they have defeated based for now in yeah. the movie and it is this dark lovecraftian statue-esque thing in the middle of tokyo with these weird beings coming out of it yeah now this does not have that same kind of horror thing to it mm -hmm. but it is that same idea of like we've won the day but this this record of our fight and our sins and our mistakes is there embedded on the earth and everything will now take place around that and I found it similarly haunting with a more uplifting edge to this because Shin Godzilla is a much darker thing. Yeah. The uplift in this is that it's reminding us of that idea of Chrysalis, which is a big idea, especially in the second half of Turn A Gundam, of humanity in this perpetual state of evolution and cocooning and coming out of that again and that cycle. And now there's this literal cocoon in which like the sins of humanity are ensconced on Earth and um, what will come of it. But I think it is a perfectly haunting optimistic it's all these different kinds of things yeah. in one image that feels like tomino clearly had that in mind from the beginning it's a very purposeful ending yeah and and i think there's this sense to me of like because because like the moonlight butterflies whole thing and what they find out in the dark history is that the turn a gundam um the turn x tried to stop the turn a gundam to do this in the turn a gundam used the moonlight butterfly to reset the world effectively that's like one of the ways that the the mountain cycles and all that stuff happened was that they were buried under the sort of reformed earth made by the nano machines um that were produced by the moonlight butterfly and that that's the perhaps was what the the original purpose of the turn a gundam was um it's also important detail that like all throughout the series uh particularly coronander because he we come to discover now that he is from the dark history period and he was frozen uh, you know, over and over again. And that's one of the reasons why he seems to be insane is it's the effects of this incredibly prolonged um, cryo uh, sleep that he's been in. Effects that also seem to start working on Deanna as she becomes more physically weaker as you get um, near the end of the show. Um, and, but yeah, so, but like the Gundam is this symbol to so many people of like oppression, particularly oppression against people who live in space, which is like, that is what the Gundam is, particularly the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Um, and it is this, you know, Lauren deciding to try to use that symbol not as a tool of war, but as a way to try to help people. And I think, like, for me, a key thing that happens at the end is that Lauren decides to run away. Like, he's not there to fight. He's not there to kill King Gingenham. He wants to stop this shit from happening. He wants to stop the Moonlight Butterfly from going off. But when faced with the ultimate decision of... Do I stay and sacrifice myself and kill Gim? Or do I see all this shit's happening and I just fucking turn and run and live? He turns and runs and lives. And to me, that is the... I think that's the choice that Lauren makes that prevents the reset button from happening, right? That it's like, if, if he had gone in and tried to push it and, and make sure that this fight was over right now, it would restart the cycle again of war and violence and he would, you know, kill Gim Gingham, but the war would continue. And instead he's like... It's more important for me to live, as he says at the end of Laura's Cow, he's, the only people he's going to fight against are the people who do not cherish life. And cherishing life includes cherishing your own life. And like those, that whole sequence is constantly countercut with Sochie watching it happening, thinking about, does this mean Lauren's going to die? Is Deanna going to die? Like, you know, looking at the potential, like, old style Gundam climax which is half these people are going to get murdered over the course of this thing and Lauren says no I'm just going to run and live um, and then everything gets cocooned for now um, 
that to me is like part of the f for Gundam feels like optimism, not in this like kumbaya, we save the day, history is fixed, racism isn't a thing anymore, the capitalism is dismantled, and we live in the new type paradise. Because again, you, you, if you if you say that it just if you like build that series and that's the conclusion it just feels childish and unearned because when Gundam like a show like Turn of Gundam is looking at the kinds of issues it's looking at I don't think you can earn that ending or I've yet to see something that feels like it actually earns that kind of ending to me here it is about let's try to take the best path we have now and that can hopefully build change for the future and let's cherish the people like Kiel who's going to go to the moon um, or Lily, who is not perfect, but is a lot better than Gwen, who are going to help create a better future, um, having had these experiences and learned the things they have um, over the course of the show. Absolutely. It's, it's a life goes on ending in a very real sense of we've seen what that means, because yeah. that's part of a cycle. And it is, all these things have been learned. All these things have been unearthed. They cannot be ignored now what choices are then made. Yeah, right? the, yeah, that like and the dark history is no longer buried. Yes. Um under dirt or or in an archive somewhere. We we know what we know. We have it. And now what choices are made. You know, and it feels like that's a turning point for uh the the whole real world right now as yes. we're recording this, Sean. Yeah. Um and then we get I think one of the greatest things Tomino has ever directed yep. which is the final montage of Turn A Gundam. Yeah, the best ending any Gundam show has. Okay, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely the only thing that I think would hold a candle to it for me is the, the original Gundam and, yeah. and you know, I think the original Gundam probably has a better final episode overall but the, um, I think this is a better, I agree, like last five yeah. minutes. Um, like, and you know, I have like, I'm on record of having a strong preference for if it's a long form story, I want a long ending. So it's yes. like, I want a big epilogue. And basically the entire second half of Turning Gundam is, or the last episode of Turning Gundam is this prolonged epilogue over the Moon Song, um, which was the song that played at the end of the first episode. Um, and then it pops up here and there. It's also the ending theme of the last couple of episodes as well, once they move away from Aura. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah by Aki Okui, which I think is one of the best yeah. songs in the whole franchise of Gundam. Well, it's composed by Yoko Kono. Okay, by Kano. I meant um, yeah, it's sung, yeah, by, sung by, by her. By, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it is a amazing composition, an amazing song, and the way the montage works in relation to the music. Yes, and the amount that it goes through because it's actually not the entire last half act; it's only the last five six minutes of the episode. Sure. Yeah. Um, so like. So much is packed into that, you know? Yeah. Um, and it is so dense and it is, it just moves so fast. It is these quick flashes all over the world of different characters with this kind of through line of Kihel going back to the moon as Deanna and Deanna going on this journey across Earth with Lauren. And it is, I, I just, Sean, I watched that ending and I, I'm still haunted by it. It's been yep. probably 24 hours since I saw it, more than that now. And I can't stop thinking about it. I can't stop re-listening to that song. I've watched the montage several times. I don't know if it is a happy ending, a sad ending, somewhere in between. But I find it deeply haunting in the best way. And I don't necessarily mean haunting in that it, it's scary or dark. But just it leaves an effect. It lingers. Yeah. You know? And, and it's just, it is that sense of the, the reward for what, for like winning the conflict right the, like we 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 defeated king king and hum everybody lives and the reward for that is everybody gets to live and that's what that montage is is these characters living their lives as change happens and and the montage is you know over the course of multiple years you see multiple seasons and there's a constant um like motif in the montage of the moon at the different as di different phases over the course of the months and years um as time moves on um there's some really good stuff if you see like a very cool very long-haired lauren uh, that's an older lauren um Saussure wearing 1920s fashion she's like yes. a flapper girl which is good like it gives you a good sense of okay it's, this is maybe it's been like five six years probably based on like the fashion these characters now have um and yeah that through line of them going because because one important thing here is basically like how the montage starts is it basically just straight goes from the fucking moonlight butterfly shit's going on 
Lauren runs away. You don't even see what happens to Ging Gingham. You don't see him get wrapped up in the cocoon or anything. It's just Lauren runs, jumps into Sochi's hand, Kapool hand, and then it is a fade into them in the car at the beginning of the, the what's the beginning of the montage, which is Kiel and Deanna talking about, okay, we'll do this one last time, which is what sets it off. And it's only like probably I think near the end of the montage, if I remember correctly, is where you finally get the shot of the cocoon and then it slowly pans over and you see the smaller cocoon of where Gim was. Um, and that's like that sense of how much that decision uh, of what the end of the show was was about Lauren just getting the fuck out of there is that you don't even see what happens to Gim until part of the yeah. way through the... You don't see like what the conclusion of that fight was until part of the way through the montage. Um, yeah, and you see that like Fran and Joseph had a kid um, and Joseph has a kid on his shoulders that like pulls on his like pigtails, which I think is cute. Um, yeah, you see the, the donkey uh, bakery number yes. six. There are two specific things... One thing that definitely makes me sad, mm -hmm. and one thing that I think makes me sad, but I need to think through it more. Okay. Everything with Sochia makes me sad. Uh -huh. um, she loses everyone in her life because her sister goes to live on the fucking moon. Her her mother, I don't know how well she is. She seems yeah. better, but we don't know. Um, and her best friend and the person she wants to be with romantically, Lauren, goes and chooses Deanna and to continue following her. There is the shot where Lauren kisses her and reciprocates and then leaves. And there's a scene where Sochier, we see Sochier is flourishing. She is the head of the, the Kihel family, yeah. or the Heim family. She's doing well in society, but this still haunts her. And she takes Lauren's little fish toy, yeah, that gold he brought, fish. Yeah. the goldfish that he brought to earth with him. And she runs, she bikes down to the river doing these, like these, these, these primal howls yelling, which is some of the best performance work I think in Gundam yeah. is what Sochier does there and throws it into the river where it started and yells at the moon, just, just kind of like Lauren did at the end of the first episode, but in a different way. And that makes me very sad for Sochier because she did not get a happy ending to me, I don't think. And then Lauren being bound to Deanna and taking her around the world. Deanna, I think it's pretty clear to read between the lines here that she is dying. Yeah. She does not have much time left. This is this is him trying to give her what she wanted as her final like journey on Earth. But at the same time, Lauren starts the show or ends the show much the way he started, serving this woman. And the whole ending is, I've made you soup. Oh, that was delicious. Thank you very much, my lady. And the final line, you know, Deanna Sama Atane, right? Something like that? Or Matasta. Matasta. Yeah, Matasta. Yeah, just like, yeah, we'll see you says, tomorrow. good night, like, I'll see you tomorrow. tomorrow. And closes the door, and she's sleeping. It looks kind of like a princess in a fairy tale. And there's something about that, of him having come so far as a character, but ultimately not changed his station, and being kind of bound to that, that makes me weirdly sad. And I don't know if I can even define it or, or say it, but it's just something about him not being a he is still bound to her and and her whims and serving her whims is the wrong word because she's not that insensitive a person yeah but he does not break out and become his own person and go forge a life the way we see keith do and the way we see fran, fran do yeah. um and and several other characters in that ending montage and that is still who lauren is even years later and there's something about the the like intractability of of class that that says that I think is very important throughout the entire show, and him never really breaking out of that class barrier to be with Sochi, even though he could. Um, I don't know. There's something about that 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 is is melancholy. I think melancholy is a better word yeah. than sad because I don't think it's a like Sochi will be okay and Lauren will be okay. Like these people will be okay, and Earth seems to be on a much better path than it was in the heat of all this, right? But there is something kind of haunting and melancholy because we are in the middle of an ongoing cycle. And those it's it's a show that ends on an ellipses much more than a period. And that ellipses lingers very powerfully. Yeah. And one thing I found really interesting when I watched it again is I had like a very distinct memory that it was absolutely clear that Deanna dies at the very end of the show. Like I in my head the last shot like i had this memory of the last shot basically being what it was but with lauren like kneeling next to her with this implication that she had died like in. snow white or something yes like, like that's i had such an incredibly strong impression of it i was like 100 percent sure that was how it ended it was like no question it was like obviously that she's dead um and i still think that probably she dies in her sleep that night is like how I kind of read that sequence. Yeah. Um, because I think that's why it left that impression is that that is how I felt about it. 
but it does have yeah but this melancholy sense of like life goes on not everybody has the best life they possibly could um like you said like lauren never breaks out of this sort of service that he has for people i think it is like and maybe he does when Deanna dies. I, and, and that's and that's like what I like in you know this is it's like a headcanon thing I guess. But I have this like also very strong feeling of I think that after that happens, Lauren goes back with Sochi and is with Sochi. Like yeah, because what else does he do? Like does he, he does, well, and, does Lauren and, doesn't die when Deanna dies, and I feel like that's part of the implication of why this happens, um, is because I think Lauren understands that these are her final moments, yeah. right? Like he's and he's going to be with her, and and I think there's this thing of like. It's his ultimate duty. If, if yeah, he, it's, it, he it, has to be there for the end for her. Yeah. yeah, and and she's earned that, right? Like sure. she yeah. has earned after everything that she has lived, everything that was taken from her, including her life. The only reason she's dying now, hundreds of years after Will Game, the person that she's in love with, that she has like this ring on, um, that she has a wedding ring on, that is Will Game's wedding ring. Because Lauren, as I know, some people like read it as because they see that there's a shot with the wedding ring it was like oh she and lauren get married it's like no. no because lauren doesn't have a ring um obviously they don't get married also why would he be leaving going into a different room if they were married yeah yeah <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> uh yeah um this isn't a 1950s sitcom guys exactly it's just like okay bye honey <laughs> uh but yes yeah, so she is clearly like holding on to that love she had for will game and all that was ripped away from her because she was this figurehead um, that people like Agrippa Maintainer and Gim Gingenham allowed to be at a certain level of power, um, but did. But once she stepped over a certain bound, Agrippa pulled her back to the moon and ripped that away from her. It's like she worked so hard to get what she has, and then passes that torch onto Kiel. I like that Kiel and Harry get to be together. Yes, um, that's a good romantic couple that that they just get to maintain. Well, and the Deanna they built together gets to gets survive. to live. It gets yes. to survive. It gets to. It gets to do what it was built to do, which is bring peace and, and order to people and be a good leader, you know, all those things. Yeah, and push for the change that is needed and, and makes it feel like, I feel like the strong implication is that, like, the moon society eventually reintegrates with the earth yeah. um, and all that kind of stuff. It's It feels like we're watching the birth of a new world yeah. and it is both painful and beautiful. There's a lot of pain and beauty in those last minutes, that's why Sochier, yeah. she doesn't say anything, she screams because it's it's beyond words, right? Mm -hmm. the, the pain and I think some of the beauty of that, and that's why melancholy is probably a better word than sad. You can tell I'm kind of working through this on the fly. You've had years. <laughs> um, yeah, because it is this thing of like, I think it's a, it, it, is, it is like one of like the trickiest scenes, like kind of infamously in the fandom in Gundam of like, why, why, why do characters do what they do? Um, but, and there is, I agree with you, there is this like weird sense of melancholy of like you wanting Lauren to find something else for himself while at the same time, it's like, it is what Lauren has always wanted and always been fighting for. He's always yeah. been fighting for this woman who was this idol to him. And then, and then he actually got to know and really understood this is who she is. And she yes. like, she is someone that deserves to have. Like, like I think I'm ultimately left like maybe more positive on it because because the last image is Kiel or not Kiel Deanna going to sleep with a smile on her face yes and it's like she has won this like simple happiness that she has always wanted um, and Lauren is happy to have that share that happiness with her even if it's not in a romantic way if it is in this other way that they they have this like really powerful bond of loyalty and friendship between the two of them that they have earned through the course of, again, what is also like my favorite stretch of the show, which is the two of them together after he knows that she's really Deanna. Yeah. Struggling to figure out what does it mean to do good in the world. Yeah, to be clear, I don't think it's in any way out of character for Lauren. I yes, think it's exactly yeah. what had to happen. I, I think it's a perfect, beautiful, great ending. It's just one that I'm very much still working through my thoughts on because it throws so much at you. Mm -hmm. It is so much more of an ellipsis than a punctuation mark, like I said. And... It is a deliberately ambiguous final image, you know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe she has a good night's sleep and wakes up, and they go and look at the trees, and yeah. and it's another year before she passes. Maybe she dies that night. You know, there's there are multiple ways to read that, but she is clearly this is it for her. She's going to die soon. Yeah, 
and Lauren is bound to her for now. And, you know, and yeah, maybe he and Sochi will be together. It'll be all be fine. It'll be perfect. Or maybe she finds someone else and he doesn't need anyone. You know, who knows? It is the right ending. Absolutely, I'm just yeah. trying to figure out what my emotions are in regard to it because Absolutely, it's complicated yeah, yeah. and in the best way. That's, that's yeah, I remember I mean. being feeling exactly that way when I first watched the show and just being like, holy. Like, I just remember being utterly bowled over by the yes. ending. Like, it not being at all what I expected it yeah. to be. Um, but it being like what it absolutely needs to be and conveying again this sense of like we have one life and life is messy and complicated yeah. and hurts people but yeah. also, but also you get to see Deanna um wearing this like comically large uh like snowsuit outside uh, which is the best thing and like warms my heart so much it's, it's, it's great you know it kind of it's it's kind of like um you know George Washington in his like I think farewell address mentions like just wanting to go home and and live in his state yeah. in in the nation that he's built. They have the line in Hamilton the musical about being at home in the nation we've made and like just the idea of like I don't want to be leading this shit until I die. I want to go like die in peace in this nation yeah. I founded. And it's the same kind of thing for Deanna minus the slaveholding. Um, <laughs> you know mm -hmm. of of getting to just enjoy the new world she's kind of helped put together. And it is, it's, it's, look, it's a beautiful conclusion. And I cannot underline enough how perfect that song is. Oh, yes. It yeah. is one of the great Gundam songs. It is one of the great uses of an insert song in the history of anime. And the amount of, like, editing to the music is mm -hmm. incredible. It's, which you don't see in animation that much because it's tough. Um, it's so, so, so good. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Like, the soundtrack across the board is amazing. I think yes. we will, for the sake of time... We are going to end up talking about that soundtrack one way or the other on the next episode of the show yes. when we do some ranking stuff. So yeah. Yeah. we will save the superlatives for Yoko Kano in her incredible work yeah. uh, on Turning Gundam for that uh, discussion, I think. But before we wrap up, quickly, I do, we didn't talk about the theme songs yet. Yes, okay, yeah. Turn A Turn so good. is a perfect Gundam theme song. It's amazing. It's the one that's most like Tobey Gundam, I think. The original Fly Gundam. Yes. It's got that kind of 70s anime feel, but it is... The way he belts out, turn A, is yeah. incredible. Yeah, it also, if people have not listened to the full five-minute yep. version <laughs> of it, it is, it, it is so good. Um, it, is, it is a song where it feels like every single person like playing an instrument in the song and the people singing feel like they're having the fucking time of their lives. Yes. The dude on the drums is just going to town. It has the fucking coolest drum lines um, as it goes on, like, the last verse uh, in the full five-minute version, it's a kind of the song where, like, as it builds, it kind of grows more and more out of control as a yes. song. And so eventually it's just, like, the bass is going fucking wild in the last verse, and it's great. There's a absolutely ripping guitar solo in the middle of the full song version. So it's, like, the 90-minute version they use for the anime is great, um, and I love it to death. And again, the drums, if you listen to it with really good he headphones, and just listen to what the drums are doing, because it's some of the best coolest drum lining um drum i also stuff. think the opening has i love the animation and the specific like it is the closest to a theme song being a thesis for a show i've ever seen yeah with the lyrics and the animation which is all about duality and connections between yes. people it's really incredible and i do have to say i think they made a really shitty choice abandoning it for the last 10 because i think yeah. century color is the worst gundam yeah ever. century color is really generic it's not great it's a weird it's like also a very weird opening because it's just like the turn a the turn x and the bandit just like palling around in space in a weird way that's like what it, is communicating it feels like very mismatched to the show i don't know why it's only there for 10 episodes it's I think it's just bad, and I don't... Yeah. It's the only thing I dislike about Turn A Gundam, and it has no effect on the actual quality of the show, but still. It's it's one of those things where it's... it's I think it's the last time we do this thing, because Gundam Wing did something similar where they just, like, switch it to rhythm emotion, which is a very good song, but they just switch the OP in the very, like, last section of the show, where going forward, it's going to be a thing of where... We're not going to be able to talk about every OP a Gundam has because it's going to have like four um, yeah. because they will... One per core, basically. Yes, from, from this point forward, I believe um, every Gundam show just like fucking clockwork will it changes OP and ED every 12 episodes um, because you got to get those fucking single yeah. album releases and make that money. Yeah. Um, but here, I don't know why. Like, I, I'm very glad that they didn't do it at the midpoint, which is, would be more traditional. Um, that's, that's like where G Gundam did yeah. it. Um, but so you got most of the show just has turn a turn century color kind of sucks. I love the endings. Aura yes. is one of the best endings. And then 
Moon's Cocoon is even better. Mm-hmm. It's they're both phenomenal endings, and I love the animation, yeah. particularly the animation on Aura. I think is oh, yeah, it's like incredible. Lauren flying through space wearing the pilot suit, even though he doesn't actually wear the pilot suit in this show until like the last yeah. twelve episodes. Well, um, and then he's naked. So. Yes, yeah, but then he's naked because you know everybody's wearing disguises, and then yeah, being naked is being without disguise. Um, I do particularly with Aura. Uh, it just sticks with me so much. Is is I love that the because when they play it for the anime, they just start right where the lyrics start. So every time the episode ends, it just goes straight into Binetsu ga same nai mama. And like every time I watch this show, it is now a hundred times I have sung those lines yep. with that song because it's so immediate. It's it's a gorgeous song, um, and I love the the it's sound so of the lyrics. Is just it, it feels good to say. Yeah, um, but yes, Aura is very good. Yeah, and but then, I mean, if you take its endings and openings, three of the four are three of my four favorite Gundam songs, yes. and then one of them is bad, but that's okay. Um, Turning Gundam is a special show, Sean. It is superlative. Um, it is it is a true classic. Uh, it is I love it to death. I it, it was one of those where like I was in some ways nervous to watch it again because I loved it so much the first time. I'm like, "Mm, I wonder if it's going to, maybe I will, I'll see more flaws or something the second time through. I like it even more now than I did the first time because I'm in, instead of being utterly bowled over by, and like having to feel like I need to keep up with what the show's doing. Cause it is, cause we, well, we could do like a 10 times longer podcast on this uh, because we haven't hit. It is a dense, it's so dense dense show. And so it is a show that is really well worth rewatching because not having to keep up with okay here's where the characters are here's like what's going on with like the main plot stuff and just being able to sit back and be like a man the the fucking mobile suit animation of this show is really cool it is a good place to be in watching turn of gundam absolutely so that's it for this week yeah and that's it for one year of weekly suit gundam thank you all so much for listening and making this something that that we could do for a year uh, cause I think I, Sean, you would agree with me. This is one of our favorite things we've ever done for podcasting. Oh yes. Yeah, it yeah. is. I, I have loved Gundam since I started watching it, but it is, it is one thing to be able to love a thing. It's another thing to be able to share that love with you, Jonathan, and then with the, the world and everybody listening to it. Yeah. Um, people making weird political comments on YouTube that I don't understand how they have those politics um, and and also enjoy Gundam, but, you know, I'm sure we'll get one of those for turn A somewhere. We get a lot more positive comments, to be clear. Yes. But every once in of... a while, you get one of those funny ones. Yeah. They're just particularly funny because of what Gundam is. Yes. Um, but it has been a blast. We will do more looking back next time on the show. I don't think that'll be next week. I think it'll be in two weeks because next week we're probably on the, the Weekly Stuff podcast be doing a big PlayStation event breakdown. So, but in two weeks, probably, we are going to do a big one-year anniversary episode. We are going to be ranking the best songs, Mm -hmm. the best characters, the best mechs, and we're going to rank the shows that we've talked about so far. Yes, so all all the the shows that have had their own episodes for, so... We, I think the plan will be we will eventually go around and, and do episodes on some of the OVAs that you've seen, Jonathan, that we yes. sort of did a quick summaries of in an early episode but didn't go all in on, and we'll go in all in on those eventually. But for now, if you have been watching along with us and watching the shows that we have done full episodes on, we'll be ranking all of those, which is chronologically all the main TV shows and movies from Mobile Suit Gundam to Turn A Gundam and Unicorn and Narrative. Um, and then all the songs, characters, and uh, mobile suits that appear in those shows will also be ranked in their own lists. And it's I, I have a whole list of all my contenders for all those slots, um, which for the shows is very easy. For the characters and mobile suits and the songs, it's, it's not very easy. Hard. It's It's hard. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, so we will see you next time on Weekly Suit Gundam. <laughs>